Sir, we are live and you can start. Okay. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. And I welcome you all to this edition of 2021 Boot Camp. Now, last year in 2020, we had the Boot Camp in the physical form. And where Dr. Mohit was also there in National Medical College. But this year, due to the corona, we are on a virtual platform platform this year. Now, what is this boot camp all about? You students will be facing your examiners in a month's time. And you need to know where you stand and where the examiners stand. And that's why this is just a stage rehearsal for that final examination. And you have a galaxy of examiners, not only from this city or this state, from outside the state also. And they are experienced examiners. They will be guiding you throughout these two days to how to go about it in an examination. That's why you have kept uh, some lectures, mostly some case presentations, and how the case presentation, you will be facing the uh, questionnaire from the examiners. You will have a real scenario of that. And so you can brush yourself up, you can tighten yourself up before you go finally into the examination hall. And you know, to pass the exams, you need to know everything of something and something of everything. And this boot camp is going to help you to know which is that something and which is that everything. And without much delay, we are already a bit late. Without, uh, without much delay, I will ask Dr. Uh, Moid to carry on with his right. uh, lecture and presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bhattacharya. Uh, it's an uh, honor and pleasure to be here uh, in the boot camp. Uh, I mean, uh, this is my second time when I'm, being, I'm uh, presenting a lecture. Uh, uh, at the same time, I would like to uh, welcome uh, all the delegates uh, in this boot camp, which is really uh, uh, well organized, as I've seen last year as well. And uh, it really, uh, as what Dr. Bhattacharya has already mentioned, that uh, it really, uh, you know, you, it gears you up, it, it trains you, it teaches you, it gives you confidence that how to face uh, the examiners and how to face your exam. So, uh, and more, most, most importantly, it also to a certain extent gives you some sort of uh, insights about the uh, writing the papers. How do you, how do you, uh, you know, answer your uh, questions? So overall, uh, it gives you an, um, uh, it, it almost, almost brings you up before your exam, uh, almost a prepared person to face an exam. So I would not uh, waste my time further. I really thank the organizers uh, for giving me a chance to be there here, here again with you. Uh, to share my, some of my knowledge. Uh, can I share the screen, please? Yes, sir, you can. Uh, let's see. So, Full screen, please. Okay, yeah. So, um, as I said, I bring greetings from my institute. Uh, I bring in greetings from my institute, uh, Jain Medical College, Aligarh and my university, uh, Aligarh Muslim University. Uh, and uh, usually in most of the books and most of the teachers, they usually deal uh, uh, ABD analysis in five steps, but I usually deal it a bit extended format. And I'll tell you why I do this and subsequently be able to understand what, what are the things which I put in an extra component in this analysis. So today's game plan will be a brief theory, which is a couple of slides, uh, and then there's some tips or points to remember. Uh, Ten steps, as I said, to analyze the ABD, and and finally, if we get permit, if the organizers permit me some time, or if we get some time, we'll try to crash our brain with some sort of examples. So parameters are of concern. If you see an ABD strip, there are a lot of parameters, uh, a battery of parameters which you'll get. But certain things which are which are our concern and we need to concentrate on them are oxygen, the pH, bicarbonate, PCO2, 
lactate, base excess, and serum nucleotides. So these are the parameters which you should concentrate on. Rest of the parameters are not that important unless in individual cases, which could be an important factor. So how does it analyze? Obviously, you know very well that blood gas analyzer directly measures certain components, which are you know, the uh, pH, pCO2, and PO2. Now, these are the things which the examiners also at time ask. What are the parameters which is being analyzed directly? And certain parameters which are direct, which are being calculated with the help of certain formulas. And you know that formula, henderson Hasselbach's equation. And then we can calculate the bicarbonate on the basis of that. And standard bicarbonate and base state, uh, standard base excess are derived from computerized nomograms. So as I said, tips to remember before we carry on, we deal mainly into the steps, certain things which you should remember. And in fact, it helps you to fin finally analyze your strip is uh, what do you mean by metabolic acidosis? It is primary, there is a change in the decrease in bicarbonate. That means there's an increase or increase in hydrogen ion leading to a change in pH. So this is what primarily is uh, metabolic acidosis. And the compensation which takes place, 1.5 multiplied by the bicarbonate, which is the, the actual bicarbonate, plus 8, plus or minus 2. Now, this is something which you need to remember, right? And on in meta metabolic calculosis, its primary change is the increase in bicarbonate, which is, again, fall in hydrogen ion. And because of this increase in bicarbonate, there will be increase in pH. So they, these two, they are running in the same direction. You remember this. And the compensation is, again, PCO2 is equals to, always remember, the uh, the bottom line of this is that primarily it's an interaction between the kidney and the lungs. So the kidney and the lungs means when the, the kidney is deranged, the lungs tries to compensate it. And that means if the kidney is having, because the metabolic components is primarily from the kidney, right? And if the kidney, and that is why whenever there is compensation by the kidney, it takes time for the kidney to compensate, right? but it takes does not take time much time for the lungs to compensate. So naturally, the bottom line is it's a balance between the kidney and the lungs. So whenever there is a compensation of metabolic acidosis or metabolic alkalosis, there is a compensation by the carbon dioxide. So the PCO2 will always change in the direction which is opposite to the direction of the, or if you see this, there's the PCO2 will be changed in the, with, the, with the change of PCO2, that means in case of metabolic acidosis, it is 7.5, 7 multiplied by bicarbonate plus or minus 21, uh, plus, minus, plus 21 plus or minus 2. Now, this is what is the, uh, the compensation which takes place in metabolic alkalosis. Now, if you talk about respiratory acidosis, the respiratory component, the primary change is there's the increase in carbon dioxide, right, leading to a fall in pH. So, naturally, there is an opposite direction. If you see this, whereas in case of metabolic component, the bicarbonate was going in direction with the pH. So in the same direction, it is metabolic component. So if it is in the opposite direction, it is a respiratory component. Remember this. So bicarbonate as carbon dioxide goes, goes high, the pH goes down, right? Whereas in this case, bicarbonate goes down, the pH goes down. Or bicarbonate goes up, the pH goes up. This is what you must remember. There are small, small tips which you can later on apply, apply in your uh, analyzing the strip. So the compensation in acute respiratory acidosis, 10 milligram rise in PSU2 above 40. So if it is acute respiratory acidosis, if it, there is a rise in PSU2 above 40, there will be a rise in bicarbonate by one. Now in most of the books, you'll see one, two, one and three and two and five. But I just made it simple. I'll just tell you, I made it one, two, three, four. Now that how it is, it hardly matters which is five or four, it doesn't make much difference. So, but it becomes easy for you to remember. So the acute respiratory acidosis, if there is a rise in PCO2 by 10 millimeter of mercury above 40, because 40 is the normal PCO2, right? If it is 10 millimeter rise above 40, then there will be a rise in bicarbonate by one. Now, if it is chronic respiratory acidosis, then if there is a rise in PCO2 above 40, 10 millimeter rise, there will be a rise in bicarbonate by three. And the expected bicarbonate rise will be 24, plus one, one is because it is acute. Right? If you take it acute, it will be plus. So if it is acute, it is one, as I said, this is one, by the actual, multiplied by the actual PCO2 minus 40 by 10. 40 is the normal PCO2, as I said, per rise divided by 10. So it is, this gives you the expected bicarbonate, which will be rise, which will rise depending upon the rise in PCO2. So this is what is the compensation if you talk about 
when there is a rise in PCO2, there will be a rise in bicarbonate as well in case of respiratory acidosis. Right. If you talk about respiratory alkalosis, there is a fall in PCO2 and subsequently there will be a rise in pH. Right. So this is, as I said, it's an opposite direction. So if it is acute respiratory alkalosis, so there again, 10 millimeter rise, 10 millimeter fall in carbon dioxide below 40 will give you a fall in bicarbonate by two. Okay. So naturally, if you talk about chronic, chronic respiratory alkalosis, 10 millimeter fall in, bicarb in carbon dioxide below 40 will again give you a fall in bicarbonate by four. So this is this actually in most of the big books, you'll see it is five, but I just made it simple so as to remember it becomes four. So expected bicarbonate is equals to, now, as I said, that one, previous one was plus. If you remember, this was acidosis, so it was plus. It is alkalosis, so it is minus. So naturally, 24 minus 40 was the is the normal by normal carbon dioxide minus the actual carbon dioxide divided by 10. So this is because, as I said, 10 per 10 millimeter rise in bicarbonate by rise in carbon dioxide. So it is divided by 10. So this will be the expected bicarbonate. Whenever there is a rise in PCO2, this should be the expected bicarbonate, which will fall depending upon your rise in PCO2. Now, these are small tips you should remember. Now, anion gap. You should remember how, what is anion gap? Anion gap is a rough estimate of the relative abundance of unmeasured anions. How many, what is the unmeasured anions? How much is the quantity of unmeasured anions? Now, use, this is used to determine whether metabolic acidosis is due to accumulation of non-volatile acids. What are non-volatile acids? They're lactic acids. Or a primary loss of bicarbonate, or it is because of loss of bicarbonate, or it is increase of non-volatile acid, that is acid, uh, lactic acid. In a state of equilibrium, what happens? There is a the 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 uh, the, bicarb the cations are equal to anions. Whenever there is an equilibrium, there is a cation which is unmeasured, which is sodium plus unmeasured cation is equals to is is equals to calcium plus bicarbonate, which is an unmeasured, which is a measured anion plus unmeasured anion. So this is an equilibrium, and so if you rearrange this, then obviously sodium minus chloride plus bicarbonate is equals to unmeasured anion plus unmeasured, uh, minus unmeasured cation. Now here also you can add uh, potassium, but in most of the cases we don't use potassium here because it depends upon the quantity of, because the quantity of potassium is very less, it's insig insignificant, so naturally we don't consider it. And at the same time, when we calculate the, uh, the anion gap, whenever it is eight to 12, we say it is, we usually don't calculate, uh, that is why usually we used to say eight to 12 initially, but now we say 12 to 16, is the normal value so when we are not we are not adding the potassium values right so the anion gap is the difference between as i said the unmeasured anion minus the unmeasured cation which is which gives you the anion gap and this is how the formula looks like the range is 8 to 16 milliequivalent per liter for calculation purpose we'll take it as 12 right and if the metabolic acidosis is with anion gap that means if metabolic acidosis is there with an anion gap more than 12, say 16 to 20, then we say it is a metabolic acidosis, which has, which is a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Now, when we talk about metabolic acid, metabolic component, we should always consider the albumin level because most of the cases, albumin is, is an important factor which can influence your metabolic component. So albumin is the principal unmeasured anion and the principal determinant of anion gap. Always remember this. And normal albumin concentration in plasma is four milligram per deciliter. Now, a low albumin level in plasma will lower the anion gap. Obviously, it will lower the anion gap. And this anion, this could mask the presence of an unmeasured anion. So naturally, if it is, if it is, there is an unmeasured anion, it will be, it will mask the presence of that anion because there is a loss of albumin, which will reduce the anion. And that is why it will cause a problem in calculation. Say, for instance, lactate which will be contributing to your metabolic acidosis. So include the, to include the contribution of albumin, what we do is calculate the corrected anion gap. And what is the corrected anion gap? The corrected anion gap is the anion gap which is measured, which you have found out, plus 2.5 multiplied by the normal albumin level, which is, should, should be there in the blood, minus the albumin which is there in the blood, okay, which is measured, and this value you'll get, and this will give you, this will give you the corrected anion gap. And the corrected anion gap is used, usually what we do with this corrected anion gap, because we need this to find out the triple disorder. You know why? Because this corrected anion gap is used to calculate the delta gap. Now, what is the delta gap? 
the delta gap is a delta is a delta an anion gap minus the delta bicarbonate or means the anion gap minus the bicarbonate gap that means it is also sometimes known as gap gap because this is a gap and this is a gap so it is a gap gap as it involves two gaps that is an anion gap excess and an anion bicarbonate deficit so if we talk about anion gap delta anion gap that is delta and anion gap excess because we see that anion gap is the difference between the unmeasured anion by, by and the unmeasured cation which is an excess so this will get an excess and this is equals to anion gap corrected because we take we talk about this as in corrected corrected minus 12 and this is bicarbonate so it is again 24 we know that normal bicarbonate in the blood is 24 minus the measured measured uh, bicarbonate so this is again the gap that is the deficit of bicarbonate and the anion deficit anion excess which gives you this is known as the gap gap and the ratio between this or the value between this will tell you whether the patient has a or um, 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 has a triple disorder or not means that means if we might subtract these two values these two values it will tell you that if it is more than six if it is less than six it tells you that what is, I'll come to that in subsequent slides. So triple disorder, combination of metabolic acidosis. So always remember, in triple disorder, when we have a triple disorder in any person, always remember there is no two respiratory component does not have two respiratory component. It's always the metabolic component, which is predominant. Either it is metabolic acidosis or metabolic alkalosis, <clears throat> along with one of the respiratory component it could be either respiratory acidosis or respiratory alkalosis so it cannot be two respiratory component in triple disorder in triple disorder it will always have two metabolic component one is metabolic acidosis and metabolic alkalosis and either of them will be predominant right and there will be one respiratory component which is either respiratory acidosis or respiratory alkalosis now it is defined you know what is standard bicarbonate at times the examiners they ask you what do you mean by standard bicarbonate then the residents they get confused the standard bicarbonate is nothing it's simple it is whenever we, we measure the when the blood sample is given into an ebg analyzer it will always see that you will see that the patient might not have a carbon dioxide pco2 might not be at 40 and the temperature might not be at 37 so what is happening is here the analyzer they make the the uh, they try to calculate the bicarbonate keeping the value at 40 as peak CO2 and the temperature as 37. So what is the level of bicarbonate if the PCO2 is 40 and the temperature is 37? So that is what is a standard bicarbonate. And what is actual, what is it, what the analyzer is measuring? So that is primarily an actual bicarbonate. Now, usually what happens in a normal situation, if you, if you talk about me or any normal person, obviously since the, bicarb since the carbon dioxide is normal, which is 40, Temperature is normal. So naturally, in that case, you will always see that the, bi the actual bicarbonate actual uh, uh, bi bicarbonate is equal to the standard bicarbonate. It should be normal. But if it is, if, the, if there is a reflection, it actually, if there is a difference, it actually reflects the non-respiratory or metabolic acid waste status. So that, that means if there is an increase or decrease in the bicarbonate, it tells you that the patient has a, a metabolic component in the patient, right? Now there are certain things before you analyze an ABG or if you if you before you take when you take a sample of ABG certain things which you have to keep in mind because they will always alter your uh, the analyzer to analyze the ABG and there will be artifacts or defects in the analysis analysis or in the ABG strip. One of the most important thing is delayed in analysis. So if you take a sample, that is why we say it's point of care. We always try to keep the ABG machine right in front of the patient. And now that there are cartridges which are being used, which helps to uh, you know to uh, to analyze the abg as early as possible so if there is a delayed analysis and if you are not maintaining a cold chain then obviously what happens the metabolism takes place and the po2 goes down and pso2 goes high so that is why we always initially before what we used to do we used to always carry them in a in a ice box so as the temperature is maintained and the metabolism in the blood does not take place and the pco2 does not go high and po2 does not go down so that is why delayed analysis always will hamper your analysis result excessive heparin you know heparin has sodium and heparin is a component which can again alter your potassium alter your carbon dioxide your oxygen your base excess and pH. all can be altered depending upon the quantity of heparin which you are giving so that is why heparin is very should be used just to rinse your your syringe and nothing more than that air bubbles now air bubbles obviously if you see the air has a po2 of a partial pressure of oxygen in air is around 160 
So if the patient has a PO2 of less than 100 or less than 160, then obviously if air bubble goes in, then the PO2 will obviously go more than 160 or you can say that PO2 will be more than, it will be around 160. So that is why if the patient has an PO2 of less than 100 or less than 70, there would be significant rise of PO2. So that is why air bubble should not be there. But on the other hand, if the patient has a PO2 of 200 or say 250, and you give an air bubble there, obviously there will be a fall in the PO2 because the PO2, uh, the PO2 of air is less, than, is less than 250, which is 160. So obviously it will dilute the result. And effect of temperature, as I said before. Now I'll, come, I'll deal with an example and then we'll try to carry on with stepwise analysis of the ABD. So we have a PO patient of an FiO2 of 50%, pH of 7.2, PO2 of 100, and PCO2 of 37, and an and, uh, actual bicarbonate of 16 millimeter of mercury. And here, uh, by, uh, and sorry, it is 16 milliequivalent. And then we have an SO2 of 96, sodium of 135, chloride of 96, and an albumin of three and standard bicarbonate of 20. Now we'll try to analyze one by one, step one. So the sample is arterial, venous, or mixed reliability of the results data fed in. So naturally, we must see whether the sample is, now this patient, if it is on air, obviously the PO2, SO2 should be more than 40 millimeter mercury, and it is 75% arterial sample. If the patient is, SO2 is more than 75, you say that the patient, it is an arterial sample, and we take it as an, the, um, the sample has been collected from, not from vein, but from artery. And we see that the PO2 and PCO2 should be around 140 to 150, if it is on air, and then we saw that, yes, it is an arterial sample. So these are the, some of the things which should al allow you. But if the PO2 and PCO2 is more than expected, more than about 150, 100, then obviously you should know that there's some sort of artifact in it. Now, how do you assess the consistency? Whether the, 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 um, the sample which you have dealt, which you have taken, is ha having the parameters which are there is 100% true and there's no dilution of this. So we know that we, by this formula or equation, we know that hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion divided by PCO2 will give you 24. This is what is the normal system which we send. And then we know hydrogen ion is 40. We normal hydrogen ion in the blood is 40 and 24 is the bicarbonate, normal bicarbonate, divided by 40, which is again the PCO2, which will give you 24. Now, if the hydrogen ion is calculated by, now how do you calculate hydrogen ion? You have two digits in the, in the pH. pH is 7.21 or 7.22 or 7.3. So it is something. Now these two last digits, the two last digits which we have. Now if this two last digits means it is, if it is two, it is means 20. If it is three, it means 30. So if you, we know that 80 hydrogen ion will be 80 minus 20. Now 80 is, a, 80 is the value which is there, empirical value which is always there, standard value, minus 20 because 20 comes from this, the two last two digits of uh, pH. It gives you 60, and normally bicarbonate, normally hydrogen ion is 40. So if you calculate from here, apply these values on this formula, the other formula, what we'll get? 60 is this value which we got, multiplied by 16, which is there in this patient with bicarbonate, divided by 40, which the patient has a PO2, PCO2, it is 24. That means this result, this this ABG which we have written strip is absolutely fine. It has all the values which are Correct. So this gives you the consistency of the ABG strip. And this is how you calculate it. Now, as we said, we need to feed in the parameters which are very important for the, the results to get appropriately adequate. The patient's temperature, hemoglobin, FI2, and barometric pressure, which is already there. Most of the images, they have these parameters. Now, when, when you read an ABG, which parameter you should read first? Now, this is something which is most of the residents, they, do, they get wrong. And that is why we we always when you are because we don't remember what does this abg mean to us it is arterial blood gas analyzer analysis so you are forgetting the gas component which is very important for us and by saying gas what i primarily mean is the oxygen so oxygen should be the first parameter which should be read whenever you're reading a strip remember this and when we talk about oxygen oxygenation we see whether it's an adequate oxygenation takes place is is in that strip and when we say adequate oxygenation, what do you mean by that? You see that PaO2, which is arterial alveolar oxygen. Yes, this is a formula which you might remember, or you might not remember because, because the, the strip also gives these values. And it is normally 97 to 100 
and 5 millimeter of mercury so if it is if it is and the difference arterial alveolar minus arterial difference is usually in 5 to 10 and if it is and we know that but 20 millimeter of mercury it gives you 1% cardiac output so if it, if you have a so and the predicted when we saw when we talk about predicted and how do you predict that po2 because we don't know if you if a patient has an fio2 of say fio2 of 0.5 or 50% then what should be the predicted it should be five times the fio2 that means 250 so that is what is the predicted fio2 and if the po2 which we are getting measured po2 is less than the predicted fio2 a po2 then the patient is hypoxemic you always remember so naturally if the the, if the measured po2 is say measured po2 is 100 and the patient is receiving 50% oxygen, FiO2, then the PO2 should have been 250, but instead of that, it is having 100. So naturally, that means the patient is hypoxic. Now, in case of COPD, it should be FiO2 multiplied by three times the FiO2, that should be the predicted PO2, right? And what does it, how does it help you? So it helps you to analyze that what type of hypoxemia is there in the patient. I'll come to that later on. And we know that the PO2, alveolar PO2 gives you is FiO2 multiplied by six. So if here it is FiO2 multiplied by five when we talk about arterial PO2. When we talk about alveolar PO2, it is FiO2 multiplied by six. And then this difference is equals to five to 10 and 20 millimeter of this, if the difference goes to 20 millimeter mercury, then there is 1% cardiac output. And that means normally we have that 20 to 5% is the shunt. Now, if I talk about PO2 by FIO2, which we talk, which we consider when we talk about ARDS, normally it is the ratio is about 500, right? And if it is less than 200, we talk about, we say it is ARDS. If it is less than 300, we talk about, we say it is ALI. And this is how primarily we consider what is the, Normal air on, on air, what should be the PO2? Mild hypoxemia, moderate hypoxemia, and severe hypoxemia. Now, you should remember this data because the, the examiners might ask you, when do you mean by, what do you mean by mild hypoxemia? When do you say it is moderate hypoxemia? So these values should be remembered by you. And now let me tell you, what do you mean by, if you say, supposingly, I'll give you an example. If the patient is receiving 5, uh, 0.5 FiO2 and the patient's PO2 is 100, do you think that the patient is normal? The blood oxygen is normal? No, it is not normal. I'll come to this one by one. See, if you talk about this, the if one when it is said that the patient is receiving oxygen, but the PO2 is less than 60, right? Then the patient is uncorrected hypoxemia. The patient is hypoxemic, but it is at the same time uncorrected because even after giving oxygen, the patient PO2 did not go above 60. So it is uncorrected hypoxemia. Now, if the patient is receiving oxygen and the PO2 is more than 60, but less than 100, that means the patient is corrected hypoxemia. That means the patient has been receiving, the patient is hypoxemic, but his PO2 is more than 60, less than 100, so it is corrected hypoxemia. The patient has hypoxemia, but it's corrected. But if you see a patient who's receiving oxygen and the PO2 is more, rises more than 100, but is less than predicted, that means the patient is overly corrected, excessively corrected hypoxemia. But even then, the patient is still hypoxemic. You remember this. The so patient is always hypoxemic because he's receiving oxygen. Despite that, he's not reaching the predicted value. So the patient is hypoxemic. But despite that, you can say it is excessively corrected hypoxia. Now, as I said, I'll give you an example here. The patient having a PO2, if I out of 50, PO2 of 100 at 10, the predicted PO2 should have been 250. So here, the patient is corrected, excessively corrected hypoxemic, hypoxemic, right? So classify pH as normal acidemia and alkalemia. So we know that this is very important, very simple for you. you know that if the pH, we know the range of pH is 7.35 to 7.45. If it is less than 7.35, it is obviously that pH is acidotic. If the patient is having more than 7.45, it is alkalotic. Okay. So this is normal when we saw this is a normal, so normal person. And we have gradings of acidemia and alkalemia. We must know this mild, moderate, and severe, and the values should be remembered by you. Severe, always remember, it is if, if it is less than 7.2, we talk about severe. When it is incompatible, when we say it is less than 6.8, the pH is less than 6.8, the patient is, that means it is incompatible and the patient is not going to survive. Okay, uh -huh. analysis, now step three. Now, if the disorder is respiratory or, you know, if it is respiratory or if it is, 
if it is respiratory or if it is a metabolic component. Now, how do you know whether it is a metabolic disorder or a respiratory disorder? First thing is, if it is metabolic, if the pH and pCO2 and bicarbonate move in the same direction, as I said before, when the when if it is primary metabolic acidosis, the pH goes down and the bicarbonate goes down. So they are in the same direction and the compensation also takes place in the same direction. Always remember. So if the pH goes down, bicarbonate goes down, so it is in the same direction, then it is acidosis. And the compensation will also go with a respiratory alkalosis. That means the pH2 goes down. In case of metabolic acidosis, alkalosis, the pH goes up, the bicarbonate goes up, right? And the compensation also goes up. That means the patient goes to respiratory acidosis, but then it, there's a limit to it, right? So this is what is a, respiratory, a metabolic component. Now, if you talk about respiratory component, if the pH and pCO2 move in opposite direction, remember this. Now, this was in the same direction. This is in the opposite direction, the relation to normal, in, in relation to the normal values. So this is a, this is an, a respiratory discomponent. And the primary respiratory acidosis is if the pH goes down, the pCO2 goes up, and the compensation also goes in line with the pCO2. Always remember here, it is not in line. They are all not on all in same direction. It is the direction on which the primary disorder is. So the compensation will always go towards the primary disorder. And the primary disorder is by carbon dioxide. And obviously there will be a rise in pH, a rise in bicarbonate. Similarly here, the respiratory alkalosis, if it goes up, pH goes up, the pCO2 goes down. So it's in the opposite direction and the bicarbonate will also go down. So there will be a metabolic alkalosis, uh, metabolic acidosis. Here it will be metabolic alkalosis. Here it will be metabolic acidosis, right? And if it is one parameter is normal and the other is abnormal, if one of the parameter like metabolic, the patient has a PCO to normal, but the pH is uh, pH is normal and the bicarbonate is abnormal, we always remember that it must be a mixed disorder. We'll come to that later on. Okay. Now let's come to this example. So if I have to is 50%, pH is 7.2, PO2 is 100, PCO2 is 40, bicarbonate is 16. And we know this parameters, albumin is three and bicarbonate, standard bicarbonate is 20. Now here pH is 7.2 and bicarbonate is, bicarbonate is 16. So what is happening? They are going, this is going down and this is also going down, right? What we say in the previous slide, if both the parameters are going in the same direction, what we say, it is a metabolic component, right? So it is always remember the two, two parameters when they go in the same direction, it's the metabolic component. The pH and bicarbonate move in the same direction and move, so it is a metabolic acidosis. Here, now that means how do you calculate the compensation now? Now we know this is a metabolic acidosis. How will you the, uh, calculate the compensation? Now body tries to bring the pH towards the normal by, by changing pSU2, as I said before, now, primary metabolic acidosis, there's a fall in pH. Obviously, there will be a fall in bicarbonate and there will be fall. The compensation will be in the same direction as in the primary disorder. So look for the expected change in pCO2. The expected change in pCO2 should also go down, causing a respiratory alkalosis. If the patient has a metabolic acidosis, then the patient should have a respiratory alkalosis. How does it do? There's a formula for it. 1.5 multiplied by bicarbonate plus 8 plus or minus 2. So you've got to remember this formula. And the expected bicarbonate here in this case should be 1.5 plus multiplied by 16. 16 was your the PCO2, the, uh, the uh, pH, I mean, sorry, the HCO2 was 16, as I said, plus 8, so it gives you 32. So range is plus or minus 2, it gives you 30 to 34. And what was our PCO2 here? Our PCO2 was 40, right? So the patient has, the PCO2 is not as per the PCO2 of measured PCO2, right? The expected PCO2 is not as per the measured PCO2. But so that means there is rise in PCO2. There's a more PCO2. That means in addition to the metabolic acidosis, there's a respiratory component also because the PCO2 should have been 30, but it is more than 30. So there is a, in addition to metabolic acidosis, the patient has a respiratory acidosis as well, right? Now, we must see whether this metabolic acidosis, which it has, whether it has a, Un, un, which is an un, unmasked or hidden hidden disorder as well. So how do you know the, how do you do this? So how what we are supposed to do if the metabolic acidosis is diagnosed, then check for anion gap. We need to check the anion gap. Now how do you calculate anion gap? So sodium minus bicarbonate minus 16 means this is plus sorry this is plus 16 uh, plus calcium uh, chloride. This will give you the uh, the sodium at uh, the uh, anion gap. Now how do you do this? 
so we know that anion gap the uh, the bicarbonate was uh, uh, sorry this was 16 is the anion uh, 16 minus 20 what is the 20 20 which we did which we found out let me see this is the 16 minus 20 20 is uh, the sodium and then we get You might think there is little uh, internet issue on source side. I think trying to calculate the anion gap, it will be 135 minus 96 plus 16, which is 23. Now this is 23. So 23 is the anion gap. And what is, if you say this, that if it, if it is anything more than 20, then it is gives you an, it gives you a high anion gap metabolic acid. So the patient has an high anion gap metabolic acidosis. So the patient, which the the strip ABG strip was having one metabolic acidosis, second respiratory acidosis, and the metabolic acidosis is high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Now this component is there clear. Now we need to say need to know whether there is a triple disorder. In addition to this, there is any other disorder or not. So what we need to do. We need to see whether the patient with the anion gap, which is calculated, which we calculated, we need to calculate a corrected anion gap because the albumin was less. If you remember, it was three. So naturally, here the corrected anion gap will be anion gap, which we calculated it plus 2.5 minus four, which the normal albumin minus the measured albumin, which is three here. And so, if we calculate this, so it will be anion gap corrected minus 12, which is the normal anion, anion gap, and bicarbonate deficit will be 24 minus the measured bicarbonate. So in this formula, if it is the if this gap gap, this is known as gap gap, right? If this delta gap is more than six, that means in addition to what the patient was having, his patient is having metabolic alkalosis also, plus and high and anion gap metabolic acidosis, right? And if the patient is having less than six, then the patient is having non-anion gap acidosis along with an anion gap metabolic acidosis. So let's come to this this patient. So in this patient, what we saw that the anion gap corrected was twenty three. And so 23 was, sorry, 23 was the normal anion gap. So 23 was, so the corrected will be 23 plus 25, four minus three, which is 22, 23 plus 2.5, which is 25.5. So this is the corrected anion gap, right? And so the anion gap excess will be minus 12, which will give you 13.5 will be the anion gap excess. Now what is the bicarbonate deficit? We know it is 12, 24 was the normal bicarbonate. Minus 16, 16 was the measured bicarbonate is equals to eight. Now, if you divide, if you minus subtract this, the, this value with this, we get 5.5. So 5.5 is less than is less than six. So if it is less than six, and if it, that means the patient has a non-anion gap acidosis plus an anion gap metabolic acidosis. So therefore, your patient has the patient has a high anion gap acidosis metabolic acid which we calculated from here along with it it has a respiratory acidosis which we had already seen and then along with it it has a non anion gap metabolic acidosis so if you say this formula if it is less if it is more than 6 it is metabolic alkalosis but if it is less than 6 it is non anion gap acidosis so naturally this patient has this strip which we saw has an high anion gap metabolic acidosis with a respiratory acidosis with a non anion gap metabolic so this is a triple disorder the patient has in this strip so this is what we were just talking about. And what are the conditions, what are the causes? There are a lot of causes, mud pillars are the causes uh, for high anion gap acidosis, metabolic acidosis, and non-anion gap metabolic acidosis is hard up. You know, you must be knowing this, there are a lot of things that, that it's there mentioned in the, in, the, in, the, in the book. And one of the commonest cause you remember is decay. You can get this and then isoniazide and salicylate. Salicylate is very common in Western world. So now we come to metabolic alkalosis. And how to, to calculate metabolic, so naturally we need to know the compensation as well. So for what is metabolic alkalosis? We know that pH and PCO2 and bicarbonate goes in the same direction and the compensation also goes towards the primary disorders. So here also the formula is 0.7 multiplied by bicarbonate plus 21. Now there it was, here it there in metabolic acid was 0 0.1.5 and this was eight. Now here it is 0.7, half of that, and it is eight, three times of, uh, 21, three times of eight. So remember this, pH is equals to, now here, this is an example. Let's cut, take this example and carry on. So if the pH is 7.1, PCO2 is 38, and PO2 is 96, bicarbonate is 30, 34. Now I'll not take this into consideration. Now let's come to this example. The PCO2 is equals to the corrected or ex
expected PCO2 should be how much? Then the Q is 38. That means that it is more than the expected. It is less than the expected. So it is the expected should be this and it is this. That means PCO2 is less than expected. So there is a secondary respiratory alkalosis. That means the patient has overcompensated and there is an, 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 a component of respiratory alkalosis as well. So the patient is having metabolic alkalosis. Along with it, the patient is having a respiratory alkalosis, right? So how to find out the cause of metabolic alkalosis? Obviously, you know that check the spot urine chloride. If it is more than 20 milliequivalent per liter, then it is saline response unresponsive. If it is less than 20 milliequivalent per liter, it is saline response. And this is how you go on managing this patient. So if it is saline responsive, give saline. If it is saline unresponsive, give acetazolamide. So this is how you treat it. And urinary chloride also you can calculate. I, we don't want to go in detail of this. So now step, uh, we come to the next step. The next step is, Analyze if the disorder is respiratory now. Now we have completed our metabolic component. Now let's come to the respiratory component. How will you analyze diagnosis of primary respiratory disorder? So naturally, if the pH and PCO2, as I said, goes in opposite direction. We talked about in the previous points to remember. So the pH is 7.24, PCO2 is 60, and bicarbonate is 26. This is an example. Let's take it. Now, how will you find out whether it's an acidosis or an alkalosis? Naturally, we know this. This is going down. This is going up. So it is an so it is a primary respiratory acidosis. Obviously, we know this, right? Now, first patient, let's see this. There are two patients. So the one patient is pH is 7.24, PCO2 is 60, bicarbonate is 26, right? And then we have another patient where again, the PCO2 pH is 7.34, PCO2 is 6, 60, and bicarbonate is 30. Now, if you see this, both the patients have PCO2 60. Now, now, which is an acute and which is a chronic? You remember this, that in respiratory parameters, we have an acute and chronic. So always remember this, because it can be acute respiratory disorder, which, which is not there in metabolic component. We don't have an acute metabolic acidosis or acute meta chronic metabolic acid. So that is not there in metabolic, but it's there in, in respiratory parameters. Now, if you see this, now the compensation, again, I said, you have to remember this, 7.4, Expected pH, what should be the expected pH? The normal pH 7.4 minus, this is the normal pH, minus 0.008, 60 minus 40. Now 60 is the PCO2, minus 40 is the normal PCO2, is equals to 7.4 minus 1.6, 0.16, which gives 7.24. Now this value is very close to this and almost equal to this. So naturally this is an acute type, simple and acute type. But if you come to here, come to this, here the 7.32, and here the PCO2 is 60 and bicarbonate is 30. What happens if we talk about expected pH? Expected pH should be 7.4 minus. Now here it was 8.008. Here it is 0 0.003. So 60 minus 40. So it gives you 7.4 minus 0 0.06, which is given 7.34. Now this is very, very close and similar to this value. That means the patient has a simple and acute and chronic respiratory type, a uh, chronic respiratory acid, uh, acidosis. So this this is an accurate, I mean, acute, uh, chronic, acute uh, respiratory acidosis. This is acute respiratory acidosis, this is chronic respiratory acidosis. So this is how you calculate in case of chronic, which is chronic. So that means you need to apply this formula in both these cases and find out which is very close to this, your pH, and then you can come to know which is an acute or a chronic case. Now, how will you calculate expected compensation of bicarbonate? Now, naturally, we know that bicarbonate has to be has must compensate in the same direction of the primary disorder. Now, we know this first patient acute respiratory acidosis was pH was 7.24, bicarbon carbon dioxide was 60, and bicarbonate was 24. Now, expected bicarbonate should be we said if it is acute, then it is one multiplied by one. So, if it is 24, is the normal bicarbonate. Plus one is acute. As I said, in acute respiratory acidosis, it should be multiplied by one. And actual PCO2 is 60 minus 40. That means we know that per 10 millimeter rise in PCO2, there will be rise of bicarbonate. And it is it is by one. So naturally here, what will you say? That divided by 10, it will plus or minus two. Here again, we if we apply the, the values, it will be 22, two will be the 24 plus two, right? It will be 26. And what are you getting here? It is 26. So naturally, this is this is an acute respiratory, only acute respiratory acidosis, which is having all the parameters which is compensated. So it is similar to that. So the measured value is it that means this patient has an acute respiratory. There is no secondary metabolic component in this disorder. Let's go to the second component, second value, second patient. Second patient had a PCO pH of 7.34, PCO to 60, 30. Here again, we, we put this value here. What will we get? Now here. 
again, the patient should be multiplied. As, if, as, as I said, chronic respiratory illness should be multiplied by three, right? Acute was one, chronic was by multiplied by three. And here it should be plus because this is acidosis. So 24 plus three plus three multiplied by this value will give you six. So 24 plus six is equal to 30, which is same as this. So the patient has a chronic respiratory acidosis without any secondary metabolic disorder. Now let's come to alkalosis. Now we know that alkalosis, again, the pH will go down, PCO will go down, pH, sorry, opposite pH will go up, PCO will go down. Now here again, the pH is having a 7.6, PCO2 is 20, bicarbonate is 16. If you apply this formula here, what we'll be having expected pH is 7.4 plus this value will give 7.58. So this value is very close to this. That means the patient has an acute metabolic, acute respiratory alkalosis. So this is acute. Now in this case, again, if we multiply it by this, what will happen? Seven points. Uh, if we, so, yeah, the expected yeah. pH should be very close to the uh, respiratory uh, acute respiratory so This is not very close, right? This is not close to this. So, this is the disorder. So, it is an acute respiratory alkalosis, right? It is not chronic respiratory alkalosis because if it has been chronic, then this value should be very close to this. So, this is not close to this. This is close to this, and this is an acute respiratory alkalosis. Now, how will you calculate the expected compensation? As I said. For acute respiratory alkalosis, 10 millimeter rise fall in PCO2 below 40 will give you multiplied by two. So here, if you apply this formula, now here it is minus because it is alkalosis. So 24 minus two, 40 minus 20, 40 is the normal value, 20 is the, the measured value. It will give you two, uh, which, will give, which will give a value of 20. So 20 minus 24, uh, sorry, it will give a value of 20 because minus, this, will, this is equals to four and 24 minus four is equals to uh, 20. Now, this is 20. Now, if it is 20, what is the PCO2? It is 20 again. So, uh, sorry, bicarbonate is 16 again. So, this should have been the compensated bicarbonate, the exact one. Now, the, here, it is more than 6. So, if it is more than 6, then what happens? The actual bicarbonate is less. So if it is expected, therefore, there is a, also a component of metabolic acid. That means the, this value, bicarbonate, should have been 20, but it is 16. That means it has gone down further. So, there is an Acidosic acid metabolic component, which is existing in this value. And this is what we are talking about. Patient has an acute respiratory alkalosis, which we calculated. Along with it, we have a acute metabolic, uh, with a metabolic acid, sorry, not meta, uh, it has a metabolic acidosis as well. So it has, a patient is, here we, what we diagnosed in this, we diagnosed an acute respiratory alkalosis followed by a metabolic acidosis as well. Now let's come to another case. Here we have pH is 7.48, PCO2 is 20, bicarbonate is 22. So if we apply this formula, expected bicarbonate should have been around 24 minus 4 multiplied by 4 is what? We know that per, per 10 millimeter fall of carbon dioxide should be below 40 should have a fall of bicarbonate by 4. We know this. And then the value should be 16, right? And where what is the value here? It is 22. So that means this should have been the expected bicarbonate where it is, it is now 22 is the measured a bicarbonate. That means it is more than what it, have, it should have been. So the, in this patient, the patient has an element of metabolic alkalosis. So the patient has a chronic respiratory alkalosis. Along with it, the patient has a metabolic alkalosis as well. So how do you know it is a mixed disorder? So if you have a pH or a PCO2 is abnormal, it is a mixed disorder. Either of them is an abnormal, it is a mixed disorder. If the pH is normal pH with an abnormal PCO2, indicates that the patient has a mixed disorder. It could be a respiratory acid alkalosis or a metabolic respiratory acidosis or a metabolic acidosis as well. This is an indirect way of finding out. Now, this is very important. This is something which we get confused. By seeing a strip, it becomes, you will get a con con condition where it will tell you the patient is either metabolic or a respiratory. Well, now, what do you, when do you say which is the predominant can, uh, factor in this patient? But obviously, by clinical parameters, also you can find out. But this is again how you find out on a strip that which is a dominant factor. Now, if this in this strip, if you see the pH is 7.2, bicarbonate is 16, PCO2 is 50. Now we need to find out. So here also the patient is acidotic. This is acidotic. Again, this is acidotic as well. So if you take this, the patient could be metabolic respiratory acidosis or a metabolic acidosis, both. But what is the predominant factor? Then it becomes important for us to find out. Here, the pH is acidotic, as I said, both for PCO2 and bicarbonate. Now, how do you do it? So bicarbonate percentage difference. So if we say the normal bicarbonate is 24 minus 16 by 24. So 16 is the bicarbonate divided by 24. This value divided by 24 will give you 0.33, right? Again, if the carbon dioxide, we know that 50 
40, 50 minus 40 is 10 divided by 40, it gives you 0.25. The greater between these two is the predominant. Always remember this. So if this is, this is greater, that means it is a metabolic component which is predominant, right? So if this value is more than this value, the carbon dioxide value, that means it is predominant. So metabolic component is more, so it is predominant. So this is how we can say that which is predominant and which is dominant. So the key points to remember, one is feed the necessary information, validate the strip, right? Always start with quantifying oxygenation. Never miss this because most of the time we miss it. Always follow the 10 commandments. I, I, I follow the 10 steps, but you can follow your uh, the book steps. The book says five steps. Uh, and single APG strip will indicate the condition of a particular time. Let me tell you, this is what I would always like to emphasize. When you get a strip, it tells you what is happening at that point of time to the patient. But it does not tell you that exact clinical finding what has, what has been happening to this patient. So naturally, you need to consider all the APG strip to say what the patient had an initial problem and subsequently because of your management, what the patient is coming across. So naturally you need to take, never take, the strip is not to find out the diagnosis. It has to be correlated with your clinical parameters as well. So serial ABG strip is needed to diagnose and correlate with the patient's clinical status. Always you remember, treat the patient, not the report. Now, if you give us some time, I don't know whether we have a time or not. Yes, Madam Chairpersons, do we have some time to fire to 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 uh, carry? Another five minutes, sir. And okay, I'm fine. Time. I'm always on me. I'm on time. It's almost ten. Uh, I've been given Absolutely. So what? It is. It is as I said. What I hear, I forget. I always say this. What I see, I remember. And what I do, I understand. Naturally, I want them to do it so that they can understand what's happening. Now, this is what the formula we have, we have talked all about. These are the formula you should always keep in mind. And this gives you, it helps you to find out your patient's findings. Now, this is an ABG, which says the PO2 is normal, right? 21% and the, and the PO2 is 98, right? Sorry. So the patient is on air and the PO2 is 98. So naturally, the PO2 is normal. We say this. Now, pH is 7.19, so it's acidotic. PCO2 is 42, which is normal, right? So naturally, this pH is decreased, so it gives you acidosis. Now, now what is it? Is it a metabolic component? Once you see the pH, then you see the bicarbonate and PCO2. The PCO2 is normal. What is the bicarbonate? It's gone down. So if this goes in the same direction, as I said, so it's a metabolic component. So it's a metabolic acidosis. Now, what should be the expected PCO2? Now, if you calculate this with the keeping the formula 1.5 multiplied by 16 plus 8, it gives you 32. So the range is between 31 to 34. And what we are getting is 42. So naturally, it is more than the expected, right? It is more than the expected. So the patient has some other component as well. And what is it? It is a respiratory component. Which is it? What is it? It is a respiratory acidosis. So the patient has the metabolic acidosis which is now let us see whether this metabolic acidosis is anion gap or a non-anion gap. So if you say this, sodium is 140 and chloride is this. So if we calculate it, it is 13. So it is less than 16. So we can take it as a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis plus respiratory acidosis. You can, since the albumin value is not given, so we cannot calculate the triple disorder or to find... Now the corrected album. If you have a strip, actually this is less as per the predicted value. So it will have, which is <clears throat> that means the patient is almost a corrected hypoxemic, corrected hypoxemia. And then the pH is 7.19, bicarbonate is 16, same direction. So it's an acidosis. Now PCO2 is 42 again, the less, less than the measured. So naturally here again the patient has a metabolic acidosis. Now here the, the sodium is 140, potassium is this, chloride is this. Now albumin has been given here. So if you talk about this. Then the albumin, anion gap is equal to 140. That means anion gap is 30, which is high anion gap. That is simple. Now, if we correct, it, the, uh, correct the anion gap, then it will be 30 plus 2.5. This value is give 33.75. Now, to find out the gap gap, this minus 12, minus 24, minus 16 gives you 21.75 minus 8, which gives you 13.75. Now, this is more than 6. More than six, right? If it is more than six, actually the patient has an high anion gap metabolic acidosis plus respiratory acidosis, which we calculated from here, along with the metabolic alkalosis. If it is more than that, more than the uh, six, it is metabolic alkalosis that we have already seen. So it is, it is, 
it is a high anion gap acidosis which we calculated from here along with the metabolic. This is a triple disorder, right? One more example. So if I if a patient is having a FI to 50, uh, Dr. Sujata, you just stop me when I'm when I'm over, right? So don't don't hesitate. I'll just go on with some steps. So PO2 is expected predicted is 250, but the PO2 here is 102. So it is excessively corrected because it is this is this is above the hypoxemic range, but it is not the predicted value, right? And if I to uh, sorry, pH is 7.1551, which is, and the PCO bicarbonate is 34. It is almost in the same direction. So that is a metabolic alkalosis. And PCO2 is 40, 55. So what happens? Now it is the predicted, the expected PCO2 should have been 44, whereas it is 55. So naturally it is more than the expected. So that means the patient has a respiratory acidosis along with metabolic alkalosis. Simple. Now let's take a respiratory parameter. So here again, pH is 7.2. I'm not calculating this is normal, so let's not take it there. 7.2 is the pH, PCO2 is 60, bicarbonate is 7.1. So naturally here again, they are going in opposite direction. So it's a respiratory component. So patient has a respiratory acidosis. Now what should be the expected pH? If you say it is an acute or a chronic, we need to know that. So 7.4 minus point this, it gives you 7.24. And our pH is 7.2. So this is very close to this. So this is an acute respiratory acidosis, right? And then if you see the compensation, bicarbonate should be 24. So if it is acute, it's one. So it gives you two. Two is plus 24 is 26. Now here it is 21. So it has more than a measured bicarbonate. So the patient has a metabolic alkalosis as well. So it is respiratory, acute respiratory acidosis along with a, with a metabolic alkalosis. I think this is the last one. I'll, I'll just go to this and I'll just finish it up. Uh, let's. Can I take Sujata this trip, this trip, or I should stop? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let's have okay. this one, and then we will close. Stop. Okay. So Thank let's you. take this. Let's take this. So this is again. Uh, this is again. FIR two naturally predicted. We know this is almost, uh, almost very close to it. So the patient has a normal PO two almost, and then uh, if it is uh, seven point five is the pH, and here. Uh, the PCO2 is 20, so it's in opposite direction. So it is a respiratory, uh, sorry. Yeah, it's an pH is more and this is less. So it is the patient is having respiratory alkalosis, right? And then what should be the bicarbonate? Now, again, we need to know whether it is a chronic respiratory alkalosis or acute respiratory alkalosis. So if you, do, if you put this into this formula, 7.56 should have been the pH, which is very close to this. So it is an acute respiratory alkalosis, right? And then we see the compensation. So when you see the compensation, which is 24 minus two, because it is minus, as per alkalosis, so it's minus two because it's an acute. So it should have been 20. And what should we get? What we are getting? It is 20. So it's an acute respiratory alkalosis. So it's a purely mm -hmm. acute respiratory alkalosis. And thank you so much. I yes. think I'm on time. It's 11 only. You, sir, and despite that, on time, sir. No, no, I, I have taken 15 minutes less. Dr. Joint Bhattacharya has taken 15 minutes. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Just on the joking side. Any question? I think there should be a lot of questions. If not, then probably they have not, I mean, they have understood or... I don't, uh, I don't know. But sir, I think most of the participants have joined. Surprising, yes. Surprisingly, we thought maybe some are still sleeping, but everybody was awake and okay. alert. Uh, Thank however, you, sir. they don't seem to have any questions right now, sir. So okay, we will really go on to the next session. Thank uh, you so much. We will meet you again for the session next. Again, sir. Thank you so I much. Hope my, I hope my uh, lecture was not hanging. In between, was it hanging? When I wanted to know whether speed is okay or not, but bandwidth here is okay or not. Sir, Please. absolutely. Was it, it was uh, it just time for a few seconds only, but otherwise it was absolutely audible and uh, there was okay. no problem at all. And now, Thank sir, you so much. we go on to the next session. It is a, of a nine-month-old child posted for cleft palate repair. And uh, in this session, we have with us Professor Nivedita Pani and Professor Ramita Acharji. And I don't think either of them require any introduction, but uh, I would like to say a few words about both of them. Professor Nibirita Pani, madam, is a professor and the HOD Anesthesiology and Critical Care in SCB Medical College, Katak, Odisha. 
and uh, her major achievements is so long that you can't believe it she had received the rk city award for best paper in critical care at rscp con 2018 the best performing national training for lsas in 2014 she has also received it from the ministry of health and family welfare government of india professor g c mitro memorial oration professor m c mishra memorial oration she is the president elect of ima odisha she has several publications she was the vice president of ic national and is the governing and the governing council member of iic national headquarters madam i think uh, most of our students are very familiar with you and uh, now to professor ramita acharya ji madam is the hod of the bangur institute of Neuro neurology in ss kim hospital uh, and i am honored to have her on board she has been my teacher and mentor for a very long time and even now i think there is not a student in west bengal who doesn't go for her for troubleshooting uh, i think you will be very beneficial with sharing their knowledge thank you madam thank you pani madam thank you amita madam for joining us on board and with us we have dr abhishek na who will present the case and uh, dr abhishek i would request you to present it very briefly since it is a short case and with him the co examinee will be dr debotri no thank you dr abhishek na please madam i would ask him to present the case yes sir thank you dr abhishek please share your screen and present the case in a very brief manner so that you can face more questions thank you acha ami question korbo shita please make it full screen right good morning um, uh, everyone today uh, i am dr abhishek kumar nag second year pgt of department of anesthesiology badwan medical college and hospital abhishek please be yes, a little louder so that everybody can hear you properly okay ma'am ma'am uh, i am dr abhishek kumar nag second year pgt of department of anesthesiology badwan medical college and hospital and today i will present a case on cleft palate repair a 9 month you know, old child with left sided cleft lip and cleft palate with cleft palate repair done 6 months back is posted for repair of the cleft palate the patient presented with complaints of as reported by the mother a gap in the root there was history of recurrent upper respiratory infections no history of any other medical illness history of cleft repair uh, cleft lip repair 6 months back no history of sinuses of pain came Uh, his birth history was normal vaginal delivery with no perinatal complications there was no history of other associated congenital anomalies development history was normal immunization status is up to date for age and there was no history of allergy to food or drugs on general examination the child was active and crying weighing 10 kg there was no pallor clubbing ictera sinuses or edema there was no lymphadenopathy pulse was 120 beats per minute respiratory rate was 38 per minute on system examination uh, bilateral vesicular breath sounds were uh, breath sounds were there with equal air entry and no added sounds cardiovascular cardiovascular system examination showed uh, normal heart sounds with no murmur abdomen was soft with no superficial or deep tenderness bowel sounds were present the patient was active with a good cry Every examination, there was left-sided complete cleft palate, including soft palate, hard palate, and upper lip. Uh, Other uh, factors of the airway could not be assessed properly as the child was uncooperative. Investigations: hemoglobin was 10.1 gram per deciliter. Total count was 7,000 per cubic millimeter. Differential count was uh, uh, such as uh, neutrophil 70 percent, lymphocytes 29 percent, and eosinophil 1 percent. Uh, bleeding time was two minutes fifty seconds. Clotting time was three minutes thirty seconds. Chest X-ray, PAVU, and echocardiograms were within normal limits. So the provisional diagnosis of the case is: this is a case of left-sided cleft lip and cleft palate with repaired cleft lip in a nine-month-old male child 
with no other associated illness posted for cleft palate repair. Uh, now coming to the plan of anesthesia, preoperative preparations done well as follows. Blood should be grouped and cross-matched. Antibiotic prophylaxis is given. No sedative pre-medications to be given. Pediatric difficult airway kit uh, to be kept ready. ASA fasting guidelines to be followed. Coming to anesthetic management proper, ECG, non-invasive BP, pulse oximetry, EPCO2, temperature monitors and pre-cordial stethoscopes were attached. A wad of gauge was placed within the gap of the palate. Pre-oxygenation done with 100% oxygen for three minutes. Induction agent used was intravenous propofol at the rate of two milligrams per kg. Analgesic used was, was intravenous uh, fentanyl at the rate of three microgram per kg. Muscle relaxant used was intravenous atracurian at 0.5 milligram per kg. Intubation was done with four millimeter internal diameter uncapped south pole RA tube and fixed on midline. Throat pack was inserted by the surgeon. ET2 position was checked after patient positioning. Maintenance was done with nitrous and oxygen uh, gas mixture. Intravenous fentanyl, two microgram per kg per hour infusion was given. In, uh, intravenous atracurium at 0.1 milligram per kg was given. Uh, warm fluid infusion with ringer lactate was uh, given to the patient. After surgery, throat pack was removed. Oral suction and examination was done with gentle laryngoscopy. Uh, neuromuscular block reversal was done with neuro neostigmine at 50 uh, microgram per kg and glycopyloid 10 microgram per kg. Extubation done only when patient is fully awake with full control of airway reflexes. Coming to post-operative care, analgesic was uh, given with as per rectal paracetamol at the rate of 30 mg per kg. Careful monitoring was done for early detection of management of delayed airway obstruction. Patient was allowed oral feeding after six hours, ensuring the patient is fully awake with full control of airway reflexes. Thank you. Uh, this is my presentation. Uh, Sujata, can I ask the question? Absolutely, madam. Please, madam. Uh, Abhishek, can you tell me what is the cause of this cleft lip and cleft palate? Why all these things happen? Ma'am, uh, the cleft lip and uh, cleft palate occurs when the uh, two uh, mandibular processes uh, of the palatine processes do not fuse with the primary uh, palate at the uh, during developmental uh, stages. So what is the cause? Why? Generally, you tell me what is the major component of the face is developed in which weeks? Uh, Ma'am, uh, the primary palate uh, develops uh, at uh, starts developing from the fifth week when the uh, nasal pits are formed from the frontal uh, nasal from the frontal palatine uh, uh, process, and uh, the after the development of from the sixth week, the man, uh, the maxillary processes are formed. And they push the nasal pits uh, towards uh, the midline, and the medial uh, uh, the medial margin of the nasal pits fuse to form the uh, to form the primary palate. Uh, after about seven uh, from the seventh week onwards, uh, the mandibular processes uh, uh, the the maxillary processes give out the secondary palatine processes, and they fuse with the primary palate uh, at about. Uh, uh, 10 to 11 week of development. Why the palatal cleft is uh, caused? Ma'am, uh, the palatine uh, cleft is uh, uh, caused uh, because uh, because these when the three components that is the lateral uh, right and left uh, palatine processes of the mandible uh, of the maxillary uh, uh, process and uh, the uh, central. No, no, no. Actually, what happened? The palatal ridges they. Uh, failure to migrate, so medially okay. to contract and fuse. That's why this palatal cleft yeah. is. Can you tell me what are the cleft palate is divided into how many parts? How many types? Uh, now the uh, cleft palate is divided into uh, two uh, into uh, three uh, main types. They are the uh, complete, the partial, and uh, the sorry, ma'am, primary. No, 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 no. Yeah. Pre palatal, then. Pre-palatal, pre then um, uh, post-palatal, and submucosal. Submucosal, okay. Achha, can you just tell me when you you have uh, taken your uh, excuse me, I'm, I can't. Ma'am, I can't. I couldn't hear the question. 
Madam, please repeat the question. You weren't audible at that time. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Now you. Ah, okay. Tell me, what are the con congenital condition you come across with this cleft or cleft palate? Generally, the because this thing is very important okay. during your history taking, you have to see it. Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, the congenital anomalies associated with cleft palate are atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect, a patent ductus arteriosus, and uh, ma'am, uh, there can be uh, meningeal my uh, myelocele of the patient. And uh, there are certain syndromes associated with. Uh, uh, what are the What are the, the syndromes associated? Syndrome. Yes, ma'am. There. What are the syndromes Robin. associated? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm saying it's Pierre Robin syndrome, Feature Collins syndrome, Golden Hair syndrome, uh, Triple Fell syndrome, and uh, uh, and Velo uh, uh, Velo uh, Down syndrome. Uh, Down syndrome yes, is there. Down syndrome. Uh, uh, Yes, ma'am. Down syndrome, uh, Patau yes. syndrome, is, and Patau syndrome can also be associated sometimes. Patau syndrome, I don't have any. And then any any other syndrome? Uh, ma'am. Uh, Clipple fell syndrome. Yes, ma'am. I okay. see it. Uh, Clipple fell, fell syndrome. syndrome. Then golden heart syndrome also. Yes, okay. Down yes, syndrome also. Down syndrome yes. also. Down it's syndrome. very common. Can you tell yes. me what are the common heart disease? Very much associated with cleft palate. Ma'am, uh, cleft palate. Uh, I have uh, atrial septal uh, congenital heart disease uh, can be associated. It is atrial septal defect. Uh, ventricular, ventricular septal, septal defect. defect. Mainly the VSD is the most yes. common which is associated. So yes, in your investigation, you have done everything. ECG also you have done anything. What mm. other investigation you have left to just to find out about the VSD? I have seen what investigation you have done. Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I'll do a, 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 a echocardiography and a Doppler. Yes, yes, you will do mm -hmm. a echocardiography. Echocardiogra Why you will do a echocardiography? To see if there is uh, any uh, defect in the structural components of the heart. Achha, you have done the chest X-ray. Will you do a X-ray of the mandible or not? And why? Ma'am, I'll do a uh, extra the mandible to see if uh, uh, the, there is any uh, retrognathia uh, uh, is present or not, uh, because th then they fall into the syndromic category of Pierre Robin and Peter uh, Peter Paul. Madam, can I ask a question? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> By physical examination, how will you identify identify the micrognathia or retrognathia? Madam, can Devotri uh, answer this question? Yes, yes. Devotri, I think you could answer this question. You will also have to answer, isn't it? By, phys by viewing the face, how can you identify the retrognathia or micrognathia? Hello? Hello? Devotri, please unmute. Devotri, please unmute. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can do the upper lip bite test. We will. Uh, hey, Bhutri, uh, please be a little louder. Ma'am, by uh, physical examination, we can uh, see the uh, retrognathia. If. Uh, no. Yes, ma'am, uh, by upper lip bite test, if the. No, no. Uh, upper lip bite test, the, the patient is so small, uncooperative. Uh, Viewing the uh, face from the side. Uh, in the face the from the side, you can sometimes identify the retrognathia. Yes, ma'am. And another is, um, how can you identify the difficult uh, laryngoscopy and all? Um, what is the radiological assessment? Radiological assessment of neck by measuring the maxillopharyngeal angle. Okay. Normally, this angle is uh, usually more than 100. If mm. it is less than 90, mm, uh, you can predict the uh, patient has um, a very difficult laryngoscopy and intubation. Okay. okay. Uh, Abhishek, uh, in your investigation, I think you have missed one point. Will you do a throat swab culture or not? Yes, ma'am. I'll do a throat swab culture because the patient is very prone to upper respiratory infections uh, because of uh, repeated aspirations and uh, uh, difficulty in swelling and hence there's uh, bacterial infection from there. 
Okay. What do you mean by the rule of ten? Ma'am, the rule of ten uh, uh, says that uh, if we have to do a cleft palate repair, then the patient has to be at ten uh, weeks old, uh, should have ten pounds of body weight, hemoglobin mm -hmm. should be ten uh, at least ten gram per deciliter, and total pounds should be less than ten thousand uh, per cubic millimeter. In this case, is in case for cleft, for cleft lip repair. No, for palate. For, uh, for, for palate, ma'am. Uh, for palate, the patient should be ten months old. Uh, huh? it should, uh, he should have a weight of 10 kilograms. Uh, uh, 10 kilograms. Uh, he should have, and the hemoglobin should be uh, at least 10 gram per uh, deciliter, and uh, the total count should be less than uh, 10,000 uh, per cubic. Why weight is important? Ma'am, uh, no, weight is important because uh, the cleft palate uh, uh, patients, uh, babies, are, have usually difficulty in feeding. So they are uh, uh, usually uh, they have a nutritional deficiency, and hence they are uh, usually uh, have low weight, but uh, and uh, can have anemia. So uh, weight is important rule of ten so that I can ensure that the patient uh, uh, can withstand the stress of the surgery. It is observed that if the operation is done below ten kg, um, the if the weight is very less, then the uh, incidence of complications is more and more. And the yes. operation should be done before. But why this clip pad? And what is the goal of the clip pad operation? Okay, ma'am. Uh, the goal of the clip pad operation that it should be done before the speech development age of the child, and uh, uh, it should uh, the upper limit for that is uh, 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 twelve to fifteen months uh, of age when the first speech development start. Uh, 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 and uh, what the are patient, the vowels generally affected? Which vowels? Uh, ma'am, ma'am, vowels are not affected. They are usually consonants. The other time, uh, consonants are affected. The letters P, R, T, and D are affected. Uh, and where the vowels is affected? Ma'am, uh, the vowels are affected if uh, there is, uh, ma'am, if there is a cleft palate, then there is the vowels are affected. cleft lip, then the vowels are affected. Are you sure? Uh, no, ma'am, I'm not sure about this. Then when should you do the cleft leap for what the operation is done? Uh, Why would you do uh, the cleft leap operation first, then the cleft palate? Hmm. Ma'am, uh, the <clears throat> cleft leap operation is done first uh, so that the uh, patient can start on thing, so that the patient can have a proper attachment uh, while sucking. So that should not be any gap. That's why we do the repair so that the baby yes. can suck. There will be no malnutrition. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Am I right? So when yes, in the pre-anesthetic pre visit, what you should insist or what you should see in the history part? Um, in the pre-anesthetic visit, I will uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, no, uh, about how the uh, if the patient is properly feeding or not. If there is a uh, uh, patient has some dyspnea while feeding and uh, uh, recurrent uh, episodes of sleep apnea, if the patient uh, has a uh, recurrent respiratory infection, and ma'am, if uh, while feeding the patient uh, gets fatigue or any incidence of sinuses is there. And history um, of prematurity also, you should see this. Yes, ma'am. History of prematurity. Now you have done your history, now you have done everything, now the baby has come to you. So, what so before taking up the operation in the pre anesthetic checkup what in what you will tell to the mother about the fluid management or what about the nil per oral statement what you should do okay ma'am ma'am uh, uh, the patient should uh, follow the nil per oral uh, asa guidelines which are as follows clear fluids can be allowed up to uh, 2 hours before surgery uh, breast if the patient if the uh, baby is exclusively breastfed then the breastfeeding can be allowed up to 4 hours before surgery uh, any other uh, uh, liquids like uh, the units for formulation formulation or artificial milk they can be allowed up to 6 hours of, of, of surgery uh, before surgery light meal can be allowed to 6 hours and if a full meal can be allowed uh, only uh, more than eight hours before surgery should be stopped. Okay, uh, cow's milk or solid food, you can six hours. Okay. 
Yes, ma'am. So, Kausalya, can you provide this? Okay, can I ask one question, sir, madam? Yes. What are the predictors of difficult airway? <clears throat> ma'am, uh, predictors of difficult airway. Uh, 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 in a uh, pediatric uh, patient, uh, can be uh, the, if the head or uh, uh, and uh, or the uh, mouth opening is narrow. Or uh, the palate uh, palate is not properly. You, know. you start from the age. Uh, okay. Start pediatric. From the age? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, if the patient uh, is a pediatric patient, then uh, uh, below one year of age. Below one then? years of. Below age. one years of age. Uh, then? then, if the, if there is any uh, congenital anomaly that can uh, okay. cause uh, macronatia. Uh, syndrome. Huh. Sy syndromic yeah. uh, problem. Uh, if okay. the tongue, tongue is large compared to the uh, oral cavity. The patient has repeated, uh, repeated what infection? Uh, this patient uh, usually suffer. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this patient usually suffer from uh, repeated uh, uh, staphylococcal infections uh, and. Upper respiratory tract infection? Huh? Uh, yes, upper respiratory infection. Please, CSOM, this child, they are very commonly associated with the CSOM, always a re repeated respiratory tract infection. Okay. Okay, am I right? Achha, you have told the patient has come to the OT, you have put the monitor. I have seen your one. What thing you have left in your monitoring system? Um, um, uh, have you written about the temperature monitoring? Yes, I have written, written about temperature it. Monitoring. Uh, will you do ETCO2 or not? Yes, ma'am. I have written uh, about the ETCO2. You will do the ETCO2 or not? And will you put, even if the ECG is there, whatever is there in a pediatric patient, the, will you do I'll a precordial pre stethoscope or yes, not? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma this that. part, you should make it in the point that yes, these are the things I should take care into the district. Okay. You are, suppose what, what pre anesthetic when the patient has come to you, what will be the choice of induction? You have written what choice of induction? Um, I have given an uh, intravenous uh, propofol as choice of induction. Uh, but there can be alternative ways if the patient uh, is uh, uh, very small and the intravenous line uh, cannot be properly secured. I can initially induce the patient with the initial anesthetic. That is a mixture of serofluorin and oxygen uh, can be given. How will you give to a nine years, nine month child? How much serofluorin? How much oxygen? How much minute you will do the pre oxygen? How will you intubate? Please explain the detailed procedures. See, you are a consultant. After passing, you will just have to handle. Everywhere you can't be sure I will give propofol or scoline, I can intubate. There may be so much difficult intubation, you do not, you will be, you will be scared to do the intubation also. You may, you may land it in trouble. So, yes. inhalation induction is also where you anticipate, yes, I may land in trouble, you can go for inhalation induction. So, how will you do a inhalation induction and what should be your ID, your, you have written four size tube, you have written. One question I will ask you. Will you go for a RAU tube for this patient or not? Yes, ma'am. I'll go for a RAU tube. Have you yes. written in your yes. paper? Yes, I don't. Yes, RAU tube. Yes, I, okay. I have. I have. You have written RAU tube. Okay. Please uh, ask, ma'am. Yes. What are the other endotracheal tubes you can use? Ma'am. Uh, other than RAU. Ma'am, in this patient, I can use a flexometallic uh, tube, which hmm. can be uh, given. Uh, it can be mic having a micro cuff or an uncuff uh, uh, can be given. Okay, you um, explain about how you will give the sevoflurane and oxygen and how will give How much sevoflurane? Ma'am, uh, sevoflurane uh, will uh, for the induction. I'll start uh, with the uh, three mac uh, of sevoflurane and. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they, uh, they both three, can, can you uh, answer? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you can answer this question. Ma'am, uh, 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 in we, all case, you cannot give the muscle relaxant. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in this uh, patient, we will uh, try to avoid muscle relaxants if possible. And uh, uh, we will... Uh, pre-oxygenate the patient and then we can uh, induce with uh, sevoflurane 
uh, initially at three mac. Then after uh, adequate induction, we can reduce the uh, mac of the patient uh, of the uh, inner anesthetic. How much flow of oxygen you will give? How much flow of oxygen? Uh, it will be uh, depending on the weight of the patient. Uh, this patient, how much you will give the oxygen? Uh, how much of liter? Will you not give the oxygen or not? Yes, ma'am. We will give oxygen. Then Along with sevo fluorine. Um, Have you given any time the inhalation anesthesia or not to yes, a pediatric patient? Yes, ma'am. So please tell the procedure. <clears throat> See, when you cannot remember anything, just in the postgraduate examination, what you have done in the operation theater, you just tell that the examination will examiner will know that yes, you have done the case. Yes, ma'am. According to the uh, weight of the patient, we will give uh, a tidal volume of uh, around uh, six uh, ml per kg, uh, and uh, by that we will calculate the total flow of oxygen, uh, <clears throat> and uh, and we will add sevoflurane. Uh, See, along you, you read it. You read it completely, completely. See what are the how the inhalation induction you should give. Please read it. This is very important. Anyway, you have intubated the patient. What is the position you should do it? Because within half an hour, we have to ask all the questions. Be fast. What is the position you do? Uh, yes, ma'am. What ma is the position? Uh, the, for intubating the patient, uh, the patient, uh, there should be a uh, sh uh, shoulder roll. Patient uh, present placed uh, underneath the shoulder so that I can get extension of the head. Then uh, the patient uh, uh, has to have a watch piece uh, over the uh, palatine gap and final position of the patient for the cleft palate repair should be a tonsillectomy position that is uh, hyper extension of the neck and uh, yes ma'am that's if that's what that you're asking will you not put that in the body that will be a pillow will be there are you giving dumb yes, the operation or not yes how you're yes, targeting huh no ma'am i'm uh, said that uh, underneath the there should be a shoulder roll uh, and a pillow being underneath the shoulders so that I can get the extension of the neck. Okay. Then anything else you should do? Uh, Ma'am, uh, I'll have to uh, uh, place the patient a mouth. In position, tube is yes, fixed. Tube will be laterally okay. fixed or centrally fixed? Centrally fixed, ma'am. Okay. Now, how? what are the... The surgeon will tell uh, then, will you put a pack or not? Ma'am, uh, the uh, pack is usually put in by the surgeon. So that the uh, but you uh, have to put a pack, okay? Yes, because there may be also side trickling will be there. Next, Absolutely. how will you put the mouth gag? And what is the name of that mouth gag? Ma'am, the mouth gag put uh, is called Dingman's mouth gag, and uh, uh, the mouth the mouth gag has a central port for tube fixation. What you should do when you put the mouth gag? You see whether your tube is compressed or not. Compressed okay. or not. So there is no kinking and there is no compression. Kinking or yes. compression will be there or not. Okay. Yes. Okay. Suppose you have, uh, now the patient is ready. The patient has gone for operation. During operation, what precaution as an anesthesiologist you should take care? Ma'am, uh, uh, as a precaution, I should take care that, that uh, while... Uh, Positioning of the patient, there is no accidental extubation of the patient. Uh, number, one, the number two, yes, ma number two number the temperature, the patient, there should be no hy uh, hypothermia uh, for which I'll take the temperature and the ambient temperature should be kept warm. And, will you not um, put uh, the ointment in your eyes so that eye will uh, not be, corneal abrasion will be not be there. That is so important. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes, next. Uh, next, ma'am, uh, no, I will... Uh, uh, I have to be in constant communication with the surgeon so that because we share a common airway uh, with the surgeon. So uh, any uh, problem should be reported, it should be totally communicated. If there is excessive bleeding uh, during cleft uh, palate or uh, uh, surgery, then the, the, I'll have to keep a uh, blood in hand so that I can uh, cross my blood in hand so that I can infuse. What are the calculation? How you do a, suppose that there is a blood loss is there. How will you give the replacement? What are the methods? Ma'am, blood loss uh, replacement can be uh, done uh, according uh, uh, 
uh, a formula that is the blood the hematocrit of the patient uh, minus the uh, either you can swab weighing method you can know one is the calorimetric method you know this part okay. you see this these are the things question being asked and how much blood loss is there you can give it so yes. why so important for a pediatric patient the blood loss adult ma'am uh, tell me ma'am uh, in case of uh, pediatric patient uh, the blood loss is important uh, because the uh, hematocrit uh, the blood component of pediatric patient is very low Uh, so any uh, loss can cause to severe uh, uh, tachycardia and uh, other problems with, and uh, since the heart is not uh, properly uh, equipped to tackle such uh, amount of uh, cardiac load then there is also chances of cardiac ischemia okay they both to ask them answer the question please nicely madam Hello. another thing is that we have another 5 minutes so we will be able yeah, to yeah. We'll just wind up yeah thank you Uh, yes ma'am how will you yes, calculate a blood loss in case of the cleft palate surgery okay ma'am ma'am we will assess the blood loss either by uh, uh, estimating the uh, seeing the swabs and uh, uh, mops how much blood loss is there then uh, we can uh, replace it by either uh, uh, crystalloids with the 3 to 1 ratio or uh, with blood or uh, colloids in a 1 is to 1 ratio and uh, <clears throat> for uh, anyway this part you read okay completely how mm -hmm. you calculate the blood loss that is very important you have to read this chapter well what are the now the operation is over what are the position you will keep the patient how will you extubate the patient tell me uh, we will extubate the patient when the patient is uh, fully awake and uh, uh, normal reflexes are there and uh, then after extubation we will keep the patient either in prone position or in lateral position so that uh, all the uh, there is easy drainage of secretions and, uh, and there is no uh, aspiration suppose you are you must be coming across you are extubating the patient suddenly the patient has gone for a spasm how are you going to manage the spasm patient is not a laryngeal spasm or how will you manage Uh, we will give hundred percent oxygen if there is a spasm, and uh, we will uh, if if it does not resolve, then uh, we can uh, go for uh, uh, relaxation of the laryngeal. Camera bulu. We can use either muscle relaxant or. Uh, Are you? I have one. Kode bich. Will you give? Uh, is the role of steroid is there or not? Yes, ma'am. We can. We will use steroid. So that uh, there is a if there is laryngeal edema, it will reduce the laryngeal edema. So uh, we will use steroid. You can go with for a nebulization also. You can go. Yes, okay. Yes. Okay. Anyway, uh, what are the post-op analgesia you will give? Be you fast. Will, within the data uh, uh, told me to finish within five minutes. I now I think three minutes. What are the post-op analgesia you will give? we will go for multimodal analgesia in this patient we will uh, uh, give uh, we can give opioids like fentanyl and uh, we can go for uh, paracetamol suppository or diclofenac suppository and uh, we can also go for infraorbital nerve blocks okay. what the in the uh, patient has gone to the uh, piku okay what problem do you anticipate in the piku there can be a post operative uh, post operative infection and the uh, immediate uh, for anaphylaxis infection is not our domain for us immediate complication what you expect we should have there can be an airway obstruction ma'am uh, yes because of uh, either uh, retained uh, packs or uh, laryngeal edema or uh, there may be uh, tongue edema uh, in that case uh, we will uh, immediately uh, try to uh, secure the airway And, okay, uh, and anything, anything else in the pico? You you have to be very careful. It can uh, add problem. Blood loss or maybe there there may be recurrent bleeding may be there. You must have seen lot of time second second patient may bleed immediate. Yes, yes. Uh, you have to reopen the patient also, and you have to take care of the hypothermia also. You have to take care. Yes. Okay. 
see uh, both of you done well but this part you remember where your lacuna is that number 1 the development part you have to be very thorough number 2 yeah. the fluid management how you give that part you take into care and the induction you are very coolly you have told propofol and scolin you can intubate no every time you cannot get the chance for propofol yeah. and scolin it is really really hectic you may miss you may not intubate nothing is visible full up with blood that how you give a inhalation induction that part you take care and how the bloodless surgery you have to be take care and do extubation spasm how to take care these five things you please both of you go and read and you be thorough i think amita uh, this is my thank comment you. is your comment uh, thank you, you. Nana. No, no. <laughs> okay it is okay thank you thank you ma'am is it okay thank you ma'am okay. yes thank you shweta ma'am ma thank you amita ma'am thank, ma thank, ma thank you abhishek and devotri Thank you. And Madam said you have done well, yes, and you sir. know where to where your lacunae lie, and where you have to brush up thoroughly. Thank you. You may go back to your original link as uh, students. Okay, please exit this link. And now we go on to our next case. That is the post burn contracture, and we have Mohit sir again, and the uh, uh, presenter will be Obijit Dotto, Doctor Obijit Dotto, and with him. will be dr shoham ghosh sir over to you sir yeah obijit where are you yes. i just need to Ma see you dr shoham sir i cannot, I cannot see you yeah uh, good afternoon it's good morning still it's not afternoon so yes. you, you know, sir sir can you see me can you hear me obijit yes sir i can hear you properly okay. can you hear so me sir so the first thing is my advice to you is since you are an full screen obijit Ah, thank you, ma'am. Sir, will you start presenting? Exactly now. So be relaxed, right? First thing, first okay. advice. Second thing okay, is, and to certain salient details. Uh, sir, I cannot hear you. Hello. Hello. hello sir we can't hear you properly sir i think the internet uh, is having some issue i think so i think so obijit just give it a, a minute and then start all right okay ma'am no problem sir thank you ma'am तो बंद कर दी एक्चुअली कनेक्टिविटी हैज गॉन इन इट्स कम बैक अगेन ओके आई एम देयर आई एम देयर आई एम देयर सो या सो अभिजीत यस मैम यस सर वेयर अरे चलो स्टार्ट स्टार्ट अभिजीत इज देयर यस मैम सो नेचुरली आई एम सो व्हाट वी डू सो इंस्टेड ऑफ वेस्टिंग टाइम एंड गोइंग थ्रू योर केसेस यू नो आई हैव सीन द केस सो आई जस्ट वन आफ्टर द अदर आई विल गो यू जस्ट Switch off your slides, and then we can ask one question by each. So instead of you uh, talking all the uh, you know the uh, cases totally, instead of that, we just can switch off one of the uh, one of the other slide, and then so you just switch off the second slide, right? Okay, sir. Second slide, okay. right? So this is also yes, we don't need this. Carry on. Yes, sir. Just, just, just go ahead. Okay, sir. Just go ahead. So I'll just ask you to stop. Do you stop? Okay. Ah, uh, so there, there again, you know that where the patient had. So we don't need to know this now. This is the place where you know to need to know. So she said she was resuscitated in emergency department, right? Thereafter discharge yes. after twenty days, right? Can yes, you hear me, yes, Abhijit? Yes, sir. I can yeah. hear you properly. So naturally, uh, inability to open. Yeah. So, uh, so my point is, my point is now here we know this is a post burn contracture patient, is it? Yes, yes sir. Abhijit, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do you agree with me? Yes, sir. So yes, it's yes, a post burn yes, contracture which is extending to the neck, its neck and to the arm as well, right? Um, and it yes, is twenty days old, more than twenty days, right? And yes, she is a young female, right? 
So these are the three salient features. And you said that mobility of the head and neck is 40%, 40 degree. 40 yes, 40 right? Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. So, so now why, let's, come to the, let's come to the question answer session. Now, let me tell you, let me ask you one question. What are the types of post burn contracture? Sir, post burn burn contracture uh, can be classified according to Onaga uh, into four categories. The first yes. category is mild anterior contracture, where yes. the patient can uh, flex her uh, flex, flex her neck and uh, can put her uh, jaws and uh, jaws in the anatomical position. Uh, the second is moderate anterior contracture, where the patient can still flex her neck and put her jaws and chin in the anatomical position, but any attempt at uh, further lowering, uh, at further extension of the neck uh, causes retraction of the mandible and the uh, uh, causes pain. Third is uh, severe mentosternal contracture, anterior contracture, where the, there, is a, there is a fixed flexion deformity where the patient cannot yes, fully so this flex. Is, this is fixed flexion deformity. Fixed flexion deformity is present. Yeah. Yes. And uh, uh, fourth is a posterior contracture where the patient is unable to extend her head uh, uh, from the uh, anatomical position. So, how, uh, which one is the most difficult uh, uh, patient for you? It is sir, one, actually, type one, type two, type three, or type four. Usually, sir, type two and type three are the most difficult patients to intubate because there is a less limited scope of flexion. And type three is the why not type four? Type four. Why not yes. type four? Yes, a type four is also difficult uh, because there is a lack of extension and See, type two is of... type two is not difficult. Let me tell you, type two is not that difficult. Type three and type four are difficult because one is having a fixed flexion deformity, so we okay. where we cannot go for an extension of the neck, and the other in is fixed flexion and and extension deformity. So both ways. So naturally, three and four is most difficult. One and two is negotiable. You can go out and intubation. Now, now you know that this is uh, this is healed burn, right? Right? Yes, is it? it? It's a healed yes, burn. So what are the airway related anatomical changes you expect in these patients? Can you tell me, sir? First, your of patient. All, what was the airway related? Yeah. First, first uh, airway related changes is uh, the reduction in the mouth opening. And then there is uh, yes, further very good. Uh, down, downward, there is maybe tracheal deviation. And uh, the, there may be, uh, first good. of all, uh, uh, hyper limited neck flexion. And then. Yes, that is very important for you. Yes, good. Limited neck flexion and, uh, or extension. And, and then there will be and, tracheal stenosis due to inhalation of so Tracheal stenosis. Tracheal stenosis is uh, obviously not very, uh, patient. it is not a very common finding. But what is finding is, as you said, one thing you missed, two things you missed. Anyway, any, go on, carry on. And sir, carry on. There, yes, sir, there will be limitation of chest wall movement due to fibrosis over the yes. uh, pectoral muscles. And sir, yes. there will be a reduction uh, in the, and also there will be nutrition problems which may be contributing to the... No, uh, I'm talking about airway related. Talk about okay, airway related, okay, right? Okay, airway sir. related. And so you sir, said you said it's mouth opening. You missed one thing, that is nasal opening also, nasal right? Opening, yes, sir. When you yes, talk yes, about yes. mouth opening, the nasal opening is very important because you need to at times go with your technique of management of these patients. The airway management is very important. So naturally, yes. you need to see whether nasal openings are fine. Nasal you know? opening. So yes. that can yes, be sir. distorted, nasal right? Yes, sir. So yes, nasal sir. opening you missed. The other thing is you missed is the submental the submandibular or submental submandibular, the, the softness or compliance of the submandibular tissues, right? It can be very hard. So negotiation of your tongue will not be possible even if the patient has a mouth opening adequate. So that is very important, right? Oh, so sir. anything you missed? Any other thing you missed? Sir, any other thing you missed? Words. Can't remember, sir. Okay. So anyway, you said most of the things you said. It's fine. It's good. Now, why do you think... Uh, Achai, let's come to the PAC of this patient. If you talk about because you wanted to say certain findings. Now, uh, what what are the points you would like to uh, know in the PAC? See in the PAC. Let's take it. What are the points you would like to see in this PAC? Sir, the when you do a PAC of this patient. 
So the most yes. important patient point while taking the pre-anesthetic checkup of this patient is the history of previous intubation, whether there is a previous general anesthesia or not, and whether yes. intubation was difficult or not. Because yes. okay. all, this is a case of difficult no. airway. And Thick. Thick it pre- just enumerate, I can understand. Airway, you can say that the previous anesthesia exposure to find out, rule out any airway difficulties. One, one second. Yes, sir. Second, second we, shall, we shall take history of about any convulsions, any motion sickness, any snoring or asymptotic disease, which may uh, which may cause uh, problems during induction. Because uh, if there is a history of convulsion uh, to us, uh, See, we... let's 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 talk in relation to your bone contracture. The convulsion is an additional okay. problem that is comorbid okay, status. So let's okay. talk about the patient with a co- simple burn contracture. We don't have any comorbid status in this patient. Okay, so what are the things which you always keep in mind? Then let's come to this. So first of all, we shall uh, uh, we shall eliminate the area of contracture. Right. So that area is one thing is, first of all, you must know what type of surgery the patient is going to have. So if yes, the sir. patient has come for burn contracture release, the, yes, the technique could be different. If the patient has come for, say, a, 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 a fractured neck femur. So in that case, naturally, airway does not seem that important for us. So that is why if you go for a burn contraction release, then it is important. So type of surgery is very important. And then next question comes time of burn. So when did this patient have this burn? Because time of burn depends upon, on this it depends upon your your drugs, which has to be administered to this patient. Then you saw about cause of burn. If it is an electric burn or or if it's a simple burn, a chemical burn, as you were saying that chemical burn because of sickle stenosis, so if it is a chemical burn, right? And then you need to so know the extent of this burn, right? So to what extent that trunk contracture is, that is very important. And then finally, assess the airway. And then you decide about the administration of the drugs. And one very important, you don't forget, please. What? Can you tell me what, yes, yes, sir. what you should not forget? Sir, there is a small request, sir. There is another examinee, Dr. Shoham Ghosh. Please also ask him questions. Because otherwise, he will go scot-free. Hello? Sir, can can you listen, sir? I think sir is trying to draw in from another device. Just hold on for a moment. Hello.
Doctor, can you hear us? Sir, can you hear us, sir? If you could give a call to sir and just figure it out. Yes, sir. I'll just figure it out. Sir is joining. There was a connectivity problem, but sir is joining again. So we can't hear you, sir. Please unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Loud and clear, audible, sir. Okay. Actually, the point is, you know, the, I mean, the operation theater area. That is why it's keeping. Anyway, okay. I think. Okay. Is it okay, okay now? Okay. Yes. 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 Shom, please put your video on. Anyone can of you of, from you can answer. That's not an issue. So yes. uh, now, what are the I mean, uh, what are the preoperative investigations you'd like to do with these patients? Sir, we shall conduct routine preoperative investigation, including a full, complete blood count, mm -hmm. and then platelets, uh, uh, urea, creatinine, mm -hmm. and then electrolytes, sodium, potassium. Mm -hmm. Uh, calcium, and then we shall perform a chest X-ray, uh, 12 blood ECG, and then we shall perform bedside pul pulmonary function tests. And sir, uh, I just wanted to hear one X-ray from you. Simply, I just wanted to hear one X-ray. You should go for an X-ray of the neck. Oh, X-ray. Oh, okay. Lateral and AP view. That is what you are missing. So that is one examination. Otherwise, everything is okay. That is for routine exam. But this is one exam which you need to know whether the patient, what is the level of flexion, fixed flexion deformity of these patients. Anna? Now, can you tell me why is it uh, airway? You need to assess the patient's airway, right? Anna? Yes, sir. So, yes, sir. Uh, so what are the assessment you'll do? Sir, first of all, we'll perform the, uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, first perform the inspection of the patient. Mm. That is uh, whether the uh, starting with the nasal nerves and then whether see whether the both the nasal nerves are patent or not, mm -hmm. and then we shall check for mouth opening. Yes, we shall check, check for uh, thyromental distance. We shall check for uh, flexion of the neck. Mm. And then so shall... what does what this what is this flexion of the neck? You said forty degree. So what is the normal extension flexion of the neck? So normal range of the range of motion lies from 90 degrees to 120 degrees. 
okay it's it's anyway chalo theek hai take it and uh, what about the thermometer distance you said sir thermometer distance uh, normally it is uh, 6.7 cm 6.5 to 7 cm below 6.5 cm thermometer distance is a predictor of difficult intubation and what is the mouth opening you would like to have what so does the what does the thermometer least... distance tell you what does it tell you <clears throat> So thermometer distance tells about the um, and uh, about the position of the larynx, about the placement of the larynx, whether it is anterior or posterior. Posterior. So what position. what do you mean by anterior placed larynx? Sir, so anterior placed larynx uh, is a high up larynx that uh, while visualizing under direct laryngoscopy right. is a problem. Very good. Very good. Okay. So any any other examination you'd like to do? As I've I've told you already before. Yes, sir. Uh, other examination is Sabrazer's uh, breath holding test and single breath count. So what test. does it tell you? Breath holding test. So it tells about the respiratory reserve of the patient. Okay. Uh, about the respiratory reserve of the patient. Why do you need to? Why do you need to know this? Sir, uh, we need to know this because uh, uh, it uh, during induction of the patient, uh, this will uh, uh, this will. The this will the demonstrate that the, the time for which the patient will uh, uh, will not desaturate. Or the, it tells you uh, the it tells you the functional residual capacity of this patient, right? The parsing and the reserve at the time of yeah. apnea. So when you are inducing this patient, so how long the apnea patient can sustain? Whether the patient sustain. has a good reserve, so as to so naturally that is why you would like to go for an apnea test. I mean that is what we are talking about breath holding test. Yes, right. So you've done your uh, the airway exam. Can you tell me what is the significance? What significance was assumed by the NAP four? You know what is NAP four? No, sir. I, I, you I heard this name NAP four. What is NAP four? NAP four. Anyone? Any idea? So NAP four is National Audit Project four, yes, which was done by UK. They said that airway assessment for any case is very important because that can alleviate your Subsequent difficulties in intubation. So naturally, here we are already anticipating a difficult intubation. So in this case, obviously, airway assessment is very easy. Now let me tell me ask tell me how do you go ahead with your management in this patient? What would you like to go ahead with? What would be your technique of choice in managing airway? Sir, the technique of choice, uh, I do not exactly remember the reference, sir. But uh, there are three uh, techniques of choice. First is a flexible or uh, flexible fiber optic bronchoscopy. Mm -hmm. And uh, followed by uh, intubation. Second is the uh, the face mask for ventilation, followed by surgical release of the uh, stricture, followed by tracheal intubation. And third is the, there should be a second generation LMA inserted if the mouth opening permits so. And so your patient had a mouth opening less than two centimeter, right? Enough? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Your patient. So naturally, yes, what sir. technique would you choose in this patient? Sir, the first technique of choice is fiber optic intubation. No, fiber and optic is there. Obviously, if, fiber, what fiber optic? You have to tell what fiber optic. What fiber optic? Fiber optic could be nasal, could be oral, could be awake, could oh, be sedated. Yes, fiber optic nasal intubation. Fiber optic nasal 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 intubation. Nasal awake can it should be awake or it it is under anesthesia. Awake, what? Awake, awake. So you have to say now. You have to complete it. Awake, 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 yes, nasal, fiber awake, optic, fiber optic nasal intubation. Okay. Now and let me let's let's stick, let's stick to this. Let's stick to this. Now, if you said nasal, so what are the stages of difficulties you like anticipate while going for an airway management in this patient? What are the stages of difficulties you expect when you talk about so any? Not get the stages. What are the stages of difficulty? You know stages. what are the what are the stage or what are the types of difficulties you face? Let's take it that way. What are the types okay, of difficulties? Sir. Yes, sir. Well, Types of difficulty. First is uh, uh, positioning of the patient. For patient uh, in these patients, as there is a neck contracture. So see, let's let's let's, 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 be, let's be organized, Abhijit. Let's be organized. Organized. Okay, so sir. when you talk about types of difficulties, most important first and foremost is you said awake, you know? You said awake fiber optic. So when yes, you sir. say awake fiber optic, the most okay. important thing is psychological preparation of this patient. Now you are trying to. You have to see whether the patient accepts your technique. So you've got to psychologically prepare this patient. 
right and that is the difficulty which you'll face first thing second difficulty washing sir second difficulty is uh, uh, is airway reflexes uh, minimizing the airway reflexes of this patient difficulty Ooh, second is difficult yeah. mask ventilation we will have a difficulty in mask ventilation in this patient because the patient does not have any extension flexion no jaw thrust so okay. that means the patient will have difficulty in mask ventilation you know third difficulty okay sir third so difficulty third difficulty is intubation so laryngoscopy third difficulty is tracheal intubation laryngoscopy laryngoscopy, laryngoscopy. so laryngoscopy will not permit you fourth difficulty is then you said that it yes, is sir. intubation fifth is as you said intubation. fifth difficulty you said you would like to pass a supraglottic airway device so what is the problem yes, with supraglottic airway device will you have will it, will it be easy for you to pass the supraglottic airway device in this patient no sir since the mouth opening is limited it will be extremely difficult to pass a supraglottic airway, airway device for so a, so it needs at least 2.5 cm supraglottic airway device at needs 2.5 cm now it is less than 2 cm so naturally difficulty in supraglottic airway device right and then what about the next difficulty yes, supposing you failed everything and then what is the next step you fail supraglottic you fail surgical surgical airway sir, will it be easy for you to surgical airway surgical airway will it be easy surgical airway yes sir no. will it be easy to go no, for sir, surgical airway no, sir. so it is difficult of no, sir, surgical airway easy. also hai na so it is difficult in surgical yes, airway sir. also and then finally extubating this patient is will also be difficult so all the stages are there or types or difficulties you will face in this patient if they ask you this question you have to start from psychological preparation to difficult mask ventilation to difficult laryngoscopy difficult intubation difficult uh, supraglottic airway devices difficult surgical airway and finally difficult extubation so any intubation difficulty is always difficult extubation so all these stages should be there which is difficulty right so what are the options for you you said the options one is one is you said fiber optic awake uh, fiber right? awake awake fiber optic nasal intubation yes. nasal intubation and the other you awake said fiber, release of scar the other in, uh, options you release said release of scar. of scar right so how do you yes, release sir. of scar yes, what sir. will you what will you use to release the scar what drug will you use sir we well, sir we will use tumescent anesthesia using uh, okay. two person lidocaine Uh, okay, I'll come to that later on. I'll come to that later on. So we'll come to that later on, right? So now you said that mouth opening is less than two fingers, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mouth opening is less than two fingers. Yes, sir. So what? What? Can you tell me any supraglottic airway device which can be put in in a patient who's having less than mouth two fingers? Any supraglottic airway device which can be put in? Supposing you you reach the situation. supposingly reach a situation when so fiber can, optic could not be done or you had blood in during yes. fiber optic so what will you do so can you have any supraglottic airway device which can be put without any to less than 2 cm to ye to phir kahan gaya hum to bolne you can use you can use eye gel yeah eye gel is still you need more size you can use what combi tube yes very good combi tube or lts hai na laryngeal tube with suction that's a second generation air with uh, supraglottic airway device you can okay. use both of them right if it is less than two fingers right and if there is more than two fingers you can any use any anything else right okay. so it's good very good so naturally you can use combi tube or you can use laryngeal uh, tube suction with suction now let me tell you if it is an awake fiber optic how do you prepare this patient from awake fiber optic in awake fiber optic so how do you uh, Sir, first of all, we will uh, counsel the patient yes. uh, about the procedure. No, that's enough. Counseling, Kaliya, you just be very fast. Counseling. Second is. Second is. Uh, uh, second is angiolysis. Yes, very angiolysis. good. Angiolysis, then, very good. Then there, there Third is topi topical spraying of anesthesia. Very and good. And cytokines and yes, very good, very good. And yes, carry and on. Then, and then uh, uh, administer mild sedative and then proceed with the. Uh, uh, administer what? We, I couldn't hear you. Sir, mild sedative, sir. Administer like injection. Mild sedative, sir. Either injection. What sedatives would you like to use? Bolas. Ah, huh? what? Sir, sir, I would like to use injection dexamethasone. Ah, uh, chalo, I'll come to that Hello. later on. Okay, chalo, okay, and then. 
and then, then sir, we will proceed with the fiber optic intubation. Oh, oh, one thing you are missing here. Very important. You have to pre-oxygenate this sir, patient, then, and you oh, have to okay, peri-oxygenate yes, this patient. Peri-oxygenate means throughout yes. your procedure, you need to go on giving oxygen. Right. High flow so nasal oxygen is very important. Yes. Sorry. High flow nasal oxygen has to be. No, given. no. High flow nasal oxygen you will not use. Why? I don't know. Why do you not use high flow nasal oxygen? Sir, uh, you not use high, high flow nasal oxygen requires. You, no, you, you use high flow nasal oxygen for apneic ventilation, right? No, you I mean, uh, six to eight liter oxygen through nasal cannula has to be given. You given can oxygen. use less than that. The primary cause of reason of giving oxygen is two. There are two reasons. Why? One is that you are oxygenating this patient continuously so that the oxygen reserve is maintained. Second is, there will be fogging. The patient is spontaneous ventilation, remember. There will be fogging in your, in your eyepiece of the, in your uh, fiber of scope. So that fogging will be prevented by flowing and giving and flow of oxygen one to two liters or three liters maximum. So naturally you need a low flow oxygen so as to go for oxygen reserve. And then subsequently you go for throughout the procedure, remember this. So, the dictum is add tips, add TSP. You know add TSP? What is add TSP? You said according to that add TSP. You know adequate explanation, psychological. D is decongestion. Okay. And then D is drying of secretions. So T is topicalization. You know? Sedation and T is preparation. So how do you obtain local anesthesia? Anyone? How do you anesthetize this patient? Another five minutes, sir. Okay, I'll finish it up. Don't worry. How do you go? Sir, how do you local, go with it? Sir, uh, local anesthesia is uh, obtained by uh, administering uh, 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 the a total area of the surgical incision is to be marked by delineated by a permanent marker, and then a mixture of two percent lidocaine, injection sodium bicarbonate, injection hyaluronidase. Hyaluronidase and injection. Where adrenaline. are you giving this? I'm it's talking about how do you give local anesthesia while going with fiber optic? How would you go with it? Okay. How do you anesthetize okay. that? That, sir. Okay, okay. Okay, sir. The, the, uh, the local anesthesia is administered to the nasal, to, to the nasal nerves. We shall apply the xylocal jelly and then we shall uh, in, uh, take uh, 5 ml of, uh, 3 ml of uh, injection lidocaine, 2%. And then insulate intratracheal. Inter and then if lidocaine spray is available, we shall uh, instill the will you be, spray. Where will, you go, where will uh, you go with intratracheal? One second. Where will you go with intratracheal? The patient is having fixed flexion deformity. How will you go with intratracheal? Where will you get? How do you identify the space? Sir, so we shall identify the precoid cartilage. By will you be able to the patient to do whatever see, see. flexion? Just, 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 try, ask, to be, asking just try to be rational. Question. Okay. Will you be able to identify the cricoid cartilage in this patient? Will you be able to identify the cricothyroid membrane in this patient when the patient is having fixed flesh and deformity? You will not be able to do that. Right? Well, okay, sir. So how would you go is, you go with spray as you spray as you like, spray as you go. Spray as you right? go. You go yeah, with the spray, spray as, as you go, go technique. Right? Or say go, that is spray as you go. So when you are taking, you are taking and installing the lignocaine, lignocaine, liquid liquid and lignocaine, and then we are doing 2 ml of lignocaine after every one minute and then try to go and then trying to paralyze your thing. Only thing is when you are going with your, uh, the moment you get, hit the vocal cord, the patient will have some amount of coughing and barking on that case. So naturally there, if you're thinking that there, a space is adequate enough, you have a space in the tracheal space, you have to go with intratracheal. You cannot go with the uh, cricothyroid membrane because cricothyroid membrane will always be obliterated because of your fixed lesion deformity. You can go with intratracheal only if you have a space there. Otherwise, it is not possible. You can. Okay, sir. Here. So, uh, you must know how to go ahead with spray as you go. You know, it is okay, because sir. you have to pass through your fiber optic and uh, epidural catheter and then you have to go accordingly. How much dose you need to give? Total maximum dose of lignocaine? Sir, total permitted dose is 5 to 7 milligram per kg. No, that is changed now. Please remember the updated is if you can go up to a maximum of nine milligram per kilo, nine, nine milligram per kilo, right? And that is what is the what is the numeric which is being used? What is the numeric which is being used in in anticipated difficult intubation in this fiber optic procedure? Can you know? Do you know the numeric? It is stop. Stop means S is small. T O P. Small S means 
sedation, which is light sedation. That is what I was talking about. You are talking about dexmedimetine. You usually use demifentanil, which is a very light sedation and easily can be recoverable. Then we have topicalization. T is for topicalization. O is for oxygenation continuously, and P is for performance. So your performance is very important. So unless you are trained, experienced in doing the fiber optic, you should not do it. Okay. Now one very important thing I would like to tell you is, see, this is a post burn contracture. The examiners can go in either direction. They can go with an acute burn, asking you the fluid resuscitation of this patient, and in acute management of airway. Do you think the patient can will need a management of airway when the patient comes with acute burn? Do you think the yes, patient will need? Patient needs a... When? When will the yes, patient? Yes, the patient need definitely a... needs. When sir, will the patient need? I don't really... Sir, the patient needs uh, acute uh, airway management uh, in the acute scenario. When? when there is a uh, when the patient is desaturated or so when the do you is, do you uh, do you need do you has, will you so one thing is will you wait for the patient to desaturate or with the history only you'll intubate no, no, the patient? You, with the no, history sir, only you'll intubate, intubate this patient. The, yes, you will intubate only with the history because uh, the what history will you take? Bars patient, sir. Bars patient will take history of uh, drowsiness. No, 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 no. Uh, Arey, what type of burn? No drowsiness. By taking the burn history, will tell you. Chemical, chemical burn, sir. Not chemical. Chemical burn, sir. Not chemical. 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 Okay. Inhalational burns. The patient has In been smoking, burns. smoke burn. The patient is perching out. Smoke burns. Yes. So there is always a possibility that the patient will have a problem in the vocal cord. And when do you think the patient will need an intubation immediately? When the patient has been resuscitated with fluid. When there is lot of fluid accumulation in the vocal cord. Then the patient will go to an acute obstruction. So that is why you have to electively intubate these patients. Always remember. One important thing is what is the role of succinium in these patients? Sir, succinium is best avoided in in these patients. As in, in, in acute burns, it may be used, but in uh, 24 hours post burn injury, it is best avoided because of uh, chances of uh, life threatening hyperkalemia. And uh, in, in this acute burn patient who has uh, so the dictum burn. is dictum is two days or you can say two weeks to, to some people some book says two years some book says thirty six months so naturally that duration you have to avoid now why do you think there is an hyperkalemia in these patients? So hyperkalemia occurs due to ex extensive uh, muscle uh, muscle tissue destruction. Which uh, releases the uh, potassium from uh, the tissues. So it's basically department. the extension of the extra junctional fibers. Extra there's an extra junctional fibers, you know. So why do you think there's an extra junctional fibers? Sir, why do you think there's an extra junctional extra junctional proliferation of the proliferation of the nerve fibers? Extra junctional proliferation of the nerve fibers. Why? So why do you think there's an extra? Due to neovascularization and uh, uh, why? Yes, sir, you are saying uh, right, but why? So due to uh, your co-partner can answer. Why do you think there is an extra junctional problem? Yes. Yes, sir. In a burn patient, there is extensive uh, skeletal muscle injury. Uh -huh. So when the muscles start regenerating, uh -huh. they uh, start developing extra junctional acetylcholine receptor. And, why? Uh, why? That is my point. Why do you think they develop? Uh, because they are immature type. No, there is a component known as rapsin. Rapsin. It's a protein component which prevents the prevents the junctional fibers to move around. But when the patient burns, this rapsin component is lost. So when the rapsin component is lost, this is a capsule which is being formed with the junct fibers. So when this rapsin component is formed, lost, then there is a proliferation of the extrajunctional fibers. So they proliferate. And that is why we need to see whether the that is why we have we can the patient can have a succinium liberated high level of potassium. So that is very important. So you got to be very careful. That is why ECG is very important in these patients, right? So how do you extubate this patient? Final word. Sir, uh, so will you answer? Yes. Okay. okay. So, Please proceed. Uh, so for extubation, uh, sir, before extubation, we need to. Uh, ensure that uh, the patient should be uh, adequately conscious, and mm -hmm. all the reflexes are uh, uh, have reversed. From patient has got complete recovery from neuromuscular blockage, mm -hmm. and all the airway reflexes are uh, back to normal. Then, uh, if 
uh, we as we are anticipating a difficult intubation, so we can use an airway exchange catheter for during activation. Yeah, that is what patient. I wanted to hear. That's it. Thank you so much. Very good. Okay, so that I'm over. I think if I, I mean you cannot ask all questions, but many major, major questions you asked, I think that should be enough for a poor and for a short case. Thank you so much, dear. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Thank you so much, and I well believe. Done. All of us have benefited from your input, sir. And uh, thank you again, sir. And oh, can, I, can I stop sharing now? Yeah, yeah. Now we will... okay. I, I, I'll, I'll take a leave. I'll make a leave once again. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you, sir. For, thank you, sir. for inviting me in this. Uh, I mean, it's, an, it's a really a very wonderful uh, platform. And every, every teacher would like to be there. Thank you so much once again. Bye. Thank you, sir. We now go on to our... Next case, it will be a long case, a case of partial gastrectomy with long-standing diabetes with insulin, who takes insulin. And our teachers today will be Professor Rita Pal, Dr. Amir Kumar Mishra, and Professor Shumon Chattopadhyay. Introducing our teachers, uh, Professor Rita Pal is the professor and HOD, Department of Anesthesiology, IPG Miyar, and SS Kim Hospital. Madam has been an examiner since a very long time and she has several publications to her credit and has been the chairperson and speaker in many national and international conferences. Dr. Ramya Kumar Mishra is the chief consultant anesthesiology in medical super specialty hospital. He is an instructor of BLS, ACLS and PALS. He has several publications and has been an examiner in DNB examinations on several occasions. Professor Shumon Chattopadhyay, he is the HOD professor and HOD Midnapur Medical College, West Bengal. And he also has many publications, not several publications, and has uh, participated as a speaker, as a judge and a chairperson and has been an examiner on many occasions. And he's a fellowship of pain medicine. He has a fellowship of pain medicine to his credit. And he has he's an elected member of the National Academy of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. And with us, we have our examinee, Dr. Sonal Kedia. I request Dr. Sonal to start the video. Dr. Sonal, please start your video. She may be having some, uh, some issues. Sir, Madam, please bear with us for a minute. Yes. Sonal, please start sharing your screen. And Madam, Sir, Dr. Shumon, with your kind permission, I will start the session now. Dr. Shonal, are you using Definitely. your file for presentation? Dr. Shonal, are you there? Please give me a minute. I think uh, Sonal, please. You are not able to share your slides. Okay. Please start your video. Please start your video. Please start your audio and video. Okay, okay, okay. Madam, please be with us for a minute. Uh, sir and Dr. Shuman, please. She's having some issues which is being sorted immediately. Thank you. 
so now uh, please listen to me okay yes please uh, start your video not your presentation first start your video uh, uh ma'am sir and dr shuman with your kind permission can she give a gist of the can she give a summary of the case ma'am i will be sharing ma'am just give me a second ma'am i want to share Document. okay fine that's very good okay take your time ma'am give me a second okay sharing me now Ma'am, can you request her to send us the presentation so that at least we can present it, or anyone from the committee can present it? Ah, uh, sir, I have uh, shared the presentation in the faculty group. Sir, I have shared her presentation in the faculty group for the boot camp. Sonal, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, give me a minute, ma'am. It it can be done now. Okay, okay. Your presentation is already with the teachers. Don't worry. uh hello dr sujata can you hear me yes you can yeah uh, while uh, this thing is being uh, uh, she is trying to make her presentation uh, i would just like to point out regarding what is expected in a long case absolutely so, uh, please do yeah. that will be so yeah. beneficial to everybody yeah yeah so this is the first session where we have a long case in this total boot camp thank you uh, sujata madam and uh, dr polash and everybody from isa For organizing uh, organizing this boot camp, so uh, initial uh, we are hello. So till uh, Dr. Shonal is ready, we can just discuss about this long case. What is being expected? So, we, so uh, in this time, we will have around two hours uh, time to have the. look at the patient one long case and two short cases generally write about it in your sheets and then in the this thing long case uh, apart from this history and clinical findings uh, a summary is uh, generally asked for a long summary comparatively and in short cases comparatively a shorter summary along with the history and pertinent cases uh, history and clinical examination it is generally asked for now uh, what uh, i want to point out is during the long case or the short case you are preferably if you are looking at the long case you have maximum around 30 minutes with the examiner so uh, this is the time within this 5 to 10 minutes is your presentation and then the question answer part of the next 20 minutes is there so mainly the uh, progression is how you answer how is the questions being Uh, asked means how you, how are you answering and then how how are you actually responding to the questions and then it moves on but uh, keep it in mind that uh, what uh, you are thinking or 
but severity is not focused in the total box only the say suppose in this case the gastric tummy the insulin the diabetes and what severity it's not focused only on that but other aspects also we have seen the other cases which were being discussed till now so various aspects of the cases which were relevant are also being discussed and uh, keep in mind that uh, whatever you are saying yes. you are a little bit okay no, so we can start no 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 you just finish your talk no 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 i i was just uh, making <laughs> this uh, making up this thing okay okay start please yeah let's stop it okay Neetu, you may start now. Yes. Yeah, please, please. Ma'am, do you have a laptop nearby where you can share your slides and do the presentation, not from the mobile? Yes, sir. I'll stop. Sir, has the slides been shared? No, ma'am. I don't see. I can only see your mobile view of Zoom. No, Do you have actually, nearby where you can use a laptop for doing the presentation and not the mobile. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can only see your mobile view of Zoom. Yes. And please use a laptop for the presentation. You know, we can hear something from Shuman. Shuman, please continue what you are telling. Madam, uh, I think uh, uh, you can also add in. You can also chip in your uh, experience. So uh, uh, you you uh, may add something to what I have told. Actually, the history taking, clear physical examination and investigation is very important to make a preoperative assessment uh, for this case. So history taking is a very much important for this long case. History and physical examination and investigation. This part. Must be totally covered in this uh, long case, first part of the long case. Then the questionnaire and anesthetic management everything. And uh, Dr. Mishra, what is your opinion? And uh, let's uh, share what you are views regarding a long case presentation for students. Dr. Mishra, there line. Okay, uh, if uh, we can yeah. go with the. Sonal, I'm uh, sorry, but uh, you will have to uh, start. We will have to start now. We are already running late. And uh, please start your video. And since all the teachers have your presentation, I believe they can ask you questions and you can answer them very nicely. Do not worry. Uh, I think uh, if she can, yes, if she can read out the say, slides. Yeah, read out the slides. Read out yeah. the slides, and we can make out from that. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Yes, sir. So, may I start? Yes, please. Hello. Please start. Please start. Uh, Dr. Mishram, most probably you have not unmuted. We cannot hear you. Now it is. Yeah. yeah. This is so bad. No, no, please. please start reading your please. slide. Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, am I audible? Yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. You are audible. Ma'am, am I audible? Yes. You are audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. 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 Good morning. 
good afternoon respected teachers hello yes yes please continue sir yeah please continue with your presentation good afternoon respected yes sir good afternoon respected teachers myself dr sonal kedia pgt from vims kolkata presenting before you a case of partial gastric to me with uh, in a patient of long standing diabetes on insulin my patient mr manabeen ji roy a 53 year old male hindu by religion by occupation driver was admitted in the month of january to the hospital with the chief complaint of upper abdominal pain for last 4 months and nausea and vomiting for last 1 month history of present illness he was apparently well 4 months back when he developed upper abdominal pain which was gradual in onset localized non radiating intermittent in nature burning by character and mild in severity it was it occurred between the meals and was aggravated by spicy food and relieved by walking it was associated with bloating altered bowel habits nausea vomiting and weight loss in the last two months after the initiation of symptoms after 3 months the patient developed interactable vomiting which occurred after each meal and it was projectile in nature it contained mostly the semi digested food particles which was yellowish in color with offensive acidic smell associated with epigastric pain it was aggravated by intake of meal and relieved on skipping the meals the patient was a known case of type 2 diabetes mellitus for last 8 years he had history of tingling and numbness in and both the foot for last 4 years and there was no history of hematemesis melena heartburn or jaundice history of past illness no significant past history was pres- present though, though the patient had two episodes of hypoglycemia which was treated at home with uh, sugar solution and there was no surgical history in the past drug history the patient is now on subcut basal bolus of insulin therapy for last 4 years which for which he takes injection human atropid 8 units before breakfast 8 units before lunch and 8 units before dinner and injection lantus 24 units at night that is at 10 pm before 4 years when he was initially diagnosed with diabetes he was started with oral hypoglycemic agents which included tablet glimepiride 2 mg before breakfast tablet metformin 1000 mg after dinner and tablet voglibos 0.3 mg bd with meals history of ppi intake was present for last 4 months due to the presence of epigastric pain there was no significant history of allergy the patient was addicted to smoking with at with 1 to 2 packs per day and he was non alcoholic he was uh, no significant family history present on examination the pa- my patient was alert conscious cooperative decubitus of choice facies was normal pallor present cyanosis clubbing edema jaundice absent his weight was 46 kg and his height was 162 cm bmi of 17.53 kg per m2 no palpable no palpable neck nodes and no neck vents were engorged his vitals were normal that pulse rate with a pulse rate of 85 beats per minute and bp of 108 by 72 mm of hg on examination of airway the mouth opening was three fingers malampatti grading was grade 2 thyromental joint was normal and the thyromental distance was more than 6 cm neck movement was was adequate extension and flexion in teeth examination no loose teeth or false denture was present my patient was a ac grade 2 patient with med score of more than 4 prior sign was negative his uh, bilateral s1 s2 was uh, sorry bilateral vesicular breath sounds was well present with no ad- added sound in the respiratory system in cvs examination s1 s2 audible no audible murmur on examination of spine there was no local swelling or tenderness or obvious deformity present the patient was not having any resting tachycardia or orthostatic hypotension on gi- git examination 
nothing was visible in on inspection that was that is visible peristalsis absent and on palpation there was a mass in the epigastric region which was four into three centimeter in size moving with respiration non tender regular in margin and no palpable organomegaly do you have uh, multiple devices logged in near you is there any problem then we can just know the gist summary of the case no ma'am no problem i'm continuing ma'am hello am i audible ma'am yes yes ma'am uh, would you like to share your screen now ma'am ma'am uh, the spine was normal and there was no rest resting tachycardia or no orthostatic hypotension present on git examination uh, on inspection nothing was visible there was no visible peristalsis present on palpation an epi epigastric mass of 4 into 3 cm which was moving with respiration non tender irregular in margin and no palpable no other palpable organomegaly present shifting dullness was absent on investigation we found that the hemoglobin was 9.8 g per dl total leukocyte count was 10500 per mm3 dlc Was with the normal limit, yes, with eosinophil count of two percent. Platelet count was one point seventy six thousand. PTINR was normal, that is ten point three and point nine eight INR. Sodium potassium was one thirty seven and four point one. Urea creatinine was twenty five and point eight. FPS PPBS were one twenty one and one fifty two milligram per dl. Respectively, HbA one C level was four point seven point four percent. LFT was with the normal limit. ECG showed nothing significant. Is chest X-ray was with the normal limit. Echo no regional wall motion abnormality present and ejection fraction was sixty two percent and no pulmonary artery hypertension present. CT abdomen four into four centimeter size mass was present at the level of pylorus in the stomach. Query of uh, gastric CA and HP suggested of adenocarcinoma. in the staging it was a t3m0 n0 gastric cancer this a 53 year old male diabetic smoker male patient on insulin therapy with a chief complaint of nausea vomiting for one month and upper abdominal pain for four months is diagnosed with the gastric adenocarcinoma of pylorus and was posted for partial gastrectomy now should i start yes Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, thank you, Sonam, for the nice presentation. But I think there are some lacunae in your presentation regarding the history, physical examination, and the investigation part. Um, you have uh, just told that uh, the patient is presented with the uh, primary vomiting and abdominal mass. Any other points you want to add, which is the common pr presentation of uh, gast gastric ulcer? gastric pe carcinoma uh, patient any other points you want to add from the negative history you want to know there was no hematemesis or ma'am there was no history of hematemesis and they may present with dyspepsia and yes, obstructive yes, there was no there was my he was having difficulty in eating but the patient was not having uh, dyspepsia and they may also present with obstructive jaundice yes ma'am they may present and okay then the patient has got the uh, intractable projectile vomiting what about the nutritional status of the patient yes ma'am and as we suggested have you mentioned any, any nutritional status yes, what do you expect in this case ma'am uh, nutritional status ma'am we have mentioned patient was malnourished ma'am quite the build was low ma'am hmm. patient was undernourished as we saw from the weight of the patient the weight of the patient was uh, 46 kg at the age of 53 
Okay, that is 46 at present, but what was the previous weight? You don't know, no? Yes, no, ma'am, it was not documented, but the patient suggested that he had a loosening of clots for last uh, few months. Okay, then uh, another thing is uh, for the vomiting, there is some changes in the system. What are the changes do you expect in this case? Because of uh, vomiting, since the patient is having mem gastric outlet obstruction, kind of gastric, not complete gastric outlet obstruction, partial. but partial gastric outlet obstruction, the patient uh, might be uh, is losing out hydrochloric acid, so he might uh, he might have mem metabolic alkalosis, uh, which is hypochloremic hypochloremic metabolic. What acid. is the cause of anemia in this case, ma'am? Uh, cause of anemia is primarily ma'am malnutrition. Any other cause? Maybe to the blood loss. It may yes, be occult blood loss. It may be occult blood loss. And another factor is malabsorption of iron. Malabsorption of iron. Okay. And what are the other factors you, you, from the history you want to elicit regarding um, gastric CA? Any other points? And another point is the problems with the long standing diabetes. What are the problems do you expect in this case? Long-standing diabetes, what are the problems? Ma'am, because of long-standing diabetes, we can expect, uh, ma'am, the complications of diabetes, which What may are be... the macrovascular and microvascular complication? Ma'am, in macrovascular complications, the patient might be having, ma'am, cardio... Uh, atherosclerosis. Because of exaggerated atherosclerosis and altered coagulation profile, the patient may have cardiovascular disease, coronary artery uh, um, which may lead to, and ma'am, he may also have cerebrovascular diseases. He may have, ma'am. Okay, another ma thing I want to ask you from the drug history yes, did you take the history of any chemotherapeutic agent uh, she, he received or not? Ma'am, I have taken, there was no chemotherapeutic uh, agent patient. The normal chemotherapeutic is. agent, uh, the, usually they are using. What are the common chemotherapeutic agents? And do you know the and Ma what are their effects? Five fluorouracil, cisplatin. These are the common agents. Epirubicin, epirubicin, yes. And what are their effect? Um, ma'am, they cause. Uh, ma'am, they cause. Ma'am, uh, the patient becomes immunocompromised. The uh, WBC counts get neutropenia. They cause actually the epirubicin cause the cardiomyopathy decreased ejection fraction. Okay, ma'am. And cisplatin causes nephropathy. Yes, and other all other causes the blood discretion thrombocytopenia. We are asking about these things because we are very much uh, concerned about the anesthetic challenges in this case. Huh? Yes, okay. And uh, regarding the history, any other thing you want to add? Then examination. Examination of what are the uh, examination you want to highlight here? You have got the primary cause and the uh, coexisting disease and coexisting long standing diabetes with insulin therapy. What are the common things you do you expect and what are the things you are in this patient? You have got the peripheral neuropathy and yes. what are the uh, clinical examination you will do for the establishment of the autonomic neuropathy? Ma'am, for uh, clinically, we can see that the patient, uh, we can measure for orthostatic hypotension. We can uh, see for resting tachycardia. We can uh, see other signs of autonomic neuropathy like anhydrosis or ma'am. Ma okay, and, uh, tell me the one important factor which is related to it. Sorry, no? Uh, autonomic nervous, that is gastroparesis. Gastroparesis may be what there. What is the other cause of gastroparesis? Yes. Ma'am. Hmm. Diabetic autoneuropathy is when I mean, the patient is having a, the disease, uh, disease which is process caused, itself. Disease process itself can cause gastroparesis because hmm. the patient has all altered bowel movements, ma'am. Okay. As I mentioned, and for diabetic autoneuropathy, we can go for other tests for parasympathetic and sympathetic system, for which we see the heart rate variability and. Hmm. Actually, monitor. examination part, I want to ask you about the examination of the respiratory system. Yes, we will be... Uh, there, yes. In, from your history, we couldn't find any uh, definitive uh, respiratory system finding, examination of the respiratory What do you expect in this case, respiratory system? Uh, respiratory system... Um, because the patient is diabetic and also with the... Um, Airway examination... Smoker. 
Heroism oh. is different. Yes, ma'am. Hmm. Ma'am, uh, in respiratory system, since the patient is smoker, ma'am. So what are the investigations you have done here? I think there are some investigation to be done that you didn't do any serum albumin level. Hyperalbumin no, is... LFT I have done, ma'am. In yeah. that, I, we found that the serum albumin level was 3 gram percent. And uh, one thing you have to do the fundoscopic examination. Yes, ma'am. For to rule out the diabetic. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, retinopathy. What is retinopathy. its significance? Ma'am. Because in the postoperative period, it's sometimes patient may have post blindness. Vision loss, which may. And you did the for the blood examination. One thing you have to do the cross matching of blood. Did you did that, that thing? Ma'am, cross matching of blood. Blood grouping determination. Uh, blood, yes, sorry, I'm very much sorry. Blood grouping and cross matching. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And any other investigation? Yes, you did the urine analysis of this case. Ma'am, urine analysis for microalbumin urea should be done, but it is not done in this case. And any other examination? Investigations, ma'am. Okay. And uh, for the kidney disease, diabetic kidney disease, what are the investigation you want to have? Ma'am, we can have, uh, for to rule out uh, this, ma'am, we have this uh, patient serum urea creatinine level. Okay. And and ma'am, we can have a uh, stat, ma'am. Uh, we can rule out uh, urea, urine spot ACR ratio, that is aluminum creatinine ratio. Okay. Huh. And which, uh, what does it indicate? Ma'am, it indicates diabetic nephropathy. Mm -hmm. Creatinine clearance. Creatinine yeah. clearance. Clearance is Next. Someone you can ask me. Uh, okay. Uh, actually, uh, uh, I just want to point out that your summary is not adequate for a, a long case. Yes. So uh, yeah. So this is a sort of a, a conclusion of the summary. So uh, I had thought about this. I will just read out what uh, I have thought that summary could have been from your presentation. So I'll take just around uh, four or five minutes for this. So my, if I was in your place, my summary would have been like this. My case is a middle-aged male driver who is uh, driving by occupation, who is complaining of upper abdominal pain for the last four months, which is gradual in onset and localized probably in the epigastric region. You have not mentioned that. Yeah. Yes, I mentioned. No, uh, actually I failed to find it in this. Uh, this. Okay, in the epigastric region. and. Uh, thereafter, uh, after two months, he has developed uh, altered bowel habits, and within the last one month, he has developed intractable uh, vomiting after taking the meals. And this was associated with epigastric pain without blood. And there was no history of jaundice and melina. The diabetic, uh, the patient is a diabetic for last eight years. Initially, he was on oral hypoglycemic agents, but for the last four years. Uh, I think around four years, no? He is taking yes, this uh, insulin. insulin. Insulin, yeah, he is on insulin, both this basal bolus regime of insulin he is taking. And he is now, uh, over this period, he is also complaining of uh, tingling and numbness of the foot. And uh, along with that, he is a known smoker for the last 20 years. On clinical examination, he is alert, conscious, cooperative with slight pallor and a very low body weight of 46 kgs. But uh, otherwise, his general survey is normal. Coming to the systemic examination, these were within normal limit, except the uh, presence of a non-tender epigastric mass of four into three centimeter with irregular margin and which was moving freely with expiration. No other organomegaly or ascites was detected in abdominal examination. His airway and spine examination were also normal. His investigation revealed a presence of anemia, leukocytosis, and stage 2a gastric carcinoma on CT abdomen with histopathological diagnosis of adenopathy. So my case is a 53-year-old diabetic smoker, male patient of ASA grade 3, currently on insulin therapy, diagnosed histopathologically as adenocarcinoma, hosted for partial gastrectomy. I think this may be a good uh, 
sort of summary. Okay. okay. Yes. Yeah. So summary in a long case uh, is to be uh, because this is the part where the examiner is actually again uh, trying to find out. But uh, if he has missed out, again to recapitulate for both himself or herself and you. So the next questions are based on this summary how you actually place it. So uh, yeah, summary should be done very carefully, taking in consideration all the important points. Uh, particularly the history clinical examination and not forgetting the negative points also. So uh, some negative points like uh, uh, this, which uh, could have been highlighted, what could have been this negative points means this is good thing uh, for the patient, which you found in this patient, this patient with partial gastrectomy with uh, long-standing diabetes. What were the good points you found out? Uh, sir, there was uh... The good points were, sir, the patient was cardiovascularly, the patient was stable, his hemodynamics were stable, though the patient was a long-standing diabetes case, and sir, uh, uh, the patient was not having any kind of diabetic autoneuropathy, the patient was, uh, uh, the patient was also, uh, so because of gas, gas this, uh, because of the pathology itself, the patient was not having complete obstruction. The patient might would have went into gastric out, complete gastric outlet obstruction, which was not there. The yes. patient was not having dysphagia, much much of dysphagia. He was able to eat, though he vomited the food, whatever he used to take, but the patient was not having complete dysphagia. Yeah. And also he has a good uh, kidney function test. Good kidney and apart function from, test. Yes. And apart the hemoglobin from... was not very low. Yeah, not very low. And apart from being a smoker for such a long duration, there are no significant problems in his uh, respiratory system. Yeah. Okay. Regarding respiratory system with a long drawn uh, history of uh, smoking, again, spirometry uh, should have been added in your investigation. Yes, sir, as yes. I find it. Yes. And uh, I think uh, before this thing, uh, to have this proper, sometimes it is now been told that this patient should, before going on operation, they should have an endoscopy. So the endoscopy, endoscopy was done, uh, that only uh, took the HPE uh, so that it was diagnosed adenocarcinoma, that okay. was, biopsy was taken by endoscopy. Yes, and also uh, diagnostic laparoscopy. Ultrasound. Ultrasound. Yeah, ultrasonic, yes. And then... Endoscopic uh, ultrasound. Yes, <laughs> yes ma'am. And also uh, uh, sort of uh, laparoscopy. Uh, could be That's done to see. Yes, 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 yeah, yeah. That could have been uh, added this thing. So uh, this is the point uh, which I wanted to hand out, and uh, I'll just, uh, Dr. Mishra, uh, you want to add something to this before we move on? Hello. Okay. So uh, uh, I will just uh, like to uh, with. Madam's permission, I will just ask you this question. And how do you like to optimize this patient before operation? The one thing I want to ask whether the patient was put for the laparoscopic operation or the open. Open, ma'am. It was the open. The patient okay. was put for open surgery. Okay. 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 So, how do you plan to optimize this patient before uh, the, the operation? Uh, sir, the, for op we we have seen the we have we went to for the preoperative examination the day before the surgery, and the patient was already counselled for stopping the smoking when he was he came to the OPD for anaesthetic fitness. Since then he has stopped smoking, so that was already a good part taken care of. And so rest of the investigations we didn't repeat other than the electrolytes. Okay. Uh, investigations were within normal limit, and so uh, since the patient is kind of malnourished uh, in the uh, previous day, we start in the OT uh, in uh, along with the advice of giving uh, the advices we add uh, in the pre op after doing a preoperative checkup the day before. We added that uh, we, the patient should omit the dose of insulin on the day of the surgery and the morning CBG should be checked and the patient was though not having a uh, not having any severe sign of dehydration the patient was started with IV fluid the night before surgery and the patient was in gastric lavage the night before surgery as a part of OT preparation 
actually one thing i want to ask what is the type of fluid and what is the fasting guideline in this case pre operative preparation yes ma'am so pre operatively for the fasting guidelines i kept the patient npm for 8 hours and a solid offer solid food for 8 hours and for clear liquid for 2 hours and the patient was all, uh, having was planned to give nasogastric tube in the night before surgery to give gastric lavage so patient was already on gas having a nasogastric tube and iv fluid was started the night before surgery with uh, what type of fluid you will uh, start with plasma light plasma light hello yes ma'am ma then it continue and sir uh, pre operatively do you want to give the glucose solution in the pre operative period so ma uh, patient was uh, not kept for fasting for long uh, so ma'am we can give dns but uh, we can give dns ma i am asking about the um, Uh, nutritional support and all yes ma'am ma since the patient was uh, kept for npm for 8 hours in that hours we gave alternative fluid of dns and plasma light so that patient can have the nutritional support roll up oh. insulin someone you just uh, clarify yeah. this part yeah actually i would just uh, like to you said that uh, when did you do the last investigation beforehand uh, so you, you told that you will be not doing any further investigation so when is the last investigation you are doing ma'am sir it was one uh, around 15, 20 days back 15 20 days yeah but uh, after no. that uh, this uh, whatever uh, if any other investigation which you again need to repeat is i think yes, sir. hemoglobin hemoglobin and sir the potassium sodium potassium yeah the electrolytes electrolytes well, and the uh, and also the sugar level you need sugar to level. again sugar level it. cbg uh, monitoring was mm -hmm. continuously being done since the patient was on insulin yeah mm -hmm. and also i think that uh, total uh, leukocyte count and whatsoever this should be again repeated uh, at least uh, yeah, yeah. The within the week of operation within the week of operation three days is i think it, it it depends on it but within the week of operation preferably three days within the operation is required uh, i think another participant is there uh, dr neetu uh, yes, she, she is she with us so, yes sir hello yeah so uh, actually she has told uh, as i understand is that she uh, the patient is a long standing diabetes initially she was uh, he was an oha but uh, thereafter it was changed to insulin he is now receiving this uh, human actrapid as uh, boluses and the basal dose of uh, this uh, uh, glarbin yeah, yeah okay suman so, i so, want to just uh, you ask uh, another examine is there yeah yeah i am need asking her only yeah yeah need i need her only yes Achha, i am okay. asking her only and, i am asking her only also uh, after yeah. that dr romia is yeah. requested to ask the question after that yes i was just asking uh, uh, yeah dr neetu regarding the insulin neetu. management and uh, she was uh, uh, but uh, dr sonal told is uh, we continue with the same dose of basal uh, this thing uh, or we discontinue but what do you, what is your opinion uh, regarding the she was this per person was taking this long acting insulin at the night before the operation so what to do about this so i would like to stop the long acting insulin and continue with the uh, uh, short acting insulin sir regular insulin are you uh, actually going to totally stop it or can you modify no. it to some like action? according to the sliding scale we can start sir regular insulin uh actually the day before operation the newer guidelines if you look at it they say that around 80% sometimes at least two third of the dose you may give so the night before operation he was probably getting lantus 24 units so two third of that two is third 15 two units hours. yeah so two third you can uh, give according to the guidelines because this will be helping to prevent hypoglycemia intraoperatively much better okay now so the day of the operation a sliding scale you generally do not mention in the Uh, in this examination sliding scale is a little bit out of the way 
Okay. You, so the day of the operation. Uh, so how are you going to this manage your insulin this thing? When are you going to check this uh, uh, in this uh, in blood sugar level? Morning. So you are going okay. to this patient in the early morning. I will suppose. So suppose the patient is posted at uh, nine a.m. So when are you going to uh, actually check this blood sugar in the morning and before the operation? At least twice, I suppose. Two. And before once when... morning in in the early morning, CBG will be done. I answer once on the table or on the operation table. Before the operation table. Before the operation. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. You, you need to check. One, and one I thing, will... uh, just uh, I want to ask uh, Dr. Omiya. Uh, the insulin. Any comment from your side? We can't hear you. I think. Yeah, maybe his mic is muted. Mr. Mm -hmm. Sir, please unmute. Okay. Uh, uh, hmm. While he while uh, just move on, I will just ask you. Okay. Okay. Just continue. I'm... Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, I'll just continue with this. So, uh, if we are following the ERAS protocol. So there is, apart from you have told that you will be having this uh, clear fluids up to two hours before operation, but there is another thing called the carbohydrate loading, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, regarding carbohydrate loading, what is your idea about this case with the diabetic, long-standing diabetes? Sir, this is Yes, yes, yes. We can hear you, Dr. Mishra. We can hear you. We can hear you very well. But we can't see you, only hear you. Okay. 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 So, uh, what is your idea, uh, Sonal or Dr. Neetu, uh, regarding this uh, carbohydrate loading in these patients? So, carbohydrate loading uh, takes care of uh, takes care of that the patient is not uh, not going to hypoglycemia intraoperatively also it takes care of the calorie requirement of the patient since the patient is going to remain npm from the pre op status till a uh, much longer time post operatively also as the patient is having gi surgery yeah. so it is all right the, now, it, it prevents the release of the uh, anti insulin hor yeah. hormones in the body yeah i Stress understand hormones yeah so the most important things I would just like to point out is it prevents the ketoacidosis due to fasting, fasting. as well as the stress of fasting. Yes, so the two things which you should mention. Yes. Now over to you, Dr. Mishra, please ask. Yeah, yeah, sir. Am I audible now? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes, yes. Okay. You are visible okay. also. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so we are, our patient is a 50 year old driver by profession and a chronic smoker. And with good effort tolerance, as per Sonal. Okay, Sonal, just tell me how to assess the effort tolerance. Sir? How to assess the effort tolerance of a patient? Uh, sir, we can we can check for the med score of the patient. Tell me how. Yes, sir, in, in med school, uh, med school is a metabolic equivalent score, sir. Where if the patient is able, uh, we generally consider it patient to be fit and fine if it is if it is more than equal to four, uh, where the patient can do his day uh, day to day work work uh, easily, and uh, sir, he can do the raking of the leaves, gardening, etc. So below it, uh, there are uh, a patient may be of grade. If the patient is grade three, then he is able to walk on the le uh, le levels. That is one to one or two levels on the ground. If the patient is of uh, med school two, then the patient can walk down the stairs or uh, do some uh, cooking work. And so if the patient is having med school of one, the patient can uh, just sit and do a uh, working on computer or just be sitting and just do his day-to-day -day activity, that's it. So, so four and beyond four is considered to be normal. Okay, so uh, as per you, the patient has med score more than four? Yes, sir. Okay. So, this is a case of long-standing chronic diabetes. Yes, sir. But uh, sugar is under control with? Insulin. Insulin. Yes, sir. 
you have mentioned basal bolus insulin what do you mean by basal bolus insulin Uh, so basal insulin sir it is uh, it is generally given as a long it is a long acting insulin which uh, maintains the uh, le- uh, sir the bolus insulin both the bolus insulin is the insulin which we give before there is uh, according to the physiological status of our body we always have a basal level of insulin and when we give glucose that is food to our body our body uh, releases more insulin uh, in response to the uh, carbohydrate we, or the food we provide so to replicate that regimen it is uh, we give this basal bolus regimen where a long acting insulin is given in the night to maintain a continuous basal level and before each meal when the requirement of insulin is more we add on the regular insulin so that uh, okay for basal for basal insulin yes sir uh, for basal insulin what type of insulin you uh, administer sir, for basal insulin we generally administer long acting insulins for uh, example so for example we can administer lantus uh, which is glargin which i had which my patient was having other than that we can also have intermediate acting insulin like nph and sir uh, lente how nph uh, insulin is prepared what is the adjuvant they uh, add to the soluble insulin to make the uh, nph so it's the normal saline no 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 normal saline they for for making a soluble insulin a uh, intermediate insulin or long acting insulin they add either a fish protein protamine or they add zinc yes, protamine or zinc yes protamine okay. so to delay the absorption and to make it of long duration yes sir so acha nph insulin and uh, lente insulin that you have uh, okay just tell me what are the soluble insulins give me some examples of soluble insulins uh, so soluble insulins are generally the rapidly acting insulins like the lispro aspart glulosin right 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 their duration is around, yes, their duration the, is around duration is around sir the total duration is maximally around 3 to 6 hours 3 to 6 hours okay okay fine acha just tell me why I, are we so much concerned for hyperglycemia what happens uh, if there is in hyperglycemia during uh, surgery uh, sir if there is hyperglycemia during surgery uh, sir it will uh, cause sir uh, sir hy- hyperglycemia is generally uh, during surgery is as a result of the stress induced by the surgery which is because of some anti insulin hormones like growth hormone and the cortisol so which uh, which are also sympathetic stimulant uh, so they causes increased sympathetic activity and thus in- alters the hemodynamics like increases the heart rate and the bp and so also this uh, hyperglycemia will prevent the wound healing of the patient it it will uh, it will cause sir i have the glycemia may also lead to some uh, other problems uh, which are very acute like hyperosmolar hi- hhs hyperosmolar state yes. hyperosmolar states like hyperosmolar hyperglycemic non ketotic diabetic acidosis or sir it may also lead to diabetic ketoacidosis which is again a hyperglycemic state what is the effect of uh, hyperglycemia on electrolytes Uh, sir hyperglycemia causes electrolyte deficiency because sir hyperglycemia the renal threshold for glucose uh, is uh, re- increases so, so, so the, uh, there will be glycosuria along with the glycosuria the electrolytes will also uh, like sodium and potassium are also excreted and sir there will be a electrolyte deficient state in the body which will lead to hyponatremia hypokalemia and even hypermagnesemia hypophosphatemia that will also occur okay yes, just tell me how they are related hyperglycemia and the uh, acute emergencies during intra period what are those acute emergencies which occur during intra period with hyperglycemia so yes yes, yes. 
sir in, in acute emergency that may occur in the intraoperative with hyperglycemia are sir uh, two conditions mainly the diabetic ketoacidosis and sir it may be that hyperosmolar hyperglycemic non ketotic diabetic uh, non ketotic syndrome hhs oh, tell me the triad of diabetic ketosis how do we define how do we come to a conclusion that patient is having diabetic ketosis Uh, the patient will be having the signs of uh, dehydration. Uh, signs of dehydration. That is because of. Uh, that is because of. Uh, uh, Sir, nausea, vomiting. Uh, That is because of osmotic diuresis. Osmotic diuresis. So, in intraoperative okay. patient does not mm -hmm. have nausea, vomiting. Osmotic diuresis. The patient will be having acidosis, uh, with the pH of uh, less than seven point. Why, why acidosis? Why acidosis? Sir, because uh, keto acids, uh, ketone bodies, and acidos, uh, ketone ketone acids are being generated in the body because of insulin deficiency. Yes, particularly it happens in type of diabetes. Sir, it particularly occurs in type one diabetes. So, if we analyze retrospectively, you are giving basal insulin, particularly in type one diabetes. Why? Because The insulin secretion the beta uh, cells. Beta cells is completely shut off uh, in that completely case. Shut off. So yes, you can't you can't uh, stop the infusion of basal insulin. Otherwise, it may lead to ketoacidosis. Yes. Why ketoacidosis? Sorry, Why sir. Ketoacidosis? Why ketoacidosis? What happens? Uh, sir, in case of acute insulin deficiency. Uh, the body can body cannot utilize the glucose, so then there uh, occurs lipolysis, which leads to the generation of uh, fatty free fatty acids, which is converted to the acetyl CoA, and so this acetyl CoA is then converted into acetoacetate hydrox acetone and hydroxybutyric acid. Beta hydroxybutyric. Beta hydroxybutyric. This uh, this leads to the cell ketoacidosis. So you have. volume depletion dc electrolytemia acidosis and patient develops certain other symptoms also because of this what are those uh, sir the patient may have sir altered mental status uh, so the patient may have deep respiratory cosmos breathing and patient will have fruity acidone like smell through the in his body and uh, patient will be having cramp abdominal pain along with nausea vomiting how does it differ from the hyperosmolar hyperglycemic coma hyperosmolar uh, hyperglycemic state sir in hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state it is not absolute deficiency of insulin there is relative deficiency of insulin which occurs in that state so so there is proteolysis but not lipolysis to compensate for the glucose requirement so thus there is no generation of so not completely but ketone bodies are not much generated in that case and so so there is no acidosis in that case we get mainly the patient pH is more than seven point three, and and so. So how much time is left? Sugar level in the blood. Yes, sir. What is the sugar level in the blood in comparison to diabetic ketosis? Yes, sir. It is very high. It is uh, around six hundred milligram per day in ca in case of hyperosmolar hypoglycemic ketoacidosis, and here it is uh, more than three hundred. Okay. Even yeah. more than six hundred. Yes, sir. Even more than six hundred. More than six hundred in HHS, and here it is more than three hundred. Okay, okay. And so, now we will go to the other examiner also. She is waiting to answer. Okay, okay, ma'am. Okay, okay. Okay, and uh, Achha, Nitu, how much time is Nitu. left? How much time is left? I don't know. Okay. No, uh, we go on. Go. On. Carry on, sir. Okay, okay Nitu, just tell me. Glycemic uh, target uh, in the perioperative period. In uh, this one, this is a major case, abdominal case. So we will target uh, around one twenty to one fifty, sir. One twenty to one fifty. As per the ADA guideline, it is uh, in uh, tight control. It is less than one twenty, sir. Tight control. No, what tight is the upper limit? Upper limit. What is the upper limit? One eighty, sir. One eighty. Yeah. So the consensus is between one forty to one eighty during the perioperative period. 
Okay. Yes. And you have optimized the patient for operation. Optimization done. No, optimization was being done. So, uh, yeah. Now uh, we are going to enter into the OT. Okay. Uh, with uh, Sir's kind uh, permission, I will just like to point out one thing. This is a smoker for uh, such a long period of time, isn't it? Sir was talking about this uh, this respiratory assessment, and we will just ask you regarding uh, preparation of this. Uh, patient who has a long standing uh, history of smoking apart from uh, this uh, your instruction Diet for him to stop the smoking so That's apart good. from this how can the patient be uh, told what are the other advices the patient oh, okay. will be given okay. smoking will you say, suppose this is with, hello with smoking there will be a sort of free of spine hello doctor yeah, in Dr. Neetu, I'm asking week. this question to Dr. Neetu. Yeah. No, no, I, I have told us this patient is a long-standing smoker. And apart from cessation of smoking advice, what are the other advices are you going to do? Or what are the other things are you going to do for preparation of the respiration of this patient? Is uh, cessation of smoking the only thing which you will be doing or anything else? Breathing exercise and instantly spiral Okay, any other thing? These are mainly post-operatively, pre-operatively. So you need something, you need to uh, actually give some, initially you need to check out whether there is any obstructive component or not, and give bronchodilator if required. But otherwise this thing, this patient uh, will require this uh, coughing and whatsoever. Uh, they will be asked about this uh, incentive spirometry. You will be asking this patient to uh, take out this uh, whatsoever because this patient will have a lot of cough. So whatsoever this needs to be taken out for this physiotherapy may be required in some patients. And also hydration, more hydration, more the hydration, more these patients will be able to take out the cough. So these are the things which along with that you will be this thing. And we have talked about uh, this thing, respiratory mechanics. Uh, not really, because Sarah was asking, how will you assess the respiratory system? And she had told about the mate and whatsoever. So regarding respiratory assessment, what are you going to see? Pyrometry, what are the actual values which you are actually looking at, which can be dangerous? Um, we can see for uh, um, vital capacity and uh, now, I will say that is FEV1 is a good predictor. So suppose what value of FEV1, if it is less than that, then it will be a red signal. 0 0.7, sir. Okay, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, even less than one liter is very detrimental. Okay, so uh, say suppose a patient has this sort of FEV1 of less than one liter. So uh, now uh, you want to find out the function of the lung parenchyma. How are you going to do it? We can do, sir, a DLCO, sir. Uh, DLCO can be done. Apart from this, this uh, easily you can look at the ABG and PO to ABG. see the values yes. you can see. And if it is again uh, deranged, then we may have to do a cardiopulmonary exercise Cardi test. If yeah, so this patient uh, most probably is uh, uh, quite uh, well off on regarding performances. Exercise tolerance seems to be okay. So uh, okay, uh, madam, we move on now. What to you? Actually, the patient is now optimized and uh, what uh, we are ready for giving anesthesia. Which, which type of anesthesia do you prefer in this case? Uh, Ma'am, we have planned for the general anesthesia along with the epidural catheter. What this is patient. the advantage of epidural anesthesia over the general anesthesia? Advantage and disadvantage of uh, epidural anesthesia. Catheter place. Uh, one thing I want to add before the night before operation DVD prophylaxis. Do you take anything regarding the DVD prophylaxis in this case? Stockings, DVD stockings will be given to the patient. And then how do you induce the patient? What are the monitoring devices you will use in this case? Ma'am, for monitoring, we have attached ma'am for oxygenation as uh, such as SpO2, BP, ECG and um, it is CO2 and temperature monitoring. What is the role of invasive monitoring? 
So invasive monitoring, ma'am, uh, can be done, ma'am. Uh, it will help us to know about the uh, fluid status. And I am specifically asking about the um, uh, CVP line and the intraarterial line, and what is the importance of those lines here? But in this, the CVP line can def can be given in this case, ma'am. It will uh, help us to give. A, monitor the CVP, give ionotrops if required, and also this patient may need post-op TPN as the patient is posted okay. for gastrectomy. And uh, what about the intraarterial line? No, in, uh, intra, since this patient is having a major surgery, the, there may be uh, hemodynamic uh, alterations may be there. So to monitor the beat to beat BP, intraarterial BP can, uh, intraarterial line can be done. Also, we can send ABG immediately okay. as and when required. During induction of anesthesia, in this case, what precautions you will take? Ma'am, during induction of anesthesia, in this case, ma'am, we will make sure uh, uh, for precaution. Yes. Ma'am. Uh, what is, uh, what do you expect? Actually, they are putting the white the board. The patient may be. Uh, nasogastric tube. Nasogastric tube. They are taking the aspiration in different position before yes, opening. Okay. Um, Preoperatively, we will uh, note the CBG of the patient and um, CBG is so one thing and IV cannula will be put in both the hands. Uh, two large IV board can, IV cannula will be done, ma'am, and the patient. What precaution uh, you have taken to prevent the aspiration? Um, to prevent the aspiration, already we have done the nasogastric tube and we will do the suctioning of the nasogastric tube before induction. Uh, of different position and we will keep so the nasogastric tube. nasogastric tube intact and we also do the suctioning uh, initially mm. so that uh, uh, we can prevent the nasogastric aspiration. Mm. And regarding the fluid, what do we do? Um, uh, fluid, ma'am. Uh, During will... induction or before induction, you want to give any bolus dose of fluid to prevent the acute hypotension. I'm just asking you, what are you doing? Ma'am, I have to already started the fluid the night before the patient is not in much of deficit. So I'll be just continuing the maintenance fluid and give uh, the and no replenish the losses. Okay. And what will be your induction inducing agent of choice? My, my inducing agent in this case, I will induce the patient with my, uh, uh, propofol, and we will. I'll be doing RSI in this case uh, patient. Uh, I'll, I'll prefer to do RSI first. We will pre-oxygenate the patient, and uh, and what about the muscle relaxant of choice here? Ma'am, uh, in this case, ma'am, I'll be using rocuronium 0.1 mg per kg. As a muscle relaxant, rocuronium point one, point one two, point one two, yes, sir, point one two m. Sorry, sorry, sir, one mg per kg. One mg. One, one mg. mg. Mm -hmm. I by Mr. Oh. One mg. One or one point two mg. One point two mg per kg. Sir, you continue the maintenance of anesthesia. Uh, what about the pain yeah. management? Ma'am, pain management, we have given ep epidural catheter inserted before uh, induction, ma'am, at the level of uh, T8 vertebra. What are the drug of choice to give to the epidural catheter? Uh, intraoperatively, uh, to manage uh, to, to manage the pain management of intraoperatively, I have given, ma'am, uh, lignoadrenaline, which, which, which was too per two You want to give adrenaline in this case? Uh, ma'am, I should not. Plain lignocan, 2%. Lignocin you are giving? Lignocin. Lignocin. Yes. Why lignocin you are giving? Only are lignocin. you packaging epidural anesthesia in your institute? Lignocin you yes, are giving? Yes, sir. Well, so it what, is are the, what are the medications you use there? What are the... Sir, so we give uh, we give bupivacaine, we use ropivacaine. And yes. We also use lignocin, sir. So. You use lignocin also. Post operative pain relief, do you use the lignocin? So not for the post operative pain relief, ma'am. For the intra operative period, I will be giving but lignocin. And later, I will switch it over to dosifuse it, which will be filled with uh, rocuronium. But it is only those uh, cases which are operated under the epidural analgesia. But this is the. Now, it prevents the hemodynamic uh, alterations yeah. and mm. it is helpful. So we generally put, ma'am, we give. Any other? 
drug you are adjuvant you are using here ma'am sir ma'am uh, adjuvant ma'am along with uh, two in the dose diffuser for the post op pain relief i have added 0.2% propen 240 ml with 10 ml of fentanyl that is 100 mic then yes ma'am okay sunal yes sir if we, if we fail to put a thoracic epidural then what is your plan b yes, sir we are performing post op analysis here so we are performing multimodal analgesia here so we are all we will be giving other uh, analgesics like uh, already we will for paracetamol and sir uh, if we fail to give the epidural we can go for sir uh, erector spiny plane block in yes. this case erector spiny plane block what are the what are the usual usc guided blocks you give for laparotomies so we can also give subcostal tape tab block in this case yes. only sorry so subcostal tab block plus subcostal tab block so you also answer the question tablet. how do you give tab block so uh, we can we give uh, tab block uh, so we can give it in two ways so we can give it a usg guided or blinds or in usg guided technique we generally uh, we place the probe and what type of probe you use so linear probe linear probe you use okay yes how to proceed with the block uh, so for to proceed with the block sir we prepare the pick uh, we, are, we will be giving this block post operatively so so we will ask the surgeon uh, to not to put the dressing tightly before we give the block and so we will be holding the probe with the left hand and place it over over the subcostal region and sir so with the you are telling you are telling subcostal tab block okay tell me and sir so then we will be give uh, localizing the structures like skin subcutaneous tissue so then there will be layer of external oblique and so then internal oblique we give the tab block in between the tra transversus abdominis and internal oblique plane in subcostal during during uh, subcostal administration of the tab block you give between uh, intercostal and uh, yeah. abdominis or you give between the rectus and the transverse abdominis sir rectus and the transverse abdominis and during classic tab block classic tab block we give between the uh, rectus and uh, sorry sir tra transversus and the internal oblique here we will give between the rectus and the internal oblique from the usg picture how can you recognize which is uh, in, uh, i mean internal oblique and which is transverse abdominis so we will be seeing uh, from outside inside uh, outside to in so we can uh, so the first uh, structure which will be seeing uh, which will be radial lucent will be sir the external oblique and then we can see the internal oblique and then below which uh, we can see bubble movement we can recognize that it is the transverse abdomen so it is the intermuscular facial plane between the inter, uh, internal oblique and transverse abdomen yes sir acha where do you put the probe where do you keep the probe uh, sir uh, we keep the uh, for uh, such so for the tab, classical tab block uh, to we keep the probe in the in between the uh, uh, lower border of the costal cart lower costal margin and the iliac crest in between okay. that point we give place the probe Okay, okay, okay. Okay. So, okay. What is the nerve supply of the anterior abdominal wall? Tell me. Nerve supply of the anterior abdominal wall. Yes. So. Okay. If you do not remember, you just move on. You say, just say that I, I yeah, uh, cannot remember, sir. So this, that is the way you actually answer in question with this exam. I uh, would just like to ask Dr. Neetu that uh, regarding. Where is Neetu? Yeah. Neetu. Oh, okay. Yeah. So regarding intraoperative management of uh, insulin, how are you going to manage this patient? How what sort of insulin are you going to give, and how to manage? 
uh, we will give regular insulin sir infusion iv infusion okay and how are you going to give what is the rate of infusion how will you choose the rate blood sugar divided by 150 uh, that uh, that's how we will calculate the uh, insulin dose sir 150 or 100 This is a stressful in, situation, sir. Uh, in this yeah. case, so uh, think, we will blood sugar divided by hundred, sir. Yeah. So it's a variable rate infu- insulin infusion that you are going to give. And regarding fluids, what sort of fluid are you giving? What fluid are you going to give to this patient? Intraoperatively, non-dextrose containing fluid. Uh, uh, Means what? Ringer solution. Ringer solution. Okay. Uh, what is I the role of uh, giving normal? normal saline is does normal saline have a role over here uh normal saline we can give some yeah this patient is having uh, this sort of so, vomiting so yeah, she is already deficient so yeah so she is already deficient on sodium potassium chlorides all these uh, so the obviously potassium is not being taken care of by but sodium and chloride these are definitely taken care of by normal saline but if you give more amount of normal saline what is the thing which you are really af- afraid of what can happen if you are giving too much of uh, normal saline or say suppose too much of uh, ringer lactate uh, ringer solution ringer lactate uh, it may cause uh, lactate that will convert into the glucose and uh, increases the Uh, glucose level that is one in uh, what... in uh, ns if you continue that may cause a hypochlorin metabolic acid very good and uh, ringer uh, solutions if it is given uh, too much it these are hypotonic so th- that yes, is also a problem that... okay so uh, regarding fluid management how much uh, say suppose this operation is going on for suppose uh, say about two and a half to three hours so uh, what uh, Well, what are you going to how are you going to give fluids now means how many fluids are you going to give and based on what seeing what that is the question sir, i am asking uh, depending upon the fasting uh, fasting how much hours he is fasting no she uh, has uh, he has been taking this oral fluids clear fluids for 2 hours before the operation so he actually may not require that much of maintenance fluid and that is the goal of uh, this goal directed fluid management is that you give lesser amount of fluids the minimum amount of fluids isn't it so Zero that is the idea of it. yeah so what what so with that in keeping in mind that he is having clear fluid still 2 hours before operation now what sort of fluid are you going to give I mean, means how much fluid are you giving going to give? so uh... we can follow holiday sagas uh... okay that can be done okay so 1.5 uh, ml per kg per hour is a good thing and you'll also have to look at how much blood loss is being there and you can and you need to in- supplement intraoperatively but there is no sort of uh, this third or the space loss you need not give maintenance you just for the intraoperative period not the preoperative period that is the way you actually do actually you should be a little bit on the lesser side rather than the larger side yes okay madam uh, please move on with your question uh, we have 5 minutes to end okay, okay. this oh then, then we will move to post up okay. part we will post-up move part. to post up what are the consideration in the post up party period what is your consideration what are the things we look for sir already asked about the eras protocol and what is the goal of fluid therapy fluid therapy pain management patient's position how to manage and insulin it? and insulin and insulin sir insulin these are the things which will and guide you how to maintain ma'am uh, uh, for the in the post operative period uh, is the goal of fluid therapy and uh, fluid and electrolyte sorry ma'am just tell me the what is your goal of fluid therapy my, uh, my goal of fluid therapy to maintain the hydration and maintain the hydration to give the maintenance requirement yeah. and uh, to pre- uh, and to also give uh, uh, replenish the ongoing loss and to prevent any cardiovascular major any cardiovascular like patients should not what, what would be the position of the patient in this case uh, 
Next, the patient can uh, should be kept in slightly propped up position. Collar screws. And um, pain management regarding pain management, pain it is management, the multimodal and the water multimodal therapy. analgesia and epidural catheter has already been given, in which we have started dosifuser intraoperatively, which was having ropen and fentanyl. Role of yes, any role of any anticoagulant used in this postoperative period? Uh, ma'am, these patients may have the peripheral vascular disease and all. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and do you consider any anticoagulant? And if you consider the use of anticoagulant, what will be the guidelines of using it? Keeping the epidural catheter in place. You just go through the book and yes. follow the, the protocols which you have. Okay. Uh, regarding the insulin, how are you going to, what insulin are you going to start? Are you again going to start the basal bolus regime or what? No, sir. So, for, uh, so my plan of intraoperative insulin was to give the uh, sir al modified Alberti regimen in which... Uh, uh, sir. No, actually, uh, Dr. Neetu told us the variable rate insulin infusion, RVRI. It, so it has to be RVRI continued. Was... Okay, sir. It has to be continued in the similar way for the next 24 hours at least. Uh, so because the patient will be NPM totally and the TPN also won't be started by this time. So after... Uh, 24 hours, we can stop this uh, insulin infusion no. and we can uh, go to the, sli uh, mm. the uh, sliding scale insulin. Yes. We will yes. not go to mm. basal bolus insulin okay. immediately because uh, the patient will still be in the NPM status. So we can uh, measure the CBG every four hourly okay. uh, thereafter and uh, we, can, uh, we can titrate our insulin dose accordingly. And once the patient has started the oral intake, we can go again, start with the basal molar, molar level of insulin. Uh, okay. Just to inter interrupt, I'm telling you, you should not stop the variable uh, rate uh, IV insulin infusion abruptly. Uh, you have to first start the subcard insulin, then it should continue for two to three hours beyond that, the variable uh, rate insulin. Yes, sir. Subcard insulin, it acts minimum two to three hours to act. Yes, sir. So you are not audible. Hello. Yes, sir. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. Okay. So first of all, you will continue the variable dose, variable rate uh, IV insulin. That will continue. Then there is overlap. First of all, you have to start the subcard insulin. And after two to three hours of subcard insulin, you can stop the variable rate insulin. Yes. Hmm. Yes, I, I also think that uh, this uh, uh, insulin uh, can be, even in the post-operative period, if you are really careful in a lesser dose, uh, long-acting insulin can also be given. But uh, we should be careful regarding using long-acting insulin. It's a little bit controversial. So uh, apart from this, uh, in the post-operative period, we will be looking at this uh, means early ambulation of this patient. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Oral uh, parenteral nutrition. Particularly, we can think of a feeding jejunostomy in this patient if uh, this uh, any other if normally this like, yeah parenteral after seven days. Uh, well, there is indicated. Yeah, and, and avoiding of hypothermia. Uh, and yes, as Madam has pointed out, this uh, thromboprophylaxis, multimodal analgesia, careful fluids. We do not give too much fluids in the post-operative period. So these are the things which we keep in mind. Okay, um, and also post-operative physiotherapy, like you were telling about this instant use pyrometries and this uh, forced expiration technique, a little bit of cough, uh, forced cough. So this will also again uh, give the patients early recovery. Yes, Madam. And um, I think they are running short of time and you will just go through the, what are the um, post-gastric symptoms the patient yes, yes, has. Yes. These are all th Early and dumping syndrome. Dumping yes. syndrome and other things. You must go through the book, okay? And Thank you, madam. It's over, Thank that time is over. Yes, uh, madam, okay. exactly. You are absolutely on the dot. <laughs> I could have Thank you so much. Better. Thank you, Dr. Shujata, Dr. Mishra and uh, for Madam, for this wonderful uh, okay. session. Okay, once again, I thank you, Sujata, Suman, and Dr. Mishra, and thank also you. the participants. Yes, they have sir. nicely done. Okay. Come on. It's come a on. luck to all of you. Come okay. on.
যেটা ঠিক the right thing you say and then the examiner like uh, mohit sir was helping him out how regarding this uh, fiber optic bronchoscope again how to do it so we will be again helping you out what to do but the most important thing is to keep your cool i guess <laughs> at that particular it's a very hard thing to say but uh, actually that's the most important so today's thing. topic is very vast where to start and what to end it okay yes madam and i believe all the students uh and the examinees especially have really benefited from this session and uh, with this we will have a small break that is the lunch break which you will partake your lunches at your own homes and your hospitals uh since this is a virtual platform i really can't do much about it maybe next year when we are having a hybrid session we will be able to do something i promise to do something and uh, with this we will again come back at 2 o'clock i would request everybody to log in at 5 minutes prior to 2 o'clock and at 2 o'clock we will start our next short case that is the toxic thyroid nodule thank you and we retire okay. for now one second i thank you all for the wonderful organization okay. thank you madam we come back again at 2 o'clock thank you
Uh, Anitu. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Tell me. How is it? I could put on the shelter and I find out that. Yeah. We will start again in another couple of minutes. Hello, Suyata. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, Suyata. I can hear you. Yes, Anton, you're ready. And uh, Dr. Shalini. Dr. Shalini, please start video and unmute yourself. Yes, right. Yes, ma'am. And uh, we will have another teacher. Please wait for just one more minute. We will be having another teacher who will be joining immediately. To me, mail link. To me, mail. Who is other other PG? Hello. Hello, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. Am I audible? Uh, yes, I'm fine. On your audible. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Doctor Shantanu Dotto, please wait for one yes. more minute. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, we have with us. Professor Manobendra Shorkar and uh, Dr. Shushmita Bhattacharya will be joining within one minute. She's trying and we will start immediately. Okay, ma'am. <laughs> Our next case is the solitary thyroid nodule or toxic nodule. Yes, ma'am. Hello, Suyata. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. You are visible as well as audible. The one PCD Santon Dotto. Who is other one? 
Shalini, Shalini Mukherjee. Okay. Shalini, please. Uh, yes, ma'am. Audio as well as video, please. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm uh, unmuted it already. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Is uh, waiting for come on? Yes, sir. We are waiting for Dr. Shushmita Bhattacharya. She's trying her best to log in. So that is why we are waiting for a minute and after that we will start. Okay. Our next piece in the post plan session is the software thyroid nodule the toxic nodule. And uh, we have with us Professor Manobendru Shankar. He is professor in Neil Rathan Shankar Medical College and has been an examiner in a number of examinations, both MD as well as DNB. He's an avid teacher with several publications to his And he has been the chairperson and the speaker in several conferences, both national as well as international. And very soon joining us is Dr. Professor Shushmita Bhattacharya. She is a professor in Calcutta National Medical College, and she has been the examiner in several occasions and has been the chairperson and speaker in several conferences, both national as well as international. <laughs>
Dr. Sharkar, with your kind permission, can we just start presenting the case? Can Shantan start presenting the case? Yes, we can start. Can see Lopin. Can Susmita? She is trying. I have sent her the uh, login uh, link again. She is trying her best. So you know, we can start. All right. Um, uh, should I start? <clears throat> Please do start. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Shantan Dotto, second year postgraduate trainee, Department of Anesthesiology, Vartaman Medical, Medical College. Today, I am presenting a short case on solitary thyroid nodule toxic. Chief complaints. 30 years aged female patient named Asha Mondol, resident of Tripura, presented with swelling in front and right side of neck for six months and difficulty in breathing, swallowing, and hoarseness of voice for two months. History of present illness. Swelling was P-sized when first noticed by the patient and attained size of tennis ball in just six months. Bulging of both eyes for less two months. Intolerance to heat, increased sweating and palpitation. Trembling of hand for less one month. No history of chest pain and muscle weakness. In drug history, history of intake of propyl thiouracil, propranolol and amlodipine for less four months. Signs. In general survey, blood pressure was 160 by 68 millimeter of mercury, pulse rate 126 beats per minute, pallor present, neck pain engulfed. Local examination, swelling in right side of neck extending medially about 1 cm to left of midline, laterally up to anterior border of right sternocleidomastoid with slight deviation of the muscle, below up to sternoclavicular joint region with inability to get under the swelling. Size is 6 cm into 4 cm. Swelling moves up and down with deglutition, but not with tongue protrusion. Mobile from side to side. Swelling is globular in shape, rounded margins, firm consistency, local temperature raised and tenderness present. On percussion over manubrium stiny, dull. On auscultation, bruit present. Pemberton sign positive, no cervical lymphadenopathy and no skin fixity. Systemic examination. Number one. Cardiovascular system examination, hypertension, bounding pulse, tachycardia, cardiac systolic murmur present. No signs of cardiac failure. In ocular signs, von Graffer sign, Dalrymphal sign, and Spielberg sign present for the patient. In CNS examination, fine resting tremors and hyper, hyperactive reflexes shown. In GI examination, abdomen soft, non tender, bowel sound present. In respiratory system, bilateral vesicular breath sounds with equal air entry and no added sound. Investigations, thyroid function test. Free T3 level, 6.6 .6 picogram per ml, free T4 level, 3.8 nanogram per dl, and TSH value, 0 0.4 micro international mean per milliliter. Seen CBC, hemoglobin, 8 gram per dl, total leukocyte count, 3,800 per cubic millimeter. In ECG, left ventricular hypertrophy and sinus tachycardia, seen. Echo showing concentric LVH. CT scan of neck showing tracheal patency present. X-ray neck AP and lateral view shown. Retrosternal prolongation present. Calcium level, toxin blood sugar, and urea creatinine are within normal limit. In chest X-ray peer view, trachea deviated to left side. Provisional diagnosis is, this is a case of toxic solitary thyroid nodule involving right lobe of thyroid gland posted for many thyroidectomy. In differential diagnosis, polar goiter, follicular carcinoma, thyroid, thyroid cyst, Graves' disease, and follicular adenoma present. Anesthetic concern. Goals. First, to maintain adequate depth of anesthesia and analgesia. To man manage any sympathetic stimulation, adequate eye Pre-operative evaluation. Airway assessment done and indirect laryngoscopy also done. The operative preparation to achieve new thyroid status, beta blocker therapy, and steroid therapy. Adequacy of preparation, remission of all toxic signs, and heart rate less than 90 beats per minute. Anesthesia technique. Plan of anesthesia was balanced general anesthesia with endotracheal intubation plus controlled mechanical ventilation with multimodal analgesia. Monitoring ASA standard 2 monitors attached. Anesthesia proper. In pre-medication, nil per mouth, informed consent taken, anxiolysis in the night before surgery, 
antithyroid drugs beta blockers continue till day of surgery anti aspiration prophylaxis injection glycopyrrolate 200 microgram intramuscular 30 minutes before induction injection midazolam 1 mg iv given induction done with injection thiopentan sodium 2.5% 200 mg slow iv injection fentanyl 50 microgram iv and injection succinylcholine 75 mg iv intubation done with 7 mm cuff flexometallic endotracheal tube injection lidocaine 75 mg iv 90 second before intubation given tube position checked after adequate positioning maintenance oxygen nitrous oxide and isoprene given injection fentanyl iv in small intermittent bol bolus doses iv fluid therapy and judicious use of muscle relaxant extubation reversal with injection glycopyrrolate 500 microgram with injection neostigmine 2.5 mg iv cuff lift test check vocal cord movement by direct laryngoscopy deep plane extubation and thorough suctioning done post operative care with multimodal analgesia and assessment and manage of any complication thank you so santon yes, what sir? is your case in summary what is your case this is a case of solitary toxic thyroid nodule involving right lobe of uh, thyroid gland patient was posted for hemithyroidectomy so what are maybe the other td that comes in your mind front uh, of the neck front of the neck swelling there might be thyroid cyst there uh, there can be follicular carcinoma of thyroid follicular adenoma rabies disease colored uh, colored goiter and also thyroglossal cyst so how you confirm this is from thyroid this nodule is originated from thy thyroid uh sir uh, from history it has been shown that the patient was middle aged female and she was resident of uh, tripura which was south himalayan region and then oh. patient complained of okay. confirm the swelling is originating from thyroid not from any other tissues around in the surround in the neck not a lymph node not a lymph node nothing else swelling was uh, moving up and down with uh, deglutition so yes. it, uh, as yes. as uh, as thyroid uh, is also attached with uh, uh, pretracheal fascia uh, so yes. the thyroid swelling also moves up and down with uh, uh, deglutition uh, uh, of course it, it, uh, of tongue so then will it move with protrusion of tongue in thy any thyroid no, swelling no uh, only thyroglossal cyst moves with uh, protrusion of tongue uh, no thyroid, thyroid swelling also moves with um, protrusion of protrusion of tongue थायरोक्सिकोसिसोटिकोसिसोटिकोसिसोटिकोसिसोटिकोसिसोटिकोसिसोटिकोसिसोटिकोसिसोटिकोसिसोटिकोसिसोटिकोसिसोटिकोसि
Okay, Santan, do yes, sir. you get my point? Yes, sir. So, this tachycardia may be a combined effect of anemia and hypothyroidism. Can you get my uh, point? Can you get anemia me? and hypothyroidism? Yes, sir. Okay. Now this then other, yes, other, sir, yes, other sir. then other features, other clinical evolution. Go on. Uh, go on. Um, uh, then in uh, systemic examination, uh, cardiovascular system examination, there is a uh, tachycardia bounding pulse with uh, cardiac systolic, continuous cardiac systolic murmur present. And then, sir, in uh, ocular, there are few ocular signs present in this patient, uh, von Graffer's sign, Dalrymple sign, and Stillworks sign present. And also, okay, sir, uh, one from one uh, investigation. Sent on, sent on. Uh, one minute. Yes, uh, sir. Yes, sir. These high signs are present, usually present in toxic adenoma or not? These high signs. Sir, if, uh, yes, sir. Thomas, sir, if there sir, is uh, a toxic. In toxic yeah, adenoma, yeah, usually it is not. Is, is there you yes, usually sir. find this? Can you find this or high signs sir, usually or not? Sir, usually it is not fine, solitary but it adenoma. can also be fine also. Yes. No, no, no. Toxic solitary adenoma yes. is commonly. If it, uh, commonly it is not found in toxic solitary adenoma. It is found in Graves' disease. Mostly found in Graves' disease. And toxic mostly solitary adenoma. Graves. Yes. Toxic sir. adenoma, uh, solitary adenoma. You. Usually get lead retraction, lead retraction. That is del signs. Yes, only. Yes, on, on yeah, there is there, there may be no exopthalm, okay. no other yes. ophthalmopathy. Okay. Yeah, then okay, then go carry on. Okay, sir. Uh, 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 ocular signs are present, and then from investigation, uh, we have found okay, that patient has high F3 value and high F4 value. Yes, sir. I have seen your investigation. What what investigation? What thyroid test do you want to do in this case? Apart from what you have mentioned in your slides, sir, uh, uh, we also can do a radio isotope scanning, but uh, yeah. it it will be beneficial only if the uh, uh, swelling is malignant because we have to see the uptake no, no, of no. the and no, also no, no. the. Sir, no. Sir, but, but, Anton, one, one module. Which type ah. of nodule it is? Uh, hot nodule or warm nodule or cold nodule? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sushmita has the, uh, radio nuclear imaging. No, Sainton, one minute. You you must do a radio iodine isotope scanning in, in case of solid adenoma because it is it will yes, be sir. diagnostic. It will be diagnostic. Uh, there will be localized yes, uptake of huge yes. iodine and there will be surrounding less uptake of iodine. So radio iodine. Uh, um, Radio isotope scanning is must for a solitary thyroid nodule, toxic thyroid nodule. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. So you sir. must have to do a radio isotope scanning. Other okay. investigations you, you, you should do in this case? Uh, other also, uh, I will do a complete blood count, uh, fasting blood sugar level, urea creatine no, level. No. And in thyroid, in thyroid. Achha, in thyroid, sir, uh, USG of uh, the USG thyroid is important. Is important. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, Technetium uh, 99 scanning will be positive, but radio iodine scanning will be negative in case of malignancy. Uh, that, that will be cold, cold nodule, and there will be multiple microcalcifications also infiltration yes, of the nodules in the surrounding tissue. That may indicate your... yes, sir. Yes. Do you want a more... malignancy? Can I find it aspiration in this case? Yes, sir. Uh, we can also want to do yes. final aspiration yes. to detect the type of uh, thyroid, which type of thyroid carcinoma, is it follicular or anything else? Uh, if, you, if you suspect malignancy, then you do a do you know, final FNS. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, what other investigations do you want to do in this case? Uh, sir, uh, uh, thyroid related or in general? Thyroid, thyroid in general. Thyroid, okay. Okay, sir, uh, we, we will do extra, extra neck, AP and lateral view to check the th neck, in neck inlet and thoracic inlet. And then we'll do the chest extra PAV to see the tracheal deviation. Or if there is scabbard trachea present, and then we'll do, uh, sir, uh, it's, uh, then we'll, we'll do, if possible, CT scan of neck should also be done. CT scan or MRI of neck should also be done, sir. Uh, 
Yes, sir. In your case, there is lateral channel. It's extension of the goiter. You must do a CT scan. CT scan is must in this in your case. Yes, sir. Because your CT case scan, is yes, doing lateral channel extension of the goiter. Okay. Yes, sir. Extension scan. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello. Lateral and tube will give some indications, but more sensitive and give you much more in more value regarding your intubation, regarding compression of trachea. How Hello? much uh, tube to insert? That will be okay. from CT scan okay. of neck. Okay. okay. Then carry okay. on. Other other investigations. Then uh, we'll uh, preoperatively we'll do sir indirect laryngoscopy to check the vocal cord position for medicolegal importance. Yes. And uh, 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 yes, sir. And uh, also, sir, we'll uh, if possible we'll do radioisotope scanning. That uh, that and we have also uh, discussed. Yes, sir. Okay. Then then we can do sir uh, spirometry or yes. volume loop. This will also uh, 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 tells us what what type of option. Ah. Uh. For all in loop, you can do it, but Hello? if you do a CT scan, no all in loop will not give much information. Yes, sir. Except when it is not compression, it's mild compression. Then you can flow volume loop, give some information regarding inspiratory flow restriction. Okay. Compression Santon? Tracker. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, can, you, can you hear me, Santon? Yes, sir. Santon, do you want yes, to... Uh, Want to do a, uh -huh. a I, I, any way workout favorably? You do. Do you want to work out uh, etiological uh, uh, anemia in your case? What is the cause of any anemia in your case? Uh, sir, uh, because of uh, agranulocytosis and bone marrow uh, agranulocytosis and thyroidal or antithyroid drugs, there might be bone marrow suppression. So all the lineages uh, will be depressed. So anemia, thrombocytopenia, neutropenia, all. Shyamthan, hello, hello, Shyamthan. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, hello, hello. Do you want? To... Yes, ma'am. Shyamthan. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I want to put some questions. Okay. So yeah. if your patient suffering from anemia, the yes, reason is thyrotoxicosis. Apart from thyrotoxicosis. Yes, uh, apart from thyrotoxic, there may be drug induced. Thyroid and pro Hello? Thy agranulocytosis. Yes, I want propel. to uh, supplement some points regarding your history part. Okay, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I am here. You yeah. cannot, you didn't clarify the type of breathlessness. Okay, whether it is in whether it is in lying down condition. You yes. must mention. In case okay. of retrospinal squatter, you must mention whether patient complains of dyspnea during sitting position or in lying down position. And yeah, you must clarify that the breathlessness is whether exertional or during rest or in the supine position. Okay, Second thing is you have mentioned the pulse rate, yes, but you have not mentioned the volume you have I not mentioned the rhythm. You must include this in your uh, general survey. Third okay. thing is hypertension. You have okay. mentioned the value, but you yes. didn't clarify that there is a wide, uh, wide pulse pressure. pressure. That systolic pressure is high. The diastolic, the diastolic pressure diastolic. is low. Okay. okay. No. So there is wide pulse pressure in this situation. No. And you... Please clarify why there is hoarseness of voice and dysphagia. Ma'am, hoarseness of voice due to compression of the mask over recurrent laryngeal nerve and dysphagia due to compression of mask for uh, esophagus. Okay. okay. Then you mentioned that how will you prepare the patients? Ma'am, I have to. How will you prepare patient? the patients? Yes, ma'am. I have to make the patient youth thyroid before posting for surgery in generally six to eight weeks time. Why? Why? Uh, because why, have, why you thyroid? If, if the patient is underprepared or uh, the gland is acute in stage, then in, in during surgery it may lead to uh, thyroid storm, which will be quite devastating for. Uh, Very good. Quite, what yeah. are the drugs you use to prepare the patients? Yeah, ma'am, I. Shalini, said, Shalini, yes. where is Shalini? Yes, ma'am. Shalini, please answer. Yes, ma'am. What are the drugs we will use to prepare the patient? Ma'am, uh, we can uh, use the please, anti. Please answer. Yes, ma'am. Hello, can you hear me, ma'am? What anti 
thyroid drops yes but, yes i can ma'am uh, we can use uh, methimazole carmimazole or propyl thio uracil as anti thyroid drugs uh, for methimazole ma'am we can start All with uh, yes yes ma'am use na any of the three is not any available of... carbimazole carbimazole okay carbimazole is a pro drug it converts to methimazole that is the active form and mm. how they act please mention please rapid rapid ma'am actually uh, actually ma'am uh, they uh, uh, from uh, uh, t4 to uh, T3 conversion, uh, propyl thiouracil acts to inhibit this conversion. Wait, wait, and what are the drugs prevent conversion? T4 to T3. Uh, Ma'am, also the uh, steroids uh, prevents the iodide or the iodine. Steroids. Steroid. Which steroids? Ma'am, uh, dex steroid? uh, dexamethasone. Uh, yes. Why uh, we are afraid of? Why we want this conversion prevention? What because is the purpose? Yeah, for yeah, prevention of this conversion. Because, ma'am, the most uh, most active form for functioning because of the, the thyroid hormone is the T3. Form. Very good. Yes. yes. Mm. Then, propranolol. You didn't mention the drug. Yeah, yeah, ma'am. We can also. Propranolol also prevents yeah, the yeah, conversion. Conversion. Yes, ma'am. What is? Then, what are the doses? What doses? What do are use? the other drugs? Uh, so sir, sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. I want to. What will be the doses? Do you mean? No. What will be the dose to start with? Then? Yes, sir. She yes, has sir. mentioned forty or sixty milligram. No. Yes, ma'am. Propyl thyroxine. Yes, ma'am. For for propyl thyroxine, sir, uh, we can start with hundred to four fifty milligram divided in uh, into the uh, two to three times daily. And after that, we can uh, after uh, assessing the thyroid hormones, we can maintain with it uh, with one hundred to one fifty mg divided uh, two to three uh, two to three times per day. Okay. So I want you... to add some point, Shalini. Can you yes. hear me? Yes, ma'am. I can hear you. Shalini. Yes, ma'am. Shalini. Yes, ma'am. Yes, they also reducing the TH receptor antibody also. Yes, ma'am. These anti-thyroid drugs. Yes, ma'am. Not only decrease the peroxides, decreases the receptor anti. That is the primary reason for Graves disease. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Then next drug is iodine. Iodine. Yes, ma'am. But the anti-thyroid drugs require six to eight weeks. Yes, ma'am. Okay, to achieve the effect. Yes, ma'am. So ma what are their? What is the newer modality to prepare the patient? Uh, ma'am. Uh, we can give uh, combined therapy uh, with uh, anti-thyroid drugs uh, with uh, along with iodine and also beta. This combined therapy is the newer modality to achieve the thyroid status and also. Yes, very good. Beta blocker process. and iodine. Yes, Which beta iodine. blocker we use? So we will use mm -hmm. non-selective beta blockers mainly. Which beta blocker? Beta blocker. Non-selective beta blocker. Propranolol. Uh, Propranolol uh, dose is forty to eighty milligram per then, day per day. Then, ma'am, uh, we uh, the, we also can use. Uh, okay, that is one twenty milligram. Yes, ma'am. Okay, now you have prepared this patient. What is your anesthetic technique? What is your anesthetic plan? I will use uh, balance, balance general anesthesia. Anesthetic technique. What inducing agent you will use? Balance general anesthesia inducing with endotracheal intubation. I will use my injection thiopentan sodium. Uh, achha, I have, thiopentan I have, sodium. Santon. Why you Santon, use I, I, thiopentan? Santon, yes. I have, I have one question here. Yeah. Yeah, Santon, 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 nucleus prevents the conversion of P4 to Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Achha, I have one question. Son, your technique is you J with endotracheal intubation. Okay. Uh, Sushmita, I, I have a question yes, to sir. ask. Uh, what is your uh, yes, sir, aero, aero management plan sir, in this please, case? Achha. You have, you have, you have. Uh, your plan is GA with endotracheal intubation. What is your ARO management plan in this case? Because your patient is having dys dysphagia yes, dis yes, and lower sense of voice. There is compress compression yes. of the compression of the surrounding area. tissues. And also, so what is your identify the lower border of thyroid? Lower border also thyroid. Huh? So, what is your yes. ARO management plan in this patient? Yes. So, what is your anesthetic plan? How will you secure your anesthetic plan? Do you think is a case uh, of difficult intubation? Try to do for endotracheal. 
yes ma'am this is a case difficult intuition uh, definitely uh, that's why i have to preoperative preoperatively assess the airway with so you first airway. assess the airway yes ma'am with in, uh, airway uh, how will you will assess preoperatively the airway that i will do a follow up uh, if well uh, to uh, see the vocal cord movement and also the if there is any tracheomalacia present or tracheal compression is present no. along with fiber optic yes. scope and if the fiber optic scope is present then i will uh, put the endotracheal tube along with the fiber optic scope and whenever there will be any tracheal narrowing i will advance the keep of endotracheal no. tube just ab- ab- uh, so, sliding the no so santon uh, santon your plan is awake yes, fiber optic or or something else your plan plan is what what is your plan awake fiber optic or something else sir if possible awake fiber optic should be done or if not possible if then possible you still tell me definitely definitely it sir, is your present what you will do in this case पेशेंट No, here the uh, corner of the thyroid will not be palpable. No, in so in right side uh, there is swelling. In left side, I think I think sir, Santon, in left side you can feel left the corner of the uh, corner of the thyroid bone. Okay. Actually, the uh, the actually the mass is uh, towards uh, slightly weighting towards left side one one centimeter from midline. That's one centimeter, why, uh, but but it's not way. extending towards the thyroid bone. It's not extending to the towards no. the thyroid bone. Okay. okay also, sir. also can you feel that the uh, cricothyroid membrane here? Can you feel the no, cricothyroid no, membrane here? No. no so so now block, block is not very possible difficult. possible and it is so contraindicated how... so then then how will proceed hello a topical uh, lignocan spray inside it's a topical lignocan topical spray, spray you cannot cannot the anesthesia anesthesia and laryngeal below larynx you cannot anesthesia below larynx topical spray you will yes. anesthetize pharyngeal uh, hypopharyngeal areas Then how will proceed? Yes, sir. So Tell nebulization. Sir, and then so I will. Nebulization is the best one. Jet. Shalini. Jet nebulization. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Hello, Shalini. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Shalini. What uh, inducing agent you prefer? What Indu- inducing agent you prefer? Inducing agent. What For monitors, here? please. Answer quickly. Ma'am, uh, we can have. Uh, inducing uh, agent you prefer? Ma'am, thiopentone. IV Then IV and acid induce a patient with any inducing agent yeah yes, any ma'am. agent except but, ketamine except ketamine but ma'am uh, yes, ma'am. Ad- yes. advantage ah uh, yeah ma'am propofol has antiemetic effect ma'am, so uh, we can ma'am, use ma'am, propofol to uh, medicate also but ma'am i have a query okay. that uh, in case yes. uh, here the, the pvr or the svr is decreases already in case of thyrotoxicosis so, or thyroid patient so, Yeah. In any patient, when we give propofol, we must aware about the hypotension. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Like thyroid. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. If ma'am. we prehydrate the patient, okay, give ma'am. the propofol in a titrated way, okay, we ma'am. can achieve smooth induction and post-operative nausea and vomiting. We can okay, cut ma'am. down this complication. Okay, ma'am. This Got is it. very crucial in thyroid surgery. What muscle relaxant you will prefer? Ma'am, uh, at, as it is, what uh, muscle we, relaxant? We we as we think it is a case of uh, difficult airway. We should uh, use the succinyl choline. Uh, we should prefer it. We have another. Sorry, I want to add one point. Yes, ma'am. Before giving yes, ma'am. dowsing agent, you should ventilate the patient. Assess the bag mass ventilation. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Before bag mass before ventilation give, before giving in giving any. Yes. yes, ma'am. Jatadi, what are you trying to say? I am trying Shujatadi, to say that hello? we will wrap up. We will have to wrap up in another five minutes. Five minutes, okay, okay. We are we are trying. We are trying. Okay, thank you. Shalini, okay, okay. Yes, if ma'am. If your patient is in emergency, put 
uh, in emergency put for emergency appendectomy how emergency will you manage appendectomy yes ma'am your patient is ma'am i can't hear ma'am time to the patient ma'am please repeat the question ma'am i can't hear hello ma'am is not audible i think acha salina i am i am putting that question to you salina can can can, can i be audible yes hello. yes sir Sal yes sir yes sir suppose suppose your patient is put up for an emergency emergency appendectomy okay ha uh, you, you have very little time to optimize the patient for the yeah. hyper hyperthyroidism how you okay. proceed with this with that patient in toxic nodule how will in, you in proceed in toxic patient having to toxic features and Please how you answer quickly optimize oh how can i very quick quick response salina Um, uh, sir, pl 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 uh, first uh, is the fluid resuscitation is needed, and after that uh, we have to uh, think that there is a uh, there is a decrease SVR and the already the cardiac output and the uh, is raised and the card uh, tachycardia no, is there. We are afraid of thyroid storm. Yes, ma'am. We are okay. afraid of thyroid okay. storm. What drug Shall you will be you have to prepare? What, what drug Ma you will give? What drug will you use? Just quick, 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 very quick. What drugs? Uh, Ma'am, uh, propranolol, uh, propranolol, propranolol, and iodide, and steroid, and propyl thio uracil. We can yes. use for for this. Very good. Uh, oh, what 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 iodide? For this. What yes. iodide? Sodium. Sodium. You you can give Why? radio 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 Why? contrast radio, radio contrast. contrast. You can use radio and contrast. And what is the sequence of giving the drugs? What is the sequence? We will yes. try the anti-thyroid drug first. For so iodine first. Initially, initially anti-thyroid anti first, then iodine. So always try anti-thyroid drugs. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Okay. What are then the pharmacy suppose, complications? Suppose you receive a call from the ward. What are the causes of respiratory disease following thyroid surgery? Please enumerate yes. the causes. Ma'am, wound hematoma will be the primary cause if they are present. Yes, I am. I am told. Ma'am, ma'am, uh, acute bleeding, wound hematoma will be the primary cause. They Rapid answer. Wound hematoma, laryngeal edema. Second, second. Laryngeal edema. 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 And then all the then, then thyroid storm and uh, one drug gland gland parathyroid parathyroid hypothyroid gland is removed. Phrenic phrenic nerve injury superior very good very good nerve injury and returning phrenic nerve very rare rarely injured phrenic nerve very rarely injured most commonly is thyroid leg and leg injury all these are causes of yes thank you thank you very much. अच्छा बसाइन तो Tell me, yes, why, if if there is bilateral abductor palsy, patient is having bilateral abductor palsy, then what will yes, be the presenting symptom? Bilateral because of bilateral abductor palsy, this is complete of uh, partial obstruction. Then due to unopposed adduction, there will be yes. severe respiratory distress. So emergency tracheostomy should be done, and complete uh, bilateral abductor palsy. Yeah, partial. Partial one. Partial palsy will be dangerous. So partial will be dangerous. If there is complete complete palsy of the both radial and lingual nerves, then uh, if it is partial, then there will be severe respiratory distress. Cadaveric so, position. Complete bilateral lingual nerve palsy. Now, if cadaveric position, then then what will do? If there is bilateral complete paralysis sir, of the radial lingual nerve, then what will you do? Emergency emergency tracheostomy, sir. Emergency tracheostomy. Sir, bilateral complete cadaveric to... position. Patient can. Uh, Take his respiration. Yes, yes. Patient cannot yes, obey for it, but can respire it. Uh, yes, yes, and, yes. Uh, uh, you you should research. intubate. You should yeah. intubate the patient and try yeah. for for later ex extubation. You can try, or you have yeah. to do a tracheostomy later on. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Any other? Okay. If patient have some hypo. Yes. If there is sudden yes, postoperative sudden postoperative hypoxia, after operation, the in the in the ward. Suddenly, there is a call book. The patient is having having restless and hypoxia. What may be the cause, sir? Uh, because of a uh, serious wound hematoma, respiratory distress will occur, and also mm -hmm. sir, laryngeal edema or any tracheomalacia. These all will cause uh, uh, hypoxia. Tracheomalacia is not. This is hematoma. Hematoma and laryngeal edema. Maybe hematoma and laryngeal. Laryngeal. 
So what yes, will be the treatment? Treatment will be you have to remove the sutures. Remove the sutures. Yes, sir. Alternate yeah. sutures should be removed. And secure yes, the airway. And, and, and secure the airway. And rapidly secure the airway. Rapidly secure the airway. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What What are the extubation related problem? Extubation related problem. The cuffing test should be done and deep vein extubation along with oral suctioning should be done. Room can be silent now. And uh, and also, sir, after. Uh, hello, sir. Am I audible? Yes, yes, what do you mean? Sir, uh, deep plane extubation along with thorough suctioning to prevent laryngeal spasm and also cuffing yeah. should be done before extubation to rule out any chances of tracheomalacia or laryngeal edema. So how will do the cuffing test? Sir, uh, endotracheal tube will be inserted and the cuff will be deflated. It is already already inserted, already inserted. Yes, sir, cuff, how will cuff, do the cuff will be, cuff will be deflated? Then we'll give IPTV and uh, the put the bell of the uh, stethoscope over trachea. If the position is bandaged, then we'll ch check the uh, difference between set tide, tide, inspired tidal volume and the uh, patient uh, inspired the... tidal volume. There will be difference. So uh, in the walk station, in the walk station, you will see that there will be difference. Uh, there will be Take, difference between the tidal volume parent. and uh, expect. Uh, you are yes. giving tidal volume and expect tidal volume. There will be difference. Yes. I okay. Think we have to yes. close now. Yeah. Okay, Sujata. Thank you, Sujata. We can. And okay. we will have to thank you so much, Professor Manomendra Sharkar and Professor Shushmita Vatacharya. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sujata, and thank you all participants. And we'll move on now to our next long case. That is MS with pregnancy, and we all are waiting for it. And uh, we have our teachers here, Professor Nivedita Pati, Professor Devashi Shaha, and Professor Choitali. Professor Choitali Shri Tashkupto is the HOD and Professor of Cardiovascular Cardiothoracic Department and is his name hospital. And Professor Devashi Shaha is the and Professor of Waterman Medical College, Department of Anesthesia. I don't think any of them need any introduction, and we would really like to go straight away to the case. It is an extensive case, most commonly given in the examinations, all examinations, MD and DND. And uh, our students here are Dr. Bimal Kumar Mondol and Zina Tafrin. Uh, maybe with your permission, Madam and Sir, uh, sir can we start screen sharing and presenting the case? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Dr. Bimal, please start presenting the case. There was a case. Yes. Dr. Bimal, please start presenting your case. You are audible and visible. Good afternoon. Please be a little loud. Dr. Bimal, please be a little loud. Good afternoon, expert teachers. And I am presenting Image my mitosis with pregnancy. Mrs. Rubina, 23 years old, female, primary, with 36 with gestational lens, housewife, residing at Barsha. His case has come for self confinement. History of present illness. Patient came with history of nine months amenorrhea, complaint of breathlessness, three months duration, palpitation, one month duration, easy fatigability since two weeks duration. Deadliness was gradually onset over three months, progressive in nature, aggravated on exertion and relieved on rest. Patient was initially comfortable at rest, a history of mild limitation of activity, which now progressed to moderate limitation, progressed to breathing difficulty to less than ordinary activity, that is, you know, age class two or three. Palpitation is two months duration, residuals in onset, gravity on exertion, and decrease on rest. Feeling generalized weakness for past two weeks, tiredness increased on activity, and feels, feels better on rest. There is no history of fever, hemoptysis, orthopnea, toxin, and osmonal dyspnea, chest pain, or syncopal attack. No history change in voice or difficulty in swallowing. No history of no history of required respiratory infection, no history of or squirting or sinusoid. 
past history present, give a history of fever, it's short thought, and joint pain involving both the knees. At two years of age, she was hospitalized for the same diagnosis and to have rheumatic fever. I am advised penicillin prophylaxis once a week for 21 days. Once in 21 days. She took the injection for five years and the discontinued on her own. Not a known case of diabetes mellitus, hypertension, uh, tuberculosis, epilepsy, or any uh, transgenic attack. Present medical history, patient is booked and immunized. She developed difficulty in breathing and palpitation in the second trimester for his cardiovascular cardi opinion or shot, and he was investigated and diagnosed to have heart problems started on medication. Obstetric history, first trimester, she is continuous conception, primarily a pregnancy was confirmed by pregnancy UPT at 40 days of anemia, booked and immunized. Taken for the cassette tablet regularly, no history of radiation exposure, no history of dating TV. On second trimester, he was able to pass the fetal movement at 22 weeks of gestation. Anomaly scan was normal, no history of headache, swelling of legs, blurring of vision, no history of bleeding or draining TV. She developed breathing difficulty and palpitation during second trimester, and the cardiac stomach was short and diagnosed to have heart problem, prescribed medication and injection. She is a regular follow up with both the doctors. Passive fetal movement oil, no history of lower abdominal pain, no history of bleeding or dreading PP. Her drug history taken folic acid and iron tablets along with tap metoprolol 25 mg twice a day, tap PNT or penicillin G 400 mg twice daily. Have diet of 10 mg twice daily, a bisoxin 0.5 mg once daily. She is a potassium chloride to this spoon once daily, and injection low molecular weight about 40 mg subcutaneous once daily. She has not undergone any surgeries in the past. Personal history patient takes mixed diet, normal bile, and larder habits, reduced sleep, and appetite since two months duration, no history of substance abuse. On family history, no significant family history was found. Administrative history at in a minority at 14 years of age, regular cycle, T by 30, no history of dysmenorrhea or menorrhagia. Her LMP was 20 <coughs> October 2019, and expected EDD was August. Marital history, marriage since two years, no consensual marriage, no history of contraceptive uses. So my, so my summary is 23 or 23 years old, primary with probably rheumatic valvular heart disease in atrial fibrillation and in control compensatory heart admitted with nine months and one year for safe confinement. On general examination, after obtaining consent, patient was examined uh, widely. Stop here, ma'am. It is the ma'am. Hello. Hello. Uh, can, I the ma can I stop yes. remote yes. here? Okay, ma'am. Yes, yes, we can stop. We can go for the. From the history, From the history can you ask questions? Question. Okay, sir. Yes, yes. See, uh, he has already mentioned EDD is already in August, August 2020. He has already delivered. So we don't, we don't have to do anything with them. Am I right? You must change. Okay, sir. So, is it a is it a cardiac origin or is it a respiratory origin breathlessness? Sir, it is a cardiac origin, sir. Why did you say this is a cardiac origin of breathlessness? Sir, there is no history of cough or of the seasonal variation or any respiratory infection, so it most likely is a cardiac origin. And. Uh, uh, Okay, anything cardiac? What will be what will be the features of breathlessness like in cardiac? So the is now patient is comfortable on rest and and on mild activities you can do this thing. And can you tell me the NOIHA classification? So you know, this classification is four classified. Class one is. No, no physical, no limitation of physical activity, patient no content. In any stu, the mild limitation of physical activity, 
and it is uh, in order to be yata swetha da bimal voice is not coming clear can you just uh, uh i only make man. it little loud it is not audible okay ma'am uh, any two classification there is mouth any two there is my limitation of physical activities any three there is more at Uh, mark limitation of physical activity that is for nst iphone there is severe limitation of physical activity patient is uh, complain of breathlessness or they only rest okay okay yes sir go ahead with your final examination after obtaining consent patient was examined in only cylindrum patient is conscious oriented febrile and cooperative She is moderately built and nourished. No paralysis, sinusitis, clubbing, or limb not limb paralysis. Eating, fetal edema is present. There is no mark marker suggestive of pneumatic fever or endocarditis. Thyroid test, hair and skin normal. Spinous cord is palpable. No spinous deformity. Fetal pressure. Allah ma ko ita de. Kanne daor chetu. Visible or cannulation. Oil fifty five. Height one point one fifty seven. BMI of 24, pass rate is 82 per minute, regular, regular, varied volume, non-specific character, pass rate is 10 per minute. There is no radio signal or radio 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 signal delay. All peripheral bypass are failed. That patient. Our video talking on. Major left upper limb sitting posture. Respiratory rate is 20 per minute. For a problem of type, JDG max less than four. Are you doing this? Normal pressure. Yes. Normal leg movement. Also, many of the fingers bit. Malang pa dito too. No loose teeth or danger. On obstetric examination, inspection, abdomen longitudinal enlarged, amelica cingulate line, cast with surface, linear nigra pigeon, no scar or sinus is visible. Fetal movement visible during examination. Palpation fundal grip correspond to third day gestation. Fundal grip got on bulky rounded non-palpable mass felt surface of this lateral grip head resistance slightly carved mass felt on the left upper probably the back irregular thumb nodules felt on the right side probably the limbs pelvic grip hard globular independent mass felt surface of head. Oscillation fetal heart fetal heart rate one sixty per minute heart पोजिशन Expedition no external hip no chest or tenderness. Oscillation mitral area loud rest on heart followed by rest to opening of heart a low pitch rising murmur mid dashing murmur of breath intensity heart on mitral area in left lateral position with bell of chest to heart and end of expedition. This one rest to heart in all over areas with no arrest sound or murmur. This way system normal vestibular breath on heart with no arrest sound. Seen is higher mental function examining examination normal. Investigation routine investigation hemoglobin ten gram per cent, WC one ten thousand per millimeter, failure one per six liter, urea thirty six milligram per cent, blood sugar thirty two milligram per cent, thyroid pH two point two, microgram microgram as in milk, creatine one, sodium one thirty six, potassium three point six, PT one thirty seven, iron one point two. That concentrated with the normal limit, blood group and are expected positive, B positive. Special initial blood ECG by feet, pre-op, uh, elite two, three, and ABF, terminal RF and beyond BT, right axis deviation. Echo findings were done, not mentioned here. So this is a kind of diagnosis. 23 years old, primary with heart twist gestation or life intervening gestation, paper is presentation with. Compensatory pneumatic mitral heart stenosis with atrial fibrillation. Is it your diagnosis complete? 
हाँ सर डायलिसिस कंप्लीट बिमोल हाँ ओके सर हाँ यस सर यू मस्ट मेंशन अबाउट द पेशेंट इज नॉट इन इन फेलियो ओके हाँ सर यू हैव नॉट यू नॉट इन हेल जस्ट केफलिक सेवेंटीशन विथ इमेटिक ऑरिजिन So how do you know this is the mitral? Is a how do you differentiate between this MS and AS? So echo findings was there. There is a mitral bulb area reduced to less than two point five centimeters square, and pulmonary artery pressure. Come on, come on. Your ISD is not good. The I think you should you should others others. Your headphone headphone. Okay. Please you use your headphone. Okay, ma'am. There are lots of noise oh, and noise. Doctor, 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 I think there is a problem in your laptop. Are you are you logging with two devices? I think you have logged in with two devices. Please close one. Close one. If anybody is with two devices, please close one device. Right. Is echoing because of that? Okay, ma'am. No, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Please speak uh, once and we'll check. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, okay ma'am. Ma'am, please continue. I do. Sujata. Okay, ma'am. Oh, there is lot of echo. Echo. Am I audible, Sujata? Ma'am, Doctor Mandal, please go ahead. Go ahead. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. You are audible. Yes, everyone to everyone to share. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Dr. Pani, you are audible now. Yeah. Yeah. Can we start asking questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Can you please go to your first go slide. First slide. Doctor, Iman, can you tell me what is the severity of the grades of the mitral stenosis? How do you measure? Mitral stenosis is graded by mitral valve area, pulmonary artery pressure, and even diastolic pressure gradient. Mild mitral valve, normal mitral valve area, four to six centimeters square. Normal pulmonary uh, pressure gradient less than thirty. Uh, and um, pressure gradient, uh, pressure gradient less than five millimeter mercury. A pulmonary artery pressure less than thirty millimeter mercury. Moderate uh, mitral valve area. One point less than one point to one point five centimeters square area. Pressure gradient five to ten millimeter mercury. Pulmonary artery pressure gradient pulmonary artery pressure thirty to fifty millimeter mercury. And severe less than one millimeter one centimeter square mitral valve area. Pressure gradient more than ten millimeter mercury. Pulmonary artery pressure more than thirty more than fifty. Please, madam, please, madam, repeat this. Why there is a reason? Except the demon, your voice is very, 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 very,
Madam, can Zinar, Zinar, can Zinar 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 a question? I will solve this problem. problem. Okay, okay. All right. Okay. Zinar, please continue answering the questions. Okay. Okay, okay ma'am. Hello. Yeah. Huh? Uh, Ma'am, I am unable to understand the question. Sounds are being equal. Mm -hmm. Why we are always worried about the vital services to come for this visit? Why the highest visibility we anticipate in case of the mitral services? Why you have to be agitated? Why you are always stressed? Madam, cannot hear you. Honey, madam, we cannot hear you. Ma'am, I can't hear you. Pani, madam, we cannot hear you. Yes, am I audible now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, now, ma now, now you're audible. Okay. What is happening? You tell me this vital stenosis when there is least of the pattern of death, highest, and why? Uh, sorry, ma'am. Maternal death, uh, when the incidence of maternal death is high in MS. Hello. Hello. Yes, very yes, well. Ma'am, it is uh, during, uh, during uh, um, uh, the second uh, from the second stage of labor and uh, maximum after the delivery because uh, in that period there will be increased uh, cardiac output like uh, about 80%, 80% to 100% increase in cardiac output just after the delivery. So uh, since mitral stenosis is a, a fixed stroke volume uh, uh, disease, uh, so there will be uh, increase in the uh, amount of uh, blood that is blood volume and uh, that will be detrimental to the patient so it hello hello yes yes ha huh, so uh, uh, yeah incidence of death is uh, uh, greater uh, during uh, after the just after the delivery of the baby you can say immediate postpartum the chances is very high is there okay yes ma'am yes ma'am ma uh, sorry ma'am what are the pathophysiology of the mitral stenosis? Okay, pathophysiology of uh, mitral stenosis. Uh, ma'am, uh, uh, due to uh, most common cause is a uh, rheumatic uh, uh, rheumatic fever. So uh, group group A streptococcus uh, uh, will uh, uh, group uh, the uh, the uh, protein uh, uh, the protein in uh, group A streptococcus will mimic the uh, mimic the uh, protein present in the uh, valve of the heart, uh, which will cause calcification and thickening of the uh, leaflets uh, of the mitral valve, and uh, the which will cause uh, uh, stenosis of the um, uh, mitral valve. That will not stay. That will be changes of mitral valve stenosis. Can you tell me? So, hemodynamic changes. Yes, yes ma'am. Hemodynamic changes. Huh. Uh, yes, hemodynamic changes. Huh. Do, uh, since the, uh, uh, the mitral valve area uh, will become smaller, so there will be uh, difficulty in uh, uh, flow, blood flow from left atrium to the left ventricle. Uh, gradually, the uh, blood will accumulate in the left atrium, uh, which will uh, cause increase in the uh, pressure in the left atrium. Then uh, uh, gradually, there will be a left, uh, left atrium uh, hypertrophy. And uh, when they, this, that pressure in the left atrium will increase the, this will this will causes uh, this will cause uh, thrombus uh, formation in the uh, left atrium and uh, there will be atria there will be decrease hypertrophy correction please jafrin one jinat one one correction please atria does not hypertrophy it is always dilated the atrial dilated. structure Sorry, is dilated always uh -huh. dilatation dilated, of the dilated. atrium and hypertrophy yes ma'am yes ma'am yes ma'am Okay, ma'am. Then, uh, due to decrease in the preload, uh, there will be a decreased cardiac output, and uh, for uh, to compensate this, the body will uh, actually uh, there will be increased SVR, that is uh, systemic uh, vascular resistance, uh, to maintain the uh, blood pressure. And uh, what about the pulmonary? Uh, to, uh, what will be the then if yes, ma'am. What will be the pulmonary venous ah, pressure? Yes, what will be the pulmonary atrial pressure? Why there is atrial fibrillation? 
So what then, will happen to left ventricle? I mean, you have to tell all these things. Yes, so what will happen to left ventricle? You have to tell all these things. Now, since there There is an increase in the uh, pressure in the left eye pressure uh, will be uh, uh, transferred to the uh, pulmonary circulation which which will cause the increase in uh, pulmonary uh, that will cause pulmonary hypertension and uh, uh, if, yeah, if the pressure in the so first will be pulmonary atrial hypertension or pulmonary venous hypertension uh, first uh, there will be um, pulmonary uh, artery hypertension pulmonary veins come to the no, no, no. Pulmonary veins. Pulmonary capillary veins pressure will be high. Yeah, so first, 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 listen first. The pulmonary venous hypertension will be first. Then there will okay, be pulmonary edema. Then that will lead to. Then there will be pulmonary arterial hypertension. That is a late Okay. Carry on, please. Yes, ma'am. Ah, then uh, um, yeah, due to increase in the uh, pressure uh, in the left atrium, uh, the atria. Uh, the atria will be uh, uh, not contract. Uh, that will uh, it will enable to contract. Uh, so uh, it will it, it will um, it will create a uh, it will flutter and uh, causes atrial fibrillation. Uh, it will cause atrial fibrillation. Okay. Dinab, this question has come to you. Okay. So hmm. you have done all the investigation you have done. Can you tell me what investigation you have left and which is very important also? What? When mitral hmm. stenosis patient comes hmm. for cesarean section, what are the hmm. investigation you should do? Uh, Ma'am, uh, we should do uh, ECG. Uh, the first, we should, uh, CBC, complete blood count. Uh, then uh, we will do uh, PTINR, uh, we will do L LFT, and uh, then uh, ECG, and uh, uh, eco um, hello, huh. yes, uh, yes, echocardiograph. Yes. Huh. To the echo, you should do it. Why do yes, you do the echo? Uh, to, uh, ma'am, uh, it will, it will uh, uh, actually to, uh, to see the severity of the disease, uh, that see, means it, it will tell. Huh. In this case, specifically, you will do a 2D echo to evaluate what? Very clear and pinpoint question. Mm. To see the uh, mitral valve aperture and uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension. Is pulmonary artery pressure. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Ma you have to see all these things, now. So not only yes, mitral, will... presence of uh, thrombus, the mitral valve mm -hmm. apparatus, everything should be seen, mm -hmm. and should, that will lead seen. to Wilkins score. We will see Wilkins score. What is the Wilkins score? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. If ma there is any clot in the left atrium, the size of the left, left atrium, mm -hmm. and the other valves. If there is other... any tricuspidal mm -hmm. condition, and if there is any problem in any other valve, all these things you have to see by the echocardiography. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Now answer madam's question, please. What madam told you? Is there any role of cardiac catheterization in this patient? Uh, yeah, uh, we can do, ma'am, uh, pulmonary uh, uh, catheter catheterization to uh, see uh, see the uh, uh, pressure, pulmonary capillary wedge madam pressure asked to determine. Madam, you will go for cardiac catheterization. She didn't ask cardiac. you about the pulmonary catheterization. Okay. She okay. asked you when you will go for cardiac catheterization in this patient. Mm. No, I don't know. Do the Cardi cardiac catheterization when your echocardiography is non-diagnostic or okay, is always discoordinated with your clinical findings. That that okay. that time only do it, which we generally do not do it. Okay. Because when to be very practically, theoretically, we are discussing whenever this mitral stenosis patient comes for cesarean section, clinically you have to evaluate if it is a emergency patient. Okay. Your patient, mm -hmm. another question I'll ask you. You, this is the history. You have taken the investigation part you did. In your treatment part, medical aspect treatment part, what are the drugs you have given to this patient and why? Each drug you specify and why? Starting, you have given metro, met, metoprolol, metoprolol, you have given diet, 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 you have given heparin, 
and also uh, you have given also uh, potchlor can you just specify why all these drugs have been given and what for hmm. uh, ma'am we have uh, given metoprolol uh, since uh, um, uh, in during uh, pregnancy there will be change in the heart rate and uh, which will cause uh, uh, change in the heart rate that means increase in the heart rate uh, that is tachycardia which will be detrimental uh, for these patients so uh, beta blocker is given uh, to maintain the heart rate uh, then uh, uh, loop diuretics is given uh, to prevent the volume overload uh, which occur during pregnancy uh, because there will be uh, increase in plasma volume by uh, 55% uh, than the uh, non pregnant state so to decrease the uh, volume overload we have given loop diuretics and uh, low molecular weight heparin is given because uh, in my, in my case uh, the patient is uh, presented with atrial fibrillation to uh, so for thromboprophylaxis we have given low molecular weight heparin and uh, you have given heart, also heart disoxin disoxin yes ma'am disoxin is given uh, uh, to uh, uh, for prevention of matlab uh, for rate control uh, for atrial fibrillation for treatment of atrial fibrillation disoxin is given and well, for tachycardia chloride is given why potchlor is yes, given yes ma'am potchlor is given uh, uh, since uh, disoxin uh, Uh, since uh, yeah loop diuretic will cause hypokalemia so there will be dis electrolyte electrolytemia to prevent this uh, pot chlor is given what are the ecg findings of the hypokalemia uh ecg findings of hypokalemia there uh, yeah there will be a uh, 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 small uh, there will be a uh, small t waves and prominent u waves and uh, mm, small t waves and prominent u waves uh, qt interval will be uh, uh, qt q qt interval will be shortened uh, mm. e this part you have to be very thorough huh? Hmm, okay. Okay. So, what is the gestational age? Yes, ma'am. What is the gestational age of your patient? What is yeah? What is the uh, in which trimester she is? She is in third trimester, I think. Third trimester. Third trimester. So. Yes, ma'am. Thirty-eight weeks. Which week? Thirty-eight weeks. Is it prudent to give LMWH at this thirty-eight uh, weeks? Do you think so? It is prudent to give. Should we continue thirty-eight weeks with LMWH? Then what will be your uh, delivery plan? The patient may go on fetal distress at any moment, na? So you can go for emergency LUCs or. Uh, so what will what? Why you are giving this LMWH at thirty-eight weeks of pregnancy? What should you give? After thirty-six uh, weeks, what we should. We we should give warfarin. Warfarin after thirty six. Warfarin after thirty six weeks, and what we should give actually, what we can that is very uh, uh, easily convertible. That is un ma'am unfractionated heparin. Yeah yeah yeah. That is unfractionated heparin. That can be, yeah. Yes ma'am. Doctor Devashis is also there. I think Sir is not asking. I'm asking because the bit in the ladies am. No, no, please, 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 sir. I think you should also. Bimal, so, uh, can you tell? There's a uh, why tachycardia is detrimental to this patient. So tachycardia is decrease the diastolic feeling time. So there is a uh, chance of. Hello. Hello. Hello, sir. I can hear. Hello, sir. I am audible, sir. Audible. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Tachycardia is also decreases the diastolic time, and uh, which is detrimental to which, uh, in case of reduced mitral valve area. Mitral valve area mainly feeling is diastole, and there is a chance of heart failure, sir. Okay, what's the difference between then right heart failure and left heart failure? Which one comes first in mitral stenosis? Sir, mitral stenosis first comes right heart failure, sir. 
Yeah, what's the how will you differentiate between these two? Uh, right heart failure, um, patient complaint, patient signs and symptoms is facial puffiness, raised JVP and epigastric um, tenderness and pedal edema. Left heart failure, patient complaints and signs and symptoms is um, uh, exertional dyspnea and uh, easy fatigability, syncopal attack. Good. So, what will be your anesthetic goal? Of this patient is already 38 weeks. What's your plan? Is posted for caesarean section. Am I right? Okay, sir. No, am I right? This patient is posted for caesarean section. Okay, sir. Uh, so, yes. what will be your anesthetic plan? Rather, in that in that um, case, patient is decompensated heart failure, and we can My do. Question, I let me ask the question. Uh, Bima, one minute, please. I'll ask the, my next question. That is, if you plan for normal delivery, how will you plan? Please answer, sir. Oh, okay, okay ma'am. Okay. If patient, we uh, decrease the patient anxiety and pain. Uh, we also allow the epidural, epidural money, post labor analgesia by epidural catheter, and I shorten the second stage of labor by either forcep or ventus application. Oh, uh, epidural catheter, you said. Then what is your ASRA guidelines to put the epidural catheter? Do you know? Uh, uh, okay, okay, sir. Sir, if patient is unfractional heparin, we discontinue the heparin six hours before the putting epidural catheter. And before doing the procedure, we must explain the procedure in the patient and proper antiseptic uh, after attaching the standard monitoring, proper antiseptic uh, dressing. Identify epidural pace and patient put on uh, OT table in left lateral position to avoid autocable compression. Given in L LC L4 space by tie needle after confirming the epidural space by loss of resistance, introduce the epidural catheter with, with um, um, giving test dose of 2% uh, lignocan. Wait for uh, 3 minutes if there is any severe hypotension or any adverse effect occurs, then we start for uh, epidural, uh, epidural analgesia with 0.25% buffy vegan, 5 ml. Uh, you will give 0.25 or 0.125? Oh, oh, add uh, with 0.125 uh, with uh, fentanyl. Uh, 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 Am I right? Oh, analgesia should be given, sir. Oh, you for your analgesic part, am I right? Yeah, okay, sir. Uh, analgesic part. Bima, suddenly, Bima, suddenly okay. you are giving the epidural catheter and uh. the labor analgesia you are trying, and suddenly there is drop in the systemic muscular resistance. So, what immediate steps you will do it, and what drug you will give it? Uh, yeah, sir, Madam Bishop, sir, phenylephrine should be given to rise BP and poor given oxygen, 100% oxygen by face mask and okay. monitor the patient. Okay. Will you give any volume expander or not? Volume expander should be given by judiciously. There is a chance of pulmonary edema. The patient is decompensated. Okay. Will you have, will you try for any invasive monitoring? If there is severe uh, hemorrhagic constable, we do arterial line and also do uh, arterial line mainly, madam, to or bit to bit uh, differentiate the hemodynamic motility and also ABG monitoring. In this scenario, when the pulmonary artery catheter is helpful, in which condition you should prefer to give the pulmonary artery catheter? Patient not responding to. Uh, Patient not responding to vessel pressure or even 100% oxygen. Do no, 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 no. I am telling about the monitoring aspect. When oh, you will prefer to give the pulmonary artery catheter? For what? You say it is a high risk patient. I will give. I do agree. But what okay. for the pulmonary artery catheter is given? You said radial artery line I will give. That is common. You can know the intraarterial blood pressure monitoring. So, for the pulmonary artery catheter in this short of patient, when it is used, why we use? Uh, 
अरे टू नो कार्डियक आउटपुट टू नो यस यस मेरे पापा ओके फॉर गाइडिंग योर फ्लूइड एंड ड्रॉप थेरेपी इज द प्रेशर इज द पेशेंट इज अ आईजी पेशेंट ओके यू हैव टोल्ड अबाउट द मेडिकल मैनेजमेंट इन योर डिस्कशन पार्ट सपोज दिस पेशेंट is in the mid tri is in a pregnant patient and you want to do a operation to this patient whether any mitral commission or tummy or whatever it may be what will be your ideal choice of trimester when you intervene for a surgical in a second trimester ma'am why in why third trimester? second trimester chance of fetal viability fetal perception fetal My loss is less, and there is the chance of uh, hemodynamic instability is also uh, decrease because third trimester there is chance of any chance of fluid overload, and uh, there is the uh, uh, patient is may also fail here. Why not in first trimester? Why we don't do anything in the first trimester? There is the first trimester there is chance of fetal uh, loss is high and also. organogenesis is going on at that time first trimester so we should not venture anything during the first trimester okay and when you will go for cesarean section of this patient usually uh, when uh, in the indication is cesarean section is indicated for this patients uh, after 28 of the pregnancy in the indication of cesarean section of patients After twenty-two, your patient, your patient, he will go for cesarean section. The delivery can be in uh, both ways, na? Normal delivery and by the LUC. So when he will go for LUC in this patient? If there is, is it indicated? Is there is fetal? Indicated fetal stenosis. Madam, I actually LUC is not indicated for the mitral valve stenosis for the disease. It is indicated when there is obstetric indication for LUCs. Okay. If the obstetrician thinks that LUCs is indicated, then he can do that. Otherwise, it is not indicated uh, regarding to the mitral valve stenosis. But if the patient is not responding to your medical management and if the patient is deteriorating, then you can consider LUCs. Okay. Okay. And what will be your anesthetic plan during the LUCs? In this patient, anesthetic plan is graded epidural anesthesia should be tried. Graded epidural analgesia, anesthesia. Okay. And what about the uh, GA? Will you go for GA for these patients? And GA. if you go for GA, then what will be your choice of drugs and all these things? After attaching the standard monitor and IV line secure, patient pre-oxygenation, uh, pre-oxygenation with three minutes, and angiolysis by Patient angiolysis should be given mirazolam 0.2 microgram per milligram per kg body weight, and induction was done by intermediate 0.2 to 0.2 milligram per kg body weight, and given also fentanyl 0.2 milligram per kg body weight. After induction, we intubate the patient uh, with succinyl choline 1.5 micro milligram per kg body weight with prop. With proper endotracheal tube intubation and then secure the position, maintains the anesthesia either oxygen nitrous oxide. Uh, usually, nitrous oxide should be avoided in this patient, and there is chance of pulmonary vascular resistance. So we use isoflurane and oxygenation. And muscle relaxation should be choice vecurinium, which is cardioselective, 0.02 milligram per kg body weight should be given. Bima, I Ajay, and uh, I'll I'll just interrupt here. Ajay, anesthesiologist, what should be your goal to to give this sort of patient anesthesia? Main main goal, ma'am, to maintain the normal heart rate and to avoid number tachycardia. Okay, number one, number two. Number uh, number two, which aggressive uh, treatment of. AFP present. If AFP present, there is aggressive treatment for the. Okay, we will manage the AF. Okay, next. Next, we avoid atrial compression, madam. This is deteriorous. Yeah, maintenance. Yes. 
Error to command compression should be uh, uh, decreased. Uh, you mean avoidance and okay. presence prevention of pain and abnormal uh, avoid hypoxemia and hypercarbia and acidosis, which increases abnormal pulmonary, uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. What about the venous return? A uh, maintained venous return should be maintained. Venous return should be maintained, ma'am. What about the systemic vascular resistance? Also, madam, should uh, also maintain those adequate systemic vascular resistance. Yes, ma'am. Why? Why? Why you will maintain the adequate systemic vascular resistance? Because MS is a relatively um, fixed cardiac output uh, disease. Okay. In the in there is uh, in there is systemic resistance. There is low, there is some chance of hypotension, which is de deleterious to the mother and also the Fetus, there is loss of uteroplasm circulation. Hamper uh, uteroplasm circulation shows there is chance of fetal hypoxemia and fetal um, bradycardia. Madam has asked you one question How will you give a GA? Suppose I will, you have told also, I will give you a signal at C also. Say, will you feel always a signal is definitely different than the GA? Madam, the question was not clearly audible. <laughs> Yes, madam. Yes. Why? Why the? Can you please repeat the question? Am I audible now? Okay. Am I audible? No, madam. Now be clear. Why? Why this epidural technique? You will always feel better than the J. Uh, in J, there is chance of uh, there is chance of uh, difficult intubation. The pregnancy is also a cause a uh, difficult intubation. There is chance uh, increased vascularization and the mucous membrane. There is a chance of uh, laryngeal edema in the upper laryngeal edema. I so showed there is chance of bleeding and difficult intubation, and also intubation causes a uh, lot of hazards in the systemic circulation, like um, increased heart rate, increased sympathetic surge, which is causes tachycardia and fluid overload, and also pulmonary hypertension. Okay, you have told all the negative aspect of the GA. Tell me the positive aspect of the epidural. GA. In GA, we uh, maintain no, no. the... No, no, tell me the positive aspect of the epidural. Why, okay, it, why it is the attractive option? Because epidural, we, we, I, I, we, we given epidural by incremental doses, so there is less chance of hypotension. And after monitoring the, this, it is elective case, we can, time, though epidural is a time consume, it is elective case, we can incremental doses the... Uh, uh, yeah, anesthetic drug and live up to live reaches with less chance of hypotension and also hemodynamic unstable and also putting epidural catheter post of analgesia should be maintained by this uh, epidural catheter which is helpless to the to this patient do you know anything called the muscle pump okay, by giving this segmental block it spares the lower extremity muscle pump. So what will happen? There will be? Then, oh, yes, ma'am. This also decreases the thromboembolic manifestation. Actually. No, 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 no. Oh, so DVD. the venous return will be adequate. Once the venous return... Is, uh, adequate and also DVD also less chance in the job. When there is it's like less muscle tone, or muscle power is maintained in lower extremity. Okay. And any other advantage? We can monitor the patient by verbally, or there is any adverse or any complication that may. Mainly, madam, fetal and fetal bonding should be. Uh, what about the intraplacental flow? Intraplacental flow also, madam, maintained by epidural catheter, madam. By chance, you are giving an epidural catheter, then suddenly you had a puncture to the. Uh, dural puncture. So what? How will you manage? 
stop the procedure stop the procedure I'll stop. oh sorry, huh? sorry. no stop no madam procedure. what you will do jinat you are giving epidural yes, catheter by mistake it become a spinal what you will do oh my madam can i try i yes, try मैं गिवन स्मॉल डोज ऑफ स्पाइनल एनेस्थेसिया डू द सीजर इंस्ट्रक्शन एंड बट देयर इज चांसेस ऑफ हाइपोटेंशन आल्सो इज देयर पेशेंट इज अ माइटल स्टेनोसिस पेशेंट व्हाट यू विल डू देन इन आवर सिनेरियो वी आर डूइंग दैट आई डू 100% एग्री वी नेवर स्टॉप द दिस थिंग और यू डू लाइक दैट एज एन एनेस्थेसियोलॉजिस्ट व्हाट यू विल डू If hypotension is there, you go for a phenylephrine. If okay. chances of pulmonary edema is may going to develop, you make your SDU ready. If the patient will go for a pulmonary edema or any complications by giving fluid or adequate, you be prepared for that. But okay. uh, it happens, no? By giving the epidural, sometimes you may puncture also. Okay. Yes. Okay. Can you just tell me? It's very important thing is that why? Uh, what is the uh, you know like uh, why there is that. that there is first trimester second trimester all so the, this hemodynamic changes during labor in relation to cardiac output what it happens during the labor and what happens the perprium and why it is important to this patient specifically yes. cardiac output yes ma'am cardiac output increases in early trimester only 15 to 20% but in labor and in also in post immediate postpartum period there is 50% increase in cardiac output so why this, how does that matter to us this sort of patient this in this cardiac output automatic auto transfusion causing her pulmonary overload systemic overload and also pulmonary overload this cause chance is heart failure most chance in this patient so you should be prepared during yes. mainly during yes. labor you have to be very careful yes. and also yes. during the perpurium you have to be careful that's why this sort of mitral stenosis patient cesarean don't give them to the ward if you have got the facility just kindly put it in the sdu for the perpurium okay. there are any problem will be there so you okay. tell me the baby you have, you have for 24 to 72 hours to keep them in the icu or hdu you have given the cesarean section baby is out uterus is not contracting what to, you will give madam Will give uh, oxidation infusion. Why not argumentary? You will not give argumentary, I think. But why? Why argumentary is contraindicated? I think argumentary increases the muscle tone, uterine muscle tone, in forcefully blood transfuse the in systemic circulation. There is chance of um, pulmonary edema. No, ma'am. It will actually precipitate the uh, pulmonary uh, hypertension. and it will precipitate the pulmonary hypertension present in the patient so it it is contraindicated in should not be given in ms patient so how you are giving how you will give this oxytocin 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 okay give bolus or you will give infusion infusion sir infusion give an infusion Tell me what are the indications for absolute GA? Absolute indications for GA. Can you tell any one of you, Zinat or Nimal? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, if the uh, if uh, there is fetal distress present with critical image that is less than one uh, mitral valve area less than one or point eight centimeter square, and patient with uh, feature of atrial fibrillation or thromboembolic manifestation, patient with uh, prostate uh, prostatic valve. we also go for cesarean say ga for for that case okay good and uh, what about the infective infective endocarditis oh, okay okay sir okay okay sir infective pontrophase also point indication of gr at the infective pontrophase patient with history of prostatic valve and congenital heart disease and patient with transplanted heart with prostatic Patient with transplanted heart with prosthetic valve is also indicated for endocardial infective endocardial prophylaxis 
and also congenital heart with residual paralysis repair for residual also residual paralysis also present residual paralysis present present residual residual lesion madam residual lesion my sir residual lesion and also there is any process is given to the patient also you have to go for this yeah when the heart is collapsed what is the treatment of mitral stenosis pregnancy pregnant patient coming to you at first trimester what will be the uh, or around 12 weeks what will be the uh, treatment apart from medical management what can you do um, when it is, hello jazina go ahead she is coming after 12 weeks hello you have told about medical management patient has come to you at around 12 weeks or 14 weeks what you will do for this patient apart from medical management what else you can do for this patient okay. we can go for uh, percutaneous uh, uh, we can go for uh, uh, yeah. percutaneous balloon uh, mitral valvuloplasty we uh, feel What are other types of management? That's one. Number one. Number two. No. Percutaneous. We can go for uh, uh, percutaneous. Uh, percutaneous. Mitral valvulotomy. Also being done now. Mm-hmm. Percutaneous uh, mitral valvulotomy. Valvulotomy one. One is mitral valvulotomy. One is mitral valve replacement. Both can be done percutaneously. Number two. Okay. Those mitral valvulotomy you have seen in your OT? No. I think Bimal has seen. Bimal. Okay. Huh? I think you have come to see me, Anna. You have seen CMB. Okay. Huh? Yes, ma'am. Close mitral valvulotomy. You have seen that can be done up in the second trimester. Oh. And what else? Mitral valve replacement also can be done in the second trimester. If we think that Wilkin score is more than eight, then we can go for mitral valve replacement. And if the patient does not comply with medical management of course then we can go for mitral valve replacement otherwise cmb or per- what is the difference between cmb and ptmc what is what are the main difference between the two ptmc does not require or bmb does not require the ga and cmb requires ga so they are the problems of ga are there number one number two ptmc or bmb is a costly procedure cmb is a very uh, this thing uh, it is a low cost procedure in ptmc patient can be discharged after one day and after cmb patient has to stay in the hospital for another seven days okay and cmb please read cmb also you may ask about cmb bimal the um, the टमी Open commissioner term is more risk, ma'am. Yes. Open commissioner term is more risk. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Where, where the valve re- replacement is reserved in which cases? Which cases we should go for the valve replacement? Oh, we do. We we can score, ma'am. If this is more than eight, then it is. Um, Go for valve replacement. And no, cal- no, no, no. Cal- no, 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 madam, madam, Please. calcified valve. Yes, number one, valve. calcified valve, and severe cases, and also if there is mural thrombosis is there. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thrombus, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. But the maternal mortality percentage is how much? Between one to five percent. Okay. Fetal loss is also up to fifteen to thirty-five uh, percent, something like that. Okay, uh, okay. 
suppose a patient of your mitral stenosis patient if she has undergone prosthetic valve she has come for the cesarean section what care during the trimester you will take care and during the operation what care you will do already she has gone prostatectomy she has taken so during the first trimester what care you will do and during cesarean what care you will do you must be coming lot of patients are there before their marriage their the valve replacement is there so what tell me what are the guides guidelines and what are the principles you tell ma'am first infective endocardial profile should be maintained ha uh ha -huh. infective endocardial endocardial profile okay, okay. next next what are the guideline number 1 there are four to five guidelines are there and why because you first of all you have to tell what what is the type of pulse if it is mechanical pulse if it is mechanical pulse on so now you tell about anticoagulation patient is on i press the the patient is of course not on a a okay then the um, uh, this uh, anticoagulant is not required and now you tell ma'am about the anticoagulation procedure what is the anticoagulation to be given to the patient okay i am giving you the lead hmm. any idea ginat Ma'am, I'm uh, actually the co question. What, ma'am? Ask. I, I can't hear her question. What are the anticoagulant regimen of a pregnant woman with a mechanical prosthetic valve coming who has come for the she will undergo whatever cesarean section or whatever she is in the pregnant patient. What are the protocols you okay. should do? Okay. uh we will uh, in first first trimester uh, we will go for uh, we will go for uh, low molecular weight uh, or nay unfractionated heparin uh, th then in second trimester we will uh, go for uh, warfarin uh, along with this we can also go for aspirin low dose aspirin like uh, 75 to 100 mg then in uh, third trimester we will uh, again switch to uh, unfractionated heparin uh, 1 mg uh, पर के जी डोज बी डी when you can stop this unfractionated heparin before cesarean section planned cesarean section elective cesarean section when you have to stop this unfractionated heparin we will uh, we will stop 4 uh, to 6 hours before the surgery uh, if we, we are planning to give uh, uraxial anesthesia Doctor Devashish, will... please ask questions. Go ahead. Devashish sir, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Please ask questions now. Please ask questions. Yes, you are asking. Yeah, if uh, issues is on uh, on. तो कोई वाले तो अन्य नहीं थे. क्योंकि वो योजी क्या नो चिलो ना. तापर सर्वे दिए लेटर लेकर नो लो जो ऑब्जेक्टर चिलो हमारे जिसके लिए वो लोग योजी कॉलेज नहीं कोलेज है हमारे. एडिशनल Doctor Shoda or some someone else I don't know. Doctor Devashish, please. If suppose you are giving the heparin, can you tell me? Uh, suppose uh, your patient is on the table and yes. develop failure, will you cancel the case or will go ahead? uh no no so we will uh, go ahead uh, 
we will uh, we will uh, ask the surgeon to do perimortem cesarean within 4 minutes of uh, cardiac arrest and uh, uh, we will go for cpr along with this we will go for the uh, cpr of the we will do cpr and within within 4 minutes uh, of cardiac arrest we will ask the patient to do perimortem cesarean section Will you do cardioversion to this patient? Uh, cardioversion to uh, this patient. Mm. What is the protocol for CPR in this patient? Uh, first, uh, we will uh, fifteen. If uh, if the fetus is not delivered, then uh, we will we will uh, do uh, give fifteen degree uh, left lateral tilt. Uh, to prevent the autocaval compression and uh, we will start chest compression uh, uh, we will start chest compression uh, uh, just uh, uh, mid sternal uh, on the um, mid sternal and uh, we will give uh, six breaths uh, per minute in this uh, patient and along with this we will follow the uh, yes sir so CPR protocol, can you tell CPR protocol for this patient? Uh, sir, first, uh, yeah, Bimal. First call for help, sir. Call for help. Yeah, and exactly. Give, call for help. And if you uh, call for help. This patient. And patient give 100% oxygen and uh, ready for, ready for um, defibrillator and also um, start, start uh, CPR by uh, giving chest compression for 100 to 120 beats per minute uh, with either giving uh, tilt, uh, labilateral tilt or another person uh, asked to tell manual uter displacement uh, and also inform the neonatal team and also perimortem uh, perimortem cardiac. Uh, yeah, what are the drugs are you going to give in this time? Uh, drugs given, sir. I think Zinat and Bimal, you should go through this. This protocol is different from the normal protocol. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, given, sir, first given is phenylephrine also tired, sir. Okay. Then? then, if this is uh, image patient given, I'm uh, going bolus dose up. Um, Forty my milligram. I wish that bolus dose. Uh, along with well, uh, final final questions. Uh, do you know anything about the uh, pressure volume pressure uh, volume curve of mitral stenosis? Pressure volume curve, my, my sir. I think left. What are the points? Is there? There is four points. Yeah, what, volume, what, what does it indicate? Pressure volume curves is deep, uh, sorry, sorry, small and shifted to the left in mitral stenosis. Yeah. Can you draw and tell us all these points and No, sir. What is A, what is B, what is C, and what is D, or whatever? If you know pathophysiology proper, then no, okay. you will get it. What are the normal pressures of the all the chambers? Normal pressure, uh, right, right atrium, uh, 2 to my 5 millimeter mercury. Left atrium, um, same, my 5 to 10. Pulmonary artery, 30 to 50. Systolic, diastolic, uh, uh, 4 to 12. Uh, right ventricle. Right ventricle uh, 10 to 15 and left, left ventricle 100 to 120, yeah, 3 to 12 to diastolic. Okay. Anything else, Chaitalidi, you want to ask? I think they should know about it, this one. What deteriorate the outcome of uh, uh, MS with pregnancy? What are the causes? Commonest cause um, rheumatic fever. 
what are the what are the causes of worse outcome in ms with pregnancy which patients will be deteriorate first what are the patients what are the causes that will depend upon the grading of ms if it is severe ms then if the nyha grade is 1 2 3 4 if the grade is more 3 or 4 then also if the mutation fraction is lower less than 40% then ph if the ph is more than 50% of the systemic pressure if this is or if there is uh, symptomatic or very severe ms i told it before so these are the causes these are the things when the patient will be deteriorated first okay demand so you know the jones criteria ma'am you are going to ask some question please please ask ma'am yes. gina can you uh, gina sir bimal anybody can you just tell me what are the high risk cardiac condition in which the antibiotic prophylaxis is indicated Mm, sorry, ma'am. Can you repeat the question? This antibiotic prophylaxis in which high cardiac condition indicated, especially in relation to all these pregnant patients, where you should give the antibiotic prophylaxis? Why the antibiotic prophylaxis is given? To pre for prevention of inve infective endocarditis. Okay, very good. Uh, patient having a prost uh, prosthetic valve in very good patient. very good electric uh, antibiotics and, and anything else mm -hmm. anything else left left atrial thrombus ma'am okay is okay she told okay anything else any congenital heart diseases ha uh, yes ma'am in congenital okay. heart diseases no, why you feel this what is the causative organism of the infective endocarditis which causative organism is the causes the infective endocarditis group a streptococcus ma'am hmm group a streptococcus okay anything mainly streptococcus mainly streptococcus mainly streptococcus streptococcus which organisms any idea group a beta hemolytic uh you can streptococcus viridans then enterococci and also group b streptococci are the common pathogenic mainly they are during the abortions okay but mainly this endocarditis is the mainly obstetric is the mainly streptococcus is a common organism okay what uh, what antibiotic generally you give all the cesarean infection are you giving the mitral stenosis patient coming are you giving the antibiotic what is the protocol in your hospital actually now where is bimal and where uh -huh. is zina cannot see them what are the protocol now there are only six criteria to give the antibiotics for these patients just for if the patient is suffering from mitral stenosis or even jumping from and for antibiotics it is not there we used to give the antibiotics if there is any prosthetic valve if there is history of infective endocarditis if there is congenital heart disease with unrepaired cyanotic heart disease or completely repaired congenital heart disease for 6 months with prosthetic material and repaired congenital heart disease with residual defects and then cardiac transplantation patients these are the these are the few criteria where the antibiotics to be continued to prevent the infective endocarditis otherwise we should not Absolutely. jump that patient has cardiac disease and we are going for antibiotics to prevent infective endocarditis okay are you clear bimal and jina there is no need there is a empirical in our uh, college whoever is come give of the salvactam and uh, keftriazone salvactam that you can give the poor. we are giving just you must have observed when any cesarean come give the antibiotics and all okay or, am i clear okay yes ma'am okay. last question the patient uh, what will be your ideal drug of choice drug for the post of 
same analgesia to this patient? We will go for multimodal analgesia. We can uh, see, give you see, very uh, clear. You see, uh, see, see, not very clear. I'm telling you. Forget about the ep epidural. Suppose you have given epidural. Okay, you can give the pen. There is no problem. The baby has out. Cesarean section has been done. Is a GA. What will be your choice? Very clear cut to the pinpoint. What will be your ideal analgesia? Analysia you should give. Forget about multimodal. How many multimodal you are giving? Give me a practical. What you are giving? Morphine, madam. Madam, morphine. Morphine. All patient morphine. you are giving morphine? No, madam. Into morphine is ideal drug of choice in MS. All MS with baby out, morphine you will give. See the, the pediatrician they are giving, they are telling, give the baby breast milk. So will, will you be your choice to give morphine or any other drug which is safe? Fentanyl, madam. Okay, number one, fentanyl. Number two? IV paracetamol. Very good. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can give. You have said morphine. Why you said morphine? What is the role of morphine in mitral stenosis? Is there any role in mitral stenosis or in pulmonary morphine as role? You tell me. Pulmonary morphine. So what role, what causes in pulmonary? What is the role? There is pulmonary vascular resistance and also risk. And genital pain mainly. In case of pulmonary edema, we give morphine. But nowadays, okay. fentanyl is also, we are thinking that fentanyl is also working very well instead of morphine. Okay. Uh, so now we have jumped to fentanyl and morphine is not that much readily available in our setup. So we are giving fentanyl for the patients with pulmonary edema. Uh, I think we are uh, having an excellent discussion, but uh, we also uh, have to Palas, I just five, want five minutes. Uh, five, Palas, uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, sure. I think you yeah. are you are close to this. Uh, almost yes. everything has been discussed. Uh, 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 Jinat and Bimal, tell me one simple block you will give for post of analgesia in the. I'm giving a hint in the abdomen. Tab block, madam. How you give the tab block? Classical tab block by non-invasive monitoring. Is guided or it's given two centimeter above the iliac crest given uh, by two pop methods. First, by two pop methods, we are given by two pop methods. What are the drug of choice? And which level you will block, and where the level you should block? Drugs, drugs we used uh, Ravi Bhakan, ma'am. Okay, very good. No very problem. Good. Uh, level uh, usually we, we are used two centimeter above the iliac crest in mid axillary line. By, which, by... which, which one? Classical tab block, ma'am. No, I know classical tab block, but which area you should block? And how much above? And how much the needle should go? Uh, there are two, two methods. Points. You can either give by the ultrasonologically method or you can have a blind method also. You can give. Uh, we given by blind method by two pop, two pop, either given in the rectus abdominis and internal iliac. How much the tab block remains? Bimal, read the tab block because this is a because as for the regional analysis technique, they ask the questions for the tab block sometimes. Okay, so this part you just uh, cover it. That is important also. And uh, second thing is that uh, another important last question I will ask you: uh, This patient, scissor and patient, they have come. Okay, so. Uh, uh, how many days they should be kept in the ICU if the patient you are anticipating a high risk mitral stenosis patient? Pardon, madam. ICU how post operatively how many hours you should keep them? Ideally, high risk mm -hmm. mitral stenosis patient. Seventy two hours, ma'am. Why? Okay. Seventy-two hours, but episode within nine days. So keep, but keep uh, a close watch upon them up to ninth day. 
okay afternoon because whole purpuriyam is very Got important it. yes ma'am bimal whole purpuriyam yes. is very important okay and my last question is that how much should be the block so that it will be not painful to the mother if it is a regional block what should be your block level height of block t4 why t4 why there must be a logic for everything now why t4 uh, if uh, they will the peritoneum and also yeah, there must be na why why uh, why you want a high block you see because you are given regional block the patient will complain of pain you are putting a tetra do you know just to separate all the visceras huh okay so if you not give the block then the gut will come out and it will come obstruct and it will obstruct and it will, it will cause pain uh, which will cause tachycardia and so your mitral stenosis you are blocking up to t4 given regional anesthesia as a anesthesiologist do you know what will the problem you are going to face so how you will be careful madam level t4 t4 you will go no ma'am t t only t10 is sufficient ma'am T10 is sufficient, but but After we go up to T6 or T4 yeah. or T8. You tell me. Jarina, tell T4. You are telling T10. T10, ma'am. Usually, after delivery, there is chance. I am only analgesia the part of lower part. There is chance of to abdominal. Visceral. After okay. delivery, you forget. You are you are blocking the because before putting the ether and incision, you have to give the adequate block. Otherwise, there will be pain. Okay. 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 Anyway, this is my last question. You again be clear yourself. T four, T six, T eight, T ten is very important. Why I insisted today? Thank you, ma'am. thanks meeting you thanks meeting you thank you dr devashish and thank you bimal and thank you zinath all thank the you, best to you okay zinath thank and you, bimal where are you all the best all the best for your exam okay uh, bimal okay, and zinath read properly uh, uh, okay. chaitali uh, one minute bimal and zinath what are the question yes, you have not answer please go through and read the book today you will get the answers okay madam madam level check to madam मैडम लेवल 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 कौन लेवल टी फोर तो हाई हो जाए मैडम प्लीज रीड मिलर इट इज देयर इट इज क्लियरली रिटन देयर व्हाई यू आर आस्किंग प्लीज रीड मिलर इट इज क्लियरली रिटन इन मिलर ओके नंबर 1 नंबर 2 देयर इज एन आईजीए पब्लिकेशन प्लीज फाइंड इट एंड सी द मैनेजमेंट ऑफ प्रेग्नेंट पेशेंट्स ओके प्रेग्नेंट पेशेंट्स विद एमएस प्लीज रीड दोस थिंग्स ओके ओके थैंक यू थैंक यू ऑल thank you ma'am thank you thank you dr devashish thank you thank you first thank you polish thank you so first a uh, hey, uh, my thanks appreciation to bimal and zina who have prepared uh, well and uh, you have done pretty well i would say you have done pretty well uh, you have answered many more questions which i will simply wouldn't been able to answer and the examiners they have also prepared quite well and uh, they have taken you through this course very well i mean you have faced most of the questions that you were likely to face probably you will not face so many questions professor pani thank you very much for taking down, uh, time out of your busy practice and all i mean saturdays are probably a little bit of time which people keep to yourselves for the family and all so you have taken time out of that and thank you chaitaladi and thank you devashishda all of you are very busy and especially the load in the hospitals is now uh, is not picking up it's very high but still you have been with us helping the students thank you thank you and, thank you bola uh, thank you dr shujata okay thanks thanks a lot okay uh, so uh, now we would uh, move to our next uh, uh, session which is a uh, uh, we have a few uh, didactic lectures they are not really didactic they are very precise uh, short uh, lectures into things which is very important for you to know and uh, one or two things that we expect you might face questions about 
So the first one is about capnography to be taken by Dr. Professor Shura Roy, who is the head of the Department of Anesthesia and Perioperative Medicine at KPC Medical College. He is a very good choice because he himself has been a topper in the university exam. So uh, he knows very well. He not only knows the subject very well, he also knows very well what the questions that you are likely to face and the questions that you would like to get asked and how exactly you need to answer them to impress the examiners most and you know pass with flying colors. So I will start that video. And before that, I have uh, two announcements to make. One, if you have any questions about this topic and we will try to accommodate one or two questions at the end of it. So do post it in the WhatsApp group. Uh, we are not able to see this uh, the, uh, uh, ch uh, chat messages that you are going to post. So please post it in the bootcamp uh, WhatsApp group. Uh, any questions? And I need uh, uh, today. We're going to end with a session on OSCE. So I need uh, a few more volunteers for OSCE. I'm going to promise you it's going to be an awesome session. And as you have realized that uh, nobody knows everything, you know a little bit of it. And examination about maximizing your performance. So uh, people who have, uh, especially who are uh, appearing for the DNBs, you will face an OSCE session. So please volunteer, put put your names uh, either personally to me in the WhatsApp group. So uh, now we are. Uh, uh, move to this uh, video on capnography and after that we will try to take a few questions. Okay, uh, is it visible? The sound in this presentation is a little bit low. It's not visible yet. Visible? Awesome. Visible on my screen, it says. No, it's not. I'm sharing my screen. What, what, what can you see? Not yet, Dr. Palash. Yeah, so what is what is capnography? <clears throat> capnography is actually uh, a composite. Uh... Not visible? Yes, it is visible. Okay. The sound in this clip is a little low. Uh, measurement of the cellular metabolism, the transport and ventilation. So it, it, it's a composite measurement of all these three components. We are very much aware of MTV, but here the MTV is different. MTV here represents metabolism, transport, and ventilation. 
<clears throat> so uh, a quick look at the normal arterial and ETCO2 values, the normal PSCO2 values, as you all know, by, by this time is, is 35 to 45 millimeter of mercury, which translates to about 4.7 to 6 kilopascals. The normal ETCO2 values are, of course, source that is focused on the chopper disc, which results uh, in a rotation of the chopper disc of, uh, in a revolution of around 60 revolutions per second. As a, as a result, uh, the, the beam of light passes alternately through the sample cell and the reference cell. Uh, and at the end, the ratio of the carbon dioxide wavelengths uh, to the ratio of the uh, non-affected wavelengths is reported and computed as the ETCO2 value. Coming to the technical aspects of capnography, uh, you need to know about the difference between uh, capnography and capnometry. Capnography is the measurement, as well as the display of the ETCO2 curve. It's very important. Capnometry is simply the measurement and uh, sans the display. There's no, no way of form involved. So this difference is often asked in your exams and you must know uh, that. So there's another uh, difference that is between quantitative and qualitative ETCO2. What is quantitative ETCO2? It's, it, it's a specific and actual sound sound that is so. given, uh, which is found, which is found uh, in the I mean, capno sound, but, you know, graphs and capno meters that we normally use. Uh, the qualitative ETCO2 on the other hand provides an approximate range. The video uh, sound the sound sound detectors. Okay. So the sound detector is not actually in monitor. Okay. It's a, it's a chemically treated paper that changes color when exposed to carbon dioxide, at least six breaths of carbon dioxide needed before you can get an approximate value. Capnography may be done by two, two methods, the mainstream and the side stream methods. In the mainstream, you, you, you know the circuit is uh, contains the sensor, the measurements uh, are made at the patient's airway, the response time naturally is very fast. There are no water taps, no, no tubings that are needed. So it's quite hassle-free. And even non-intubated patients uh, may use the capno mask. On the other hand, the, the, in the side stream technology, it's much more common. The sensor is located away from the airway and the gas is moved to the sensor with the help of a very small pump that's placed inside the monitor. Uh, there are water taps, there are filters, and there are dehumidification devices. So all these three are uh, sources of error in the side stream technology. This is very important. This is often, most often asked in the exams, both in theory and in high guard and normal capnography. As you can see, the, the phase one, the phase two, and phase three, these three represent the expiratory phase, whereas phase zero represents the, the inspiratory phase. Uh, often there's, a, the, there's an additional phase four, uh, which is uh, located at the junction of the expiratory and inspiratory limbs. It's often found in, in pregnant patients. Uh, <clears throat> a further explanation of the, the normal carbon dioxide waveform. Uh, A to B represents the baseline. B to C represents the expiratory upstroke. The C, D is the, is the longest phase. That is the expiratory plateau phase. D represents the, the junction between of the phase three and phase zero, or the junction between the expiratory and inspiratory limb, that is the, the ETCO2 values. And D to E, that is the inspiratory uh, downstroke. A further explanation of the, the phase one, that is A to B, it represents the anatomical dead space with no measurable carbon dioxide because uh, this dead space did not, the dead space gas did not take part in any respiratory exchange. Uh, and uh, it was located in the, this dead space is, is, of course, the air that is present in nose, pharynx, trachea, and bronchi, and not part of the respiratory exchange. <clears throat> Next comes the phase two. This is the mixed uh, mixed phase of mixed carbon dioxide with the rapid rising CO2 concentration. Uh, it represents a combination of the, of the dead space, uh, dead space air, as well as the alveolar ventilation. It's a combination of, of both. Now the phase three is is the most important part of this of this curve. 
it's the alveolar plateau where all the exhaled gas that took part in the gas, gas exchange uh, is being evaluated. So it's the most important phase, longest phase of the curve. And at the end of it, at the point D, where there is a sharp downstroke, we evaluate the ETCO2. The phase zero, as I already mentioned, represents the, the inspiratory phase. Uh, an additional phase four is often seen in pregnancy, which is a quick, quick upstroke just before the phase zero begins. Now coming to the angles, these are often asked in the exams. Again, favorite of a few of the examiners, the alpha and beta angles. Now, what is alpha angle? It's a transition from phase two to phase three. Uh, without complicating uh, too much, uh, the alpha angle um, is used to assess the ventilation perfusion of the lung. The, if there is a VQ mismatch, then this alpha angle will, will exceed 90 degrees. Again, um, the transition from phase two to phase zero is, is the beta angle, as I've demonstrated. Uh, this beta angle uh, is used to reassess, uh, used to assess rebreathing. So if, if there's rebreathing, you'll find that this angle is exceeding 90 degrees. The summary of the capnogram, the all the phases along with the cows. Very important to understand this. Now, what are the factors that will affect your ETCO2 levels? <clears throat> and find that uh, uh, elevated ETCO2 is often due to uh, increased metabolism, as in pain, shivering, and malignant hypothermia. In case of respiratory insufficiency, respiratory depression, COPD patients, uh, increased cardiac output, and bicarbonate administration. These are the causes of elevated carbon dioxide. It is CO2 values will rise. On the other hand, there will be decreased it is CO2 if there is decreased metabolism, like in uh, hypothermia, metabolic acidosis, alveolar hyperventilation, bronchospasm, any mucus plugs will also reduce it is CO2. As hypotension, sudden hypovolemia, and of course, cardiac arrest and pulmonary emboli. These are very important and rare causes of decreased it is CO2. And this is uh, very important, understanding this, this, this gap between the, the arterial and internal carbon dioxide, which is popularly known as the gradient. Now, there's always a difference between the measured arterial CO2, that is PaCO2, and the ETCO2. Now, this capnogram gives us an idea about the alveolar dead space. This, this gradient gives us an idea of the alveolar dead space. If a patient has a lot of alveolar dead space, then he or she cannot effectively unload the carbon dioxide on exhalation. <clears throat> and therefore, retain more carbon dioxide in the arterial blood. This means that the PaCO2 and uh, ETCO2 gradient will increase. <clears throat> now, this total dead space is, is a combination of the anatomical dead space, the alveolar dead space, and the mechanical dead space. Anatomical dead space is about the airways leading to alveoli. The alveolar dead space is the ventilated areas without blood flow and the mechanical dead space, of course, the, the artificial airways and the ventilated circuits that we have introduced. This is another very important uh, curve which shows uh, a, with a patient with normal ventilation perfusion gradient. Uh, what will happen, uh, the, this VQ, it's a very important relationship. This this describes uh, the relationship between airflow in the alveoli and the blood flow in the in the pulmonary capillaries. Now, if the ventilation were, were perfectly matched to to perfusion, then this VQ would always be one. This is not so. Even in a normal patient, the the VQ is around uh, 0.8. So, when a normal VQ exists, the the ETCO to PACO to gradient is around two to five millimeters of mercury. Now, uh, what happens with, with the shunt perfusion? We'll get a low VQ ratio. Now, shunt perfusion, uh, perfusion uh, a, a, you can see that the abnormality is, is lung related. And as the alveoli are perfused, but are not ventilated. Therefore, the ETCO2 and PACO2 gradient in, in shunt perfusion is usually larger uh, than normal. It's about four to 10 millimeter of mercury range. Now, the opposite thing will happen with the, with the dead space ventilation. Here we'll find that uh, the alveoli are ventilated, but they are not perfused. 
So this VQ uh, abnormality is often referred to as a low VQ ratio. Okay. So now what is uh, about this dead space ventilation? Uh, this obviously is a depiction of a very simplified uh, alveolar sac. What we see depicted is a, is a cluster of, of alveoli uh, and only, few, only a few of them are perfused. Uh, here we can see that uh, all the alveoli that uh, did not come into contact with, with the perfusion, uh, they, they do not contain any carbon dioxide. And therefore, uh, alveoli that did not take part in any gas exchange will, will dilute the alveoli, uh, alveolar carbon dioxide uh, that were coming from the alveoli that were perfused. So the ETCO2 uh, curve, as you can see, will, will reflect that. The CO2 uh, measurement will, will reflect that. Uh, and uh, there will be a very wide ETCO2 uh, to PACO2 gradient. In fact, it may be mm, as much as 20 to 25 millimeter of mercury. Here you can see the ETCO2 is around 33 millimeter of mercury. Now coming to the clinical applications, there is a, this is a real time uh, measurement as well as there is a trend. So you can use um, both this uh, for uh, clinical assessment of the patient. Uh, the value of a carbon dioxide waveform cannot be overemphasized. It, it, it provides a validation of the ETCO2 values. It's a visual assessment of the, the patient's airway integrity. It's a verification of proper ET tube placement. It's an assessment of the ventilator. It's assessment of the breathing circuit, everything. It's a very important parameter as we already said. Uh, any, any defect in, in this whole circuit, right from the from machine to the patient, uh, is reflected in, in an abnormal capnometry, abnormal capnography. Uh, it's a very valuable tool. Now, there are two uh, uh, diagrams actually in this. In order to evaluate the ETCO2 values, the clinician will need the capnogram. If you look at the capnogram on the left, um, we see that the alveolar plateau has been established, uh, which gives uh, greater confidence to the, um, to the displayed ETCO2 number. The capnogram on the, on the right, you can see that uh, it does not establish any alveolar plateau. Therefore, the clinician uh, is alerted that the value of ETCO2 is uh, maybe spurious and likely to be lower than the actual ETCO2. Now, this is a very important part for your exams, abnormal CO2 waveforms. This is given in your chart section, in your VIVA section. What is this? This is an endotracheal tube in the esophagus, esophageal intubation. Uh, when the ETCO2 when the ET tube is in the esophagus, either no carbon dioxide is sensed or only a very small transient waveform is, is present. Now, why, why is this present? Because uh, when you bag, bag and mask the patient, uh, <clears throat> there is a small amount of carbon dioxide in the esophagus. Additionally, if the patient imbibed any, any carbonated uh, beverage prior to being intubated, the carbon dioxide may be present in the stomach. So after several breaths, this carbon dioxide will be washed out. And after three to six beds will find that if the ETC, if ET tube is in the esophagus, then no carbon dioxide is present, the, the carb will become flat on the baseline. And this is another uh, important uh, capnography where you'll find that there is an inadequate seal around the ET tube, either due to leaky or a deflated, deflected, uh, deflated endotracheal or tracheostomy cuff. Uh, Maybe the arterial, uh, the artificial airway that was introduced was too small for the size of the patients, or the tube maybe at the vocal cords. It's, it's not beyond the vocal cords; it's just proximal to the vocal cords. So this is a, another very important capnography that may be asked in the exams. <clears throat> this is very commonly seen. This is an, an obstructive pathology in the airway or the breathing circuit, either due to a partially kinked or occluded artificial airway. Oh, there may be presence of a foreign body in the airway that, that causes the obstruction. The obstruction is uh, of this uh, is generally in the expiratory limb of the breathing circuit. And maybe a severe bronchospasm can also give rise to this sort of a capnogram. Now, what is this? 
Uh, this is due to hypoventilation. There's a gradual increase in ETCO2. What are the possible causes? Decrease in the respiratory rate, increase in the tide, decrease in the tidal volume, increase in the metabolic rate, or a rapid rise in temperature, hypothermia. The opposite thing, this is hyperventilation and a gradual decrease in ETCO2. Why? Again, uh, increase in the respiratory rate, an increase in the tidal volume, a decrease in the metabolic rate or a fall in the body temperature can result in this, uh, this sort of a curve. Now here, uh, the baseline is, has been elevated. Why? Because this is due to rebreathing. What are the causes of rebreathing? There may be a faulty expiratory valve, inadequate inspiratory flow to wash out the carbon dioxide, insufficient expiratory flow, or a malfunction in the carbon dioxide and so our system. So that needs to be replaced. Another very common and uh, often asked uh, curve in the exams. This is uh, the, the requirement of muscle relaxants, popularly called as the, the curare cleft. It appears when the muscle relaxants effect begins to subside, and the depth of the cleft is inversely proportional to the degree of, of drug activity. Now here, the, the baseline is elevated. This abnormal descending limb of the, the capnogram, the descending limb is abnormal, and uh, therefore there's a faulty ventilator circuit uh, valve that is present. So you have to replace the valve, change the circuit, and this allows the patient to rebreathe the exhaled gas. What has happened? There's a sudden loss of, of waveform, several causes, very important, alarming causes, apnea, airway obstruction, dislodged airway, airway disconnection, ventilator malfunction, and last but not the least, cardiac arrest. Very alarming condition indeed. Now, what has happened here? Tunicate release, sudden rise in the ETCO2, followed by a normalization of values. Now, how can, um, of course, uh, the, the CAPNO mask, we talked about this, how can we use, use the, the CAPNO meter? This is the, the mainstream CAPNO meter that you can place, of course, in the in your face mask. Uh, it allows measurement of ETCO2 and delivery of oxygen in the non-intubated patients, very effective, excellent choice for patients on conscious sedation. Uh, this is another uh, capnometry, the side steam one, which can be placed in the in the cannula, oxygen cannula, in case you're again practicing a conscious sedation. Uh, it's very important to use uh, these methods in case of procedural sedation or conscious sedation. Why? Because uh, there may be drug-induced respiratory depression or airway obstruction, even in a patient of uh, non-intuited patients of conscious sedation and uh, <clears throat> increase in FiO2 uh, may, may mask the decrease in ventilation earlier. So if you're only observing the pulse oximetry, you may be tricked. CPR, one very important application of, of your ETCO2. Now, the ETCO2 curve will actually guide uh, your compression depth, whether your compression depth is optimum or not, and the rate is optimum or not, or there's fatigue in, your, in, the, in the provider or not, that will be uh, detected, accurately detected by CPR. It's, it's part of the guidelines too. So your goal will be uh, at least a 20 millimeter of mercury ETCO2. So if you are constantly falling below the 10 millimeter mark, then you, you, your technique is probably faulty or your the provider uh, is probably tired, fatigued, so you need to switch uh, to, uh, to a different provider. Now, uh, if there is an abrupt sustained increase to a, to a normal value, say 35 to 40, that is an indicator of a return of spontaneous circulation. That's a very important sign for the, a very important welcome sign for the cardiac arrest patient. However, if you fail to maintain it, the CO2, to more than 10 minutes of mercury for a long period of time, it predicts an unsuccessful resuscitation. So how do you analyze an OFR? Um, it's just like an ECG or chest X-ray, I recommend using a, a systematic process. You evaluate for height of the capno gram, the frequency, the rhythm, the, the baseline, and, and, and then the shape. So you move stepwise. 
whether a waveform waveform is present or not. Then you evaluate the inspiratory baseline because to evaluate is there rebreathing or not. Then go for the expiratory upstroke. So whether it's steep or sloping or prolonged. Then go for the the, the plateau phase. Is it sloping? Is it steep? Or is it too much too much prolonged? Then proceed to the inspiratory downstroke. Whether again it's it's sloping, steep, or prolonged. So if you analyze this in a sequential phase-wise manner, there'll never be uh, any signal abnormality in your ETCO2 curve. So to conclude, uh, ETCO2 uh, capnography is very important uh, uh, because it improves the quality of patient monitoring. It's just just not about the number, as I've already said. The waveform interpretation is very important. Helps in a lot of differential diagnosis, and it's got wide range of uh, important clinical applications too. Um, any questions? We don't have time for questions uh, directly. If you can uh, uh, write your questions, type your questions in the chat box. I'll be very happy to answer any questions. Uh, these are my references, some of the very important uh, articles and books that have been written on capnography. And thank you and all the very best for your exams. And I, I'm perfectly sure that all of you will be, will be doing very, very well in your exams. Thank you. Thank you, Shodab. That was a very nice presentation. And uh, uh, post if you have any questions, you can put it in the WhatsApp group. Sure, are you logged in? Please turn on your camera. Yeah, there he is. Uh, students, if you have any questions, please put it in the WhatsApp group. Uh, in case there are no questions, we'll move to the next lecture, which is on ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Uh, I think this technique was first used in this city about five, six years ago, or no? 2014 or? Yeah, 2014. So uh, in the last six years, they're mostly used in severe ARDS patients and uh, in which oxygen maintaining oxygenation was difficult with conventional ventilation. However, with the onset of uh, COVID, the number of cases have gone up. So many large number of patients uh, uh, you know, needed ECMO support. So this is one of the emerging things that can be asked uh, in the next uh, examination. Maybe in some other cases, questions, you might be asked questions on this thing. Uh, so far, we have not seen any questions in the WhatsApp group. So sure up, thank you once again for taking time out of your busy schedule. And today is also, I can see that you are in still in scrub suit, so you must be still busy. Uh, thank you, thank you for your presentation. I think uh, it's a... Uh, Microphone is off. Shut up, turn on your microphone. Yeah, yeah. It, it was a real pleasure to, to be a part of this boot camp and a big kudos to you to you and uh, Sujatadi for organizing this boot camp. It's, it was wonderful and I think it will be very helpful with the students also. Yes, last year we had a fabulous show. You were also yeah. part of it. We, we were on a, on a physical uh, platform. Oh. Hopefully next year we will be meeting again and yeah. Uh, seeing each other face to face rather than oh, yeah. just on a screen. It's actually a little difficult for me because when I'm presenting it, I'm not hearing anything as long as the presentation is yeah, going on. So, difficult uh, uh, but anyway. you've done a fabulous job. You've done yeah. a fabulous job. Thank you. Thank you, Shorab. So next we'll move on to uh, Harpun Chakraborty, who is uh, one of the eminent cardiac anesthetists of this city. But he has been the uh, force majeure behind this uh, uh, what should I say, this ECMO revolution in the city of Kolkata. Uh, together, he and with his, uh, with his uh, colleague, uh, Dipanjan, they have managed uh, more than 100 patients now. Uh, more than 100 patients now. And uh, uh, I have personally been, you know, uh, a few of my known people have also passed through him. So Orpon right now is, uh, uh, rightfully is an authority on this subject. And he... Uh, teaches also the experts and the novices alike. So it is very difficult to find 
anybody who can who knows this subject as well and teach it to anybody so uh, just like this uh, previous one we will be uh, playing a uh, video recording of this of his lecture and then at the end of it if there are any questions please uh, put it up on this uh, uh, on our boot camp uh, whatsapp group now i will try to do this slide share thing again i would also like to mention that i believe orpon is in the airport if i am not very much mistaken so there lies the beauty of the internet and this boot camp virtual boot camp thank you orpon thank you for joining us from your busy schedule a very busy one <laughs> uh is the video visible it is visible okay we'll start now hello everybody welcome uh to my lecture of uh, ecmo i'm dr arpun chakraborty Uh, currently the senior consultant in the uh, department of cardiac anesthesia and critical care and ecmo services in medical super specialty hospital uh, we have started our ecmo program in 2014 many of you have seen uh, um, in this covid times you have heard about the ecmo programs we are performing and we are doing in medica so uh, with this covid uh, environment uh, the ecmo has become a very important tool to manage uh, uh, some acute respiratory failure uh, from covid or maybe in some non covid situations uh, when ventilation doesn't work so ecmo is a fact uh, which is used uh, it is a modality of treatment which is used in case of acute respiratory failure or acute uh, uh, heart failure where your uh, conventional treatments like ventilators and uh, your inotropes doesn't work so with that idea uh, uh, we are chipping into our uh, lecture uh, most of the time we have seen that ecmo uh, comes as a short note uh, in your exam or maybe some questions so uh, this time probably uh, you can expect a long questions for this on ecmo so uh, to know i i i will uh, <clears throat> uh, briefly uh, i can tell you something uh, about ecmo so that you can write it in a proper way uh, so first thing is the definition of ecmo which is uh, nothing but an extra corporeal membrane oxygenation so every point is important it is extra corporeal means it is outside the body so anything this may, always this thing stays outside the body and it causes circulation support and the gaseous exchange support to provide a temporary life support it is always a temporary life support to a patients with reversible pulmonary or cardiac failure so all the uh, red and black points are important uh, outside the body it is temporary it is reversible support now what we do actually we take out a uh, blood from uh, at the venous side and we uh, oxygenate and decarboxylate it and pump them inside the body again so if i blood uh, extracted from the venous system and blood is circulated in the oxygenator oxygen saturation goes up and the co2 is removed then we return the blood to the vascular tree now regard uh, as per the return where we are pushing the blood uh, the oxygenated blood that uh, uh, we can divide the ecmo in two categories like if it if i push the blood to the arteries so it is known as veno arterial ecmo or uh, if we push the blood to the again to the vein that is for the respiratory support is this is for known as vv ecmo so uh, to get the idea of how does the ecmo work you should know what is what is what we do one of our patient uh, when we came out of ecmo asked me sir what is your job profile what you do actually so i told i am an ecmo physician so he told me okay fine uh, uh, that i know but what you actually do so i got a very good answer from this guy who uh, in the first part of the pandemic was a zomato delivery boy 
was uh, giving this uh, food to every household of Delhi in a very smiling face. So uh, he was a food delivery boy. So I found myself with this as an oxygen delivery boy. And uh, uh, the, the exact work the ECMO does is that it uh, supplies the oxygen to the tissues. So you have uh, uh, this ECMO, which is uh, which gives uh, the oxygen to the oxygen debt to decrease the oxygen debt to replenish the oxygen stored in the tissues. So uh, if, uh, come back to your ECMO thing. If we get a veno arterial, uh, this thing, your drainage cannula from where you get the venous drainage is in the uh, uh, in the vein. Your return cannula will be arterial or with the veno arterial. What you support, you give both cardiac and respiratory support. So VA is for the both heart and the lung, and used mainly in the ECPR, the cardiac arrest scenarios, cardiac failure, sepsis, pulmonary embolism, like thing. If you, if we are coming in the venovenous thing, it is only for the respiratory support. Used mainly in the ARDS, like most, mostly in the COVID situations, pneumonia, status asthma, etc. So both drainage cannula and the return cannula will get in the vein. And there are some other variants which are called the mixed ECMOs. When VA plus VV comes from the VAV, both cardiac and the respiratory support, or VVA, or it has only a the carbon dioxide removal technique, which is known as ECOR, extracorporeal carbon dioxide removal, which requires much lesser flow than the ECMO. So if anybody asks about the what are the indications, we'll go for it. The red one is the most important. Anything reversible acute cardiopulmonary failure is the indications for ECMO. So come if we what the respiratory support, it is always the ARDS or extensive pneumonia. It is drowning, it's neonatal for the meconium aspiration, any aspiration, massive lung contusion, uh, the intractable asthma, all these are the indications for the respiratory echo. Thus, the VV will suffice in these patients. If we go for a veno arterial indications, it is mainly used in the operating theater, like where we are not able to come off bypass um, after the cardiac surgery, and we have to raise the heart for some time, the inability to win off bypass. Uh, 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 after cardiac surgery, you have an ECPR, patient got arrested and you are um, uh, with conventional um, uh, CPR, you, uh, the patient is not coming out after half an hour, you put them on ECMO and uh, rescue them. You have a post-MI cardiogenic shock with uh, some mechanical complications. You have a post-septic cardiogenic shock or you have a myocard viral myocarditis or you have a peripartum cardiomyopathy or you have a massive pulmonary mass. These are all shock scenarios or the acute heart failure scenarios, maybe right heart, left heart, what are the the indications of veno arterial ECMO. So obviously, the, how the ECMO works, it either acts as bridge to recovery, you or support the organ, and the organ gets recovered. That is bridge to recovery. And you support the organ, but organ didn't recover, and you uh, replace them with a new organ, that is bridge to transplant. In between, there is a bridge to decision. When the patient comes with an unknown cause of cardiac arrest, and you resuscitated him on ECMO, and taken a patient the, or the cath lab to see whether there is any uh, uh, MI has happened or something. So this is known as bridge to decision. So these three way the ECMO work, the bridge to recovery, uh, bridge to decision and bridge to transplant. Now, uh, obviously some years, this is the first uh, ECMO, uh, successful ECMO patient in 1971 who was a road traffic accident. His uh, thoracic aorta got lacerated and he went up in the, uh, uh, <clears throat> getting a lot of blood products. So he's developed a trolley. And so they uh, uh, rescued them by with this kind of haphazard, big um, ECMO machine. And he got first uh, rescued out of the operation theater. And she is the first ECMO survivor in a pediatric ECMO 1975 when uh, she uh, brought to the uh, Michigan with uh, this meconium aspiration syndrome. And she got uh, uh, rescued on ECMO. So, and the um, ECMO machine has got miniaturized and he previously, whose name was ECMO, because of the heart support, we now call it ECLS, extracorporeal life support. And we other organs like the ECMO can give uh, kidney support, ECMO can give liver support. The, this is known as now extracorporeal organ support or ECOS also. So obviously, this is very much uh, a known uh, uh, diagram to you in ARDS um, scenario where uh, uh, this is the mild, moderate, and severe ARDS. And you can see in the severe ARDS format, this ECOR and ECMO is the last sort of treatment. And so this is your ECMO console, which is, which is available in the, uh, uh, in the hospitals. Like you have this ECMO console, you have this 
uh, blender, you have this oxygen holder, you have a console, you have this is hemotherm, uh, rota flow emergency unit, and your uh, a drive unit. So here your uh, uh, this um, pump is attached over here and uh, uh, they push the blood inside the body. And this is your components like a basic components like a blood pump, a membrane oxygenator and a heat exchanger. You have a controller for the console. You have cannulas which you put inside the vessels and you have tubing which connects the uh, machine with, a, with the cannulas that is the tubing. So these are the components of your ECMO. And this is your oxygenator, that is the lungs of your ECMO uh, circuit, which is connected to a fitted to a holder so that it, it, it doesn't move or it doesn't fall. Now, this is your again oxygen, oxygenator with the full of blood. And it, with this console, uh, these two things uh, uh, comes mainly in the display that is the LPM and there is the RPM. There is a liter to liter per minute. That is the flow of your ECMO, how much at least 50 to 60 percent of your cardiac output you can give as a flow as liter per minute. And this is your RPM, the, flow, uh, the pump uh, at uh, the speed at which it runs. And uh, this is this too uh, is displayed on your, uh, uh, this console. And this is your, the knob which you can increase with, uh, 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 to uh, increase the RPM with the to rate, uh, the increase the flow, that is the LPM. So why it is necessary to discuss ECMO now, I told you, because we have a very high uh, uh, incidence of acute respiratory failure nowadays. So it is either they present with this kind of X-ray or they present with a severe hemodynamic instability. These two are the indications where you put either VV or VECMO. So with this idea, this CSER trial came out in 2009 with the, in H1N1 epidemic and they proved uh, that is found in, uh, uh, that is done in the Leicester, England, UK. So, and there is uh, ECMO patients who, the ARDS patients who are uh, managed on ECMO there is a mortality of 37% and uh, the ECMO patients who got ventilated and uh, uh, with the conventional ventilatory support, there is a mortality of 53%. So clear cut, there is a 16% mortality uh, difference, which is very much a, and that pr proved that ECMO can be used in acute respiratory failure when your conventional ventilation is not working. So coming to this, uh, so to get the patient on ECMO, you have to do the cannulations. Now, cannulation is your admit card of your ECMO. Without cannulation, you cannot start ECMO. So at the bedside, you can cannulate or in the operating room. Usually in the ICU, we do cannulate in the bedside because the, the patients are very much sick. You cannot move them from a uh, 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 IQ to uh, OT so that they, they will fall further sick. So you cannulate them in the uh, the ICU or otherwise in a elective scenarios where you put it on ECMO for some operations and something, you can do it in the operating room. And depending on the site of cannulations, it can be the, <clears throat> the arteries can be in the aorta, arterial cannula is the right common character in the babies. Humoral artery, which is very much common to us, subclavian artery, axillary artery. These are the arterial cannulation sites. And venous are mainly internal jugular vein. Uh, it can be right atrium in the operation theater, in the open chest, SVC, IVC, femoral vein. That is another uh, commonest thing. Subclavian vein and the left atrium. So these are the venous cannulation sites. And if you, this is not a central cannulation, which is done in the operation theater. Best, uh, the, it is usually in the uh, uh, right atrium for the venous drainage, and it is in the aorta which is for the arterial input and this is the peripheral arterial cannulations where a drainage cannula will be in the femoral vein and return cannula will be in the femoral artery to and this kind of thing you have to always go for a distal perfusion because when you put the cannula in your femoral artery it blocks the femoral artery and it uh, stops the distal perfusion so you have to put a distal perfusion sheath to perform your distal perfusion in the leg which is uh, where your cannula you have put. So you, the distal uh, ischemia or the distal perfusion uh, is a typical problem with the venoarterial peripheral ECMO where in the femoral uh, arteries when you are putting the uh, cannulas. So uh, how this is the how you uh, put the distal leg perfusion, you take the uh, blood from your artery, uh, arterial inflow and you give it to your distal perf leg perfusion cannula which is just, dist uh, uh, just opposite to your uh, main uh, perfusing cannula. 
as this is the limb ischemia, you can give it femoral distal perfusion cannula or you can give a distal perfusion cannula in near the same limb uh, ostratibial artery, which is uh, a, a small cut down and you put it and go for a distal perfusion uh, uh, cannula. So limb ischemia is a typical um, uh, aon, your uh, venoatrial ECMO. So if you see uh, how we do cannulate, we do cannulate by serial dilatation, by percutaneous technique. So uh, obviously the cannulation technique can be three. What are these? It can be open, done by the surgeons. It can be semi-open if uh, just uh, um, uh, take out the blood vessels and put uh, go for a semi cellular technique. You puncture it with the puncturing guide wire uh, after seeing the vessel. And what we do actually, that is the mostly common is the percutaneous because you have to keep the cannulas for longer durations. It can be better fixed and less bleeding. So you do it in the, under the percutaneous method. And obviously percutaneous uh, things are done by your cell injet technique. So you have a guide wire, you have serial dilators, you have your cannula. So blade and puncture needle is there. So you have this cannulation kit uh, for the uh, uh, cannulations of ECMO. Now, these are the return cannulas, arterial cannulas. These are all venous cannulas. Venous cannula has multiple holes so that it can drain from the multiple sides and without any obstruction. And you, after cannulation, you check them on echo or by X-ray where the cannula is there. It is in the IVC or it is in the uh, SVC, uh, the positions of the cannulas. So if you see, these are the cannulas you can see in the neck and these are the uh, from the femorals. So, if you see that there's a femoral venous cannula, which is uh, which is seated over in the femorals. And these are short, it's a VVECMO with a distal leg perfusion cannulas. And this is a classical picture of your VVECMO where a drainage cannula is put in the uh, uh, femoral vein and your uh, return cannula is put in the uh, right jugular vein. So uh, they look like this. This is your uh, drainage cannula, which is ca taking out the red blood uh, they are taking out the blue blood, and it is, uh, this is your IJV cannula, which is pushing the red blood uh, to the body. So this is a classical thing of veno-venous ECMO for the femoro-jugular configuration. So how do you manage on ECMO? One is a circuit related, and is a patient related. For the patient related, you need to maintain the hemodynamics. You need to maintain the ventilation, sedation, blood volume and fluid balance, temperature. Renal and nutrition management, infection. Like other ICU patients, this uh, under these headings, you have to know all the uh, uh, managements. Like uh, you have to anticoagulate the patients. Uh, no, commonest is the heparin uh, through which we anticoagulate. And uh, uh, you have also guidelines. Uh, you can uh, uh, heparinize a bolus. Uh, when we cannulate, we give bolus heparin. With, after the continuous heparin infusion, we measure the ACT, which is uh, we maintain around 1.5 times normal, around 160 to 200. And if we, after the ACT, uh, from the next day, we maintain a PDT of 1.5 to 2 times. So this is the protocol which is uh, uh, available in your um, uh, ELSO website. And VV ECMO anticoagulation is much more easier than your VA ECMO because VA is always chance of your clot can go to your brain in the other arterial circuit. So VV ECMO, it is, uh, the target ACT we keep around 150 to 180. And your VA ECMO also we target, but uh, the heparin, uh, should be started when the chest tube drain. That is for the post-surgical thing. And it has to be very well monitored in VA ECMO so that no clot form in your circuit. And blood <coughs> volume, obviously the blood volume is increased because of the circuits. The ECMO has two patients, primed with crystalloid solution and we target a hemoglobin of more than 10. So two units are required, uh, two blood units are required for your priming of the these things. And temperature has to be maintained. We usually maintain a uh, mild hypothermia or it close to the temperature 37 degree. Hemodynamics is dependent on your uh, hemodynamic physiology. During VV support, you are on your own, so it's a pulsatile thing. VA support is not on controlled by your blood flow. It is pump flow versus negative cardiac output and vascular resistance. So systemic perfusion is better managed by the mixed venous blood saturation. Fluids and renal, uh, there is always, because of the extracorporeal circuit, there is always a chance of capillary leak. And oliguria, where, which is often associated on ECMO, and, uh, uh, and it can be, sometimes patients can swell up for initial uh, 48 hours, and they, then they start uh, diuresing the patient. So it has a 
initial uh, like uh, AKI related issue. You can perform dialysis. That's why I told you ECMO can be because also other organ support. And you can put a separate dialysis cannula or from the circuit, you can do the regular dialysis or the slate or the CRRT, whatever you can do on ECMO circuit. Infection and antibiotics, obviously, there are more chances of infections because these cannulas are large bore and this has to be kept in a very sterile way. The cannula sites are clean. Yeah, the appropriate antibiotics should be given with documented infection. Bleeding is the commonest complication of ECMO during ECLS with the systemic coagulation and anticoagulation and uh, thrombocytopenia. So always avoid suction, oral suction, ET suction in a very, uh, uh, unless it is required and it should be done very gently. Transfusion, obviously, I told you the hematocrit should be maintained around more than 10. Patients uh, are put on the lung rest when uh, the patients are put on VV ECMO. Your FiO2 requirement is 30 to 50 percent, and your PEEP is around uh, 10 to 15. Uh, peak inspired pressure, we keep it around 20 to 50 to pre prevent the volutrauma, barotrauma, and the oxygen toxicity. And for venoatrial support, we maintain some adequacy of tissue perfusion. That is, we maintain, measure the lactate and the urine output, and your target density is 180 to 200. Obviously, you have a subsequent difficulties on venoatrial ECMO, like limb ischemia, I told you. There can be LV dilatation and pulmonary edema that can be tamponed, or there can be upper body hypoxia, not greater syndrome. Now, these are the things. How do you maintain a VV ECMO? Like a saturation of more than 85%, hemoglobin of more than 12, PCO2 less than 50, or pH is more than 7.3, MAP is more than 70. For VV ECMO, because of its non spulsatility flow, MAP is more than around 60 to 70, SCVO2 is more than 70, and lactate, try it, more less than 2. So obviously, this hemolysis is a uh, big uh, picture. And so we usually suspect hemolysis when the urine turned to a pink tinge, which can be due to uh, bleeding or not hemolysis, and verified by the plasma HB. So any cola-colored urine after ECMO is an indication of your patient is getting hemolyzed. Now, uh, the thing is weaning from the ECMO uh, to be started when your lung recovery, you are uh, suspecting your lung recovery has begun and lung rest is no longer required. So whenever uh, your compliance goes up or your saturation more than, uh, its saturation goes up or PO2 goes up, you go for a trial of ECMO. And obviously you come down of your VV so, uh, ECMO is performed progressively by the decreasing the fresh gas flow in the oxygenator. And you see for a few periods of time, like 12, 12 to 24 hours of a trial of period, how your lung is doing. This trial of is period when your ECMO is off, uh, off, uh, 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 but uh, it has not been decannulated. The trial of period is a case of VV ECMO. We keep around 12 to 24 hours. If they maintain for that, then we take out the ECMO. We decannulate the patient. Like in VVV ECMO, you for a successful winning, it has to be a myocardial recovery and a good cardiac output thing. So what we uh, uh, see that uh, uh, after the, uh, what we see the following variables are measured on echo. Like you, we see our aortic uh, um, uh, VTI, that is a uh, sample volume which crosses through the uh, aortic valve at that point of time, that is actually the, uh, is equal to the cardiac output. You measure your LV ejection fraction. For the right heart, you measure your tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. And simultaneously, you measure your main arterial pressure, heart rate, your CVP, and your saturation. So you come down on the flow by 0.5 liter per minute with the increments of five minutes. Every five minutes, you come down and you see these uh, measures that your blood pressure should not go down, it, uh, your CVP should not go up, and your echo should show is a good contractility and it is. Uh, uh, recovering heart. And with this, uh, after uh, 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 this uh, weaning is off, you decannulate the patients and obviously uh, you take out the ECMO cannulas after a trial of period. So you have to have a pulsatility. Like it's, it's, uh, when the patients on ECMO, it's a non uh, improving heart, has no pulsatility in the waveform. And if you, this pulsatility is appearing even on ECMO, that is the time when you have to give a weaning uh, trial for the patients. And obviously, with a failed winning, there can be a failed winning also. You have to think for the organ transplantation because the organative organ is not getting improved even on ECMO. So obviously, we have to target our things like a more transplant, more uh, uh, bridge to transplant. You have to have more ECMO awareness because of the current COVID era. This is happening. Uh, we are using more and more ECMO, and we are uh, into very much of ECMO academics. Thanks, uh, Polish, uh, Dr. Polas, for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. 
uh, i think this uh, uh, will suffice your uh, requirement for your exam and uh, for the pg students if feel free to uh, uh, question me uh, if anything is uh, welcome to your ecmo classroom thank you Oh, I, I don't think Orpon is logged in anymore. Okay, you yeah, know he's in. Well, that was a uh, extracting the last few bits of juice from the battery. Orpon, you managed to finish the recording in. Orpon is there. Orpon. Uh, is yeah, yeah, I can see him. He managed to finish the recording with you know just a few seconds left before the laptop would shut down. So, uh, very timely finish, and it has been an excellent lecture. So let me just check very comprehensive. Let me just check if there are any questions uh, on the okay WhatsApp group. No, I do not yet see any questions. So Arpan, uh, uh, once again, thank you very much for taking time to record this session in time and uh, mail it to us. And uh, I'm sure it's going to be a great help to the postgraduate students, and they would be able to answer most of the questions if they are asked anything on this topic. And so wishing you a happy journey. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, right now is time for a tea break or coffee break or whatever break uh, one proposes for oneself, himself or herself. Uh, this is exactly two minutes past five. We'll be meeting here exactly in 18 minutes, 20 minutes past five. Thank you. So a break till that time. After that, we'll have two lectures and then we'll follow it with the OSCE session. Thank you.
everybody uh welcome back so uh this is the last session for today's program the boot camp 2021 uh we have uh, two lectures lined up for you today uh one of them is uh, something a technique which has become very popular in the last few years is high flow nasal oxygen i'm not very sure if this thing has been yet asked in the examinations put in as a question or but certainly this is very likely that you will be asked about this intervention because uh, during the present times uh, it has become a very very important technique for uh, salvaging patients with respiratory distress especially in this covid era yeah. so uh, so the this class will be taken by dr asan ahmed asan is a practicing anesthetist and an intensive care specialist his emphasis now is mostly on critical care and uh, he has been one of the first in this city to use high flow nasal oxygen quite some time back <coughs> and uh, in in this present covid scenario he has also uh, managed uh, many more patients with high flow nasal oxygen so first we will play a pre recorded uh, video on this topic and then we will take uh, any questions from the post graduates and just like the previous sessions i would request you if you have any questions to put it in the whatsapp group so first let me uh, share my screen and play the video as uh, that is shared been that has been shared with us by dr asanam hi good afternoon to everybody uh, thank you isa west bengal for organizing this type of pg boot meet so dear all pgts today i will talk about hfno or high flow nasal oxygen therapy or it is also called heated humidified high flow therapy or it is sometimes called H hfnc therapy so today i will give you a snapshot of uh, this in a very small presentation uh, i think you all know about this uh, hfno you have heard this name by this time because it has been widely used in in this covid era with severe and moderate covid with hypoxemia uh, though it has been started in 1999 Uh, to use uh, primarily in the uh, in horse but later on it is uh, been popularized to reduce the ventilator and niv dependency and it is widely popularized in this era of covid and after that a lot of literature actually flooded with all, with all journals so i will give you a snap uh, shot of what we are what hfnc is so myself dr aisan ahmed working in kpc medical college so in this uh, lecture i will talk about what is hfno how does it work and the benefits and disadvantages of this instrument so you all are aware of different type of devices for oxygen therapy but high flow nasal cannula is not just a standard nasal cannula cranked up to very high flow rates when patients are administered low flow nasal oxygen the oxygen flow rates are typically between 2 to 10 liters per minute but spontaneously breathing patients typically have an inspiratory flow rate of 20 to 40 liter per minute when usually in normal healthy people the minute ventilation is usually around 12 to 15 liter per minute and when there is slight respiratory distress or even if the patient is in any type of physiological stress like running uh, climbing up stairs the in inspiratory flow rate increases up to 15 to 20 liter per minute 
and once this inspiratory flow rate exceeds the flow of oxygen coming from the nasal cannula room air will be entertained which dilutes the fio2 so high flow oxygen therapy devices it is it, it, it can deliver up to 70 liters per minute of minute ventilator per minute ventilator flow rate it is humidified 100% relative humidity uh, and then it is heated to body temperature normal body temperature that is 37 degrees it is a comfortable soft silicone nasal prongs and it can deliver up to 21% to up to 100% fio2 so dependent on oxygen flow meter used so how does it work the purpose of uh, this device is to deliver oxygen with optimally humidified and warm gases and also uh, it reduces the work of breathing it can reduce the body body energy expenditure as the work of breathing is reduced the less problems it can secretions because your mouth cavity is open so we can patient can cough out her, his or her secretions or patient may we can give uh, oropharyngeal suctions while the device is in place and less problems due to nasal irritation and septal damage so in one hand we get patient comfort in, in there is improved patient compliance and also optimize patient outcomes so how does it work so in one space you see there is wash out of nasopharyngeal dead space now if your mini ventilation is suppose around 10 to 12 liter or 15 liter or 30 liter uh, per minute and uh, and, and if you uh, set the device to deliver 50 liter of minute of gas flow then automatically the nasopharyngeal dead space will be filled with this fresh oxygen so it will wash out the nasopharyngeal dead space once the nasopharyngeal dead space is diminished or so there is the decreased resistance of uh, during inspiration and that's how the pulmonary compliance has been improved and and it is also enriched with the humidified air and this also reduce the metabolic work associated with gas conditioning and overall it improves the pulmonary recruitment by positive distending pressure because through this small nasal passage when you uh, give a very high flow there will be a positive pressure build up so it is about uh, 1 cm of peep is developed per 10 liter of flow so for around 60 to 70 liter of flow there is usually 6 to 7 cm of peep is generated when the mouth is closed but if the mouth is open then this peep effect is reduced up to 2 cm of water so how high flow is working during expiration it gives some physiological positive and expiratory pressure and this increase peep eventually helps in alveolar recruitment and it also wash out the dead space here and during inspiration what happens the peak inspiratory flow is covered so suppose your demand is up to 20 liter or 30 liter per minute and when there is supply is 50 liter 60 liter then you feel much comfortable and that that flow also with high fio2 and then there is alveolar recruitment and a redistribution of ventilation perfusion and this this together improves the hypoxemia so pio2 is increased and also there is little bit of reduction in the pseo2 as it, as your rebreathing of carbon dioxide is reduced because the whole dead space is full with the oxygen with the fio2 that you set so eventually this improvement in hypoxemia causes decreased work of breathing due to decrease of the inspiratory effort decrease of the respiratory rate and decrease of the minute ventilation and not only it provides this high flow of fresh gas that is oxygen but is also uh, giving it with a heated humidified way in normal normal respiration what happens our upper our upper airway improves this uh, humidification uh, in a body temperature so that also needs some work of breathing that needs some uh, 
um, metabolic activity to uh, uh, humidify this dry air from the atmosphere. What happens in this machine, there is a chamber where you put this, uh, this uh, sterilized water only and that is heated with the electric device so that you and it, it uh, contains at least 100% humidified air. So that causes a much comfort to the patient that increases the patient compliance that reduces the metabolic activity of the body to, to, de to decrease the, um, the, this process of humidification by patients himself or herself. And there are some questionable role on microatelectasis. So overall, this humidified gas with a high flow decreases the work of breathing, decreases the inspiratory effort, and eventually the many ventilation. Now I'll discuss a little bit about components of HFNO system. The system has an electrically powered high pressure oxygen air supply device, ideally with a blender to blend air into the gas flow to reduce the effort of needed. A flow meter capable of flow up to 60 to 70 liters per minute. A humidifier capable of fully humidifying the inspired oxygen and air mixture. Then a white board tubing to deliver the gas from the gas supply to the nasal cannula. And a specialized white board nasal cannula that is soft silicon cannula which convey the oxygen air blend from the gas tubing to the patient's nose. If you see this diagram, you see there is the oxygen and air blender where you can set the flow rate of the oxygen and the rest of the air will be taken from the atmosphere to blend uh, the fresh gas flow to the set FiO2. And then, then that gas is flowed through the humidified heater portion which is heated electrically and there you can set the temperature of this, uh, uh, of this fresh gas and that then this heated and humidified fresh gas has been delivered to the patient through a delivery true, uh, tube and a nasal cannula. Where we can use this uh, HFNO? Practically, this HFNO can be used for all hypoxemic acute respiratory failure or chronic respiratory failure patients and in all age group, that is the improvement. Uh, so this can be used in the emergency department, this can be used in the ICU and this also can be used in operation theater. Uh, for those patients who are particularly hypoxemic before the surgery, you can improve the pre-oxygenation before induction of general anesthesia using a HFNO uh, device. Then it also provides ongoing oxygenation and carbon dioxide removal for patients during intubation. That, that time, the time of laryngoscopy and intubation, if, you, uh, if your patient is on HFN or cannula, there is no problem as because the oral cavity is free from any device. So you can go for intubation and ventilation when the HFN is already in place. Then providing effective oxygenation during awake or oral nasal fiber optic or videoscopic intubation also, you can continue the oxygen therapy with this HFNO. And also it provides respiratory support after extubation and weaning out of ventilator when their ventilator requirement is reduced, when the work of breathing is in, improved, the patient is conscious, you have extubated, but still there is some hypoxia. You can bridge that time with this HFNO device. So what are the advantage of using this HFNO in this all this clinical scenario? It provides heated and humidified fresh gas. That is very important. It actually takes a gas and can heat it to 37 degrees centigrade. That is the normal body temperature with a hundred percent relative humidity and can deliver uh, 0.21 to 1, uh, 1 uh, that is hundred percent FiO2 at a flow rate of up to 60 liters per minute. When you use a normal nasal cannula or a face mask, this humidity comes down to 60%, 70% because of blending of that air, uh, blending with the atmospheric air and your body is not supposed to rapidly humidify this uh, normal oxygen or normal dry oxygen. So this, this device can give a relative humidity of up to 100%. 
Also, it decreases the inspected demands. One obvious benefit without mentioning is that the high flow can give you a very high flow of gas. So that is that I have explained before that this is important as patients in acute respiratory failure. They can they have hunger, air hunger. They have increased thigh, but if they cannot get that oxygen, that flow of the uh, peak inspiratory. Flow, uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, get this flow rate then the patient become and they have sense of dyspnea so they are they are extremely become tachypneic and therefore the peak inspiratory flow increase now if you mismatch this increased uh, inspiratory flow then patient feels much comfortable patient feels much compliance with this device it also improves the efficacy hf increase the patient's functional residual capacity at the end of expiration, something that PEEP usually improves. So it generates some kind of CPAP or PEEP uh, due to this high flow that, all, uh, that indirectly increase the patient's functional residual capacity. And HFNC has been shown to deliver up to one millimeter of mercury of PEEP increase for every 10 liter per minute of flow delivered with closed mouth breathing. Uh, so high flow seems to cause alveolar recruitment and increase intrathoracic pressure likely as a result of added PEEP. Uh, it is also lighter because patients often prefer the use of HFNs2 to, to that of non-invasive body pressure ventilation because all of you know that with CPAP or BiPAP you, you uh, attach the face mask very tightly to prevent air leak right. and then some patients have, have claustrophobia, some patients become feel uncomfortable due to this high pressure of this mask over the nasal or over the This, this no. nasal cannula is very no. much comfortable no. in comparison to the CPAP or the much comfortable when we use this simple soft cannula which is very thick and one important point is the oxygen dilution. So to deliver high amount of FiO2 effectively to your patient, you have to not only match, but exceed your patient's minute ventilation and inspire demands to minimize oxygen dilution. For example, if you give a patient a six liter of oxygen, so by the pure FiO2 formula, you can know you know that uh, for every liter of oxygen increase, it increases the FiO2 by 0.3 to 0.4 percent. So if you keep suppose a patient's breathing uh, minute ventilation is 20 liters, and you are giving only six liters of oxygen by nasal cannula or nasal mask, the FiO2 does not increase too much. But in comparison, if you see on the high flow, if the patient's minute ventilation is 20 liters, and if you you are, you are giving 60 liters of oxygen uh, with a hundred percent FiO2. Or suppose 45 percent according to the patient will get a close to 45 percent because all the engine uh, gas the patient is taking on an inspiration that is full of this oxygen so that, that prevents the oxygen dilution so continuous high flow oxygen washes out the upper airway Reservoir of oxygen in upper airway that is pharynx available for gas exchange and avoids increasing of carbon dioxide and therefore decreases the anatomic rate. Uh, of course, whenever you think of giving HFNO to any patient, you must keep in mind the contraindications. There are certain absolute contraindications and there are certain relative contraindications. Uh, use of alcohol based skin preparations used in combination with HFNO uh, can be very detrimental because the so any patient with known or suspected scalabase fracture, CSF leak or any other communication from the nasal to the intracranial space, in those patients you cannot uh, give HFNO therapy. Uh, there may be chance of significant pneumothorax which has not been treated with the chest tube because this CPAP or PEEP effect may expand the uh, pneumothorax. Uh, it cannot be given in a patient with complete nasal obstruction and active epistaxis or recent uh, face surgery. Uh, patient with partial nasal obstructions are also relative contraindication for giving HFNO. If the patient has a disrupted airway or need for laser or dithermy in proximity to the administration of HFNO, which again increases the fire of risk, risk of fire, 
and the nasal infection resulting in pulmonary seeding with abetalum is a relative contraindication though it is a theoretical concern and cases of air leak syndrome is reported with hfno use in children below the age of 16 years though it can be used in all sorts of uh, all age groups but you have to keep in mind whenever you use it uh, on the age group below 16 so the take home message is the high flow supplies H for heated and humidified gas flow or then I for inspiratory demand it can better meet better match the elevated peak inspiratory flow demand by the patient then F for functional residual capacity it increases the FRC likely via delivery of PEEP it is lighter L for lighter so more easily tolerable than CPAP or BiPAP mask O for oxygen dilution it can minimize oxygen dilution by meeting the flow demand and w for wash out of dead space provides <laughs> provides high flow rate leading to wash out of pharyngeal dead space and also the carbon dioxide removal thank you for patience hearing so thank you YSA again for giving me this opportunity to communicate with you thank you all Thank you, Vesan. Uh, that was a nice description. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now let's just see if there are any questions that we have received in the group. Students, if you have any questions, please post it in the bootcamp WhatsApp group. Uh, when we we'll still wait for the questions to arrive. Uh, let me introduce our next speaker, Dr. Orpita Chaudhuri. She is an assistant professor at Arjikar Medical College. Uh, during her student life, she has been an exemplary student and passed with a gold medal uh, during her MD examination. And her interests are beyond, uh, also beyond anesthesiology, she is quite interested in pain medicine as well. Okay, uh, I don't think we have any questions so far from the students. So, Asan, thank you very much for joining in and, uh, and scrambling at the very last moment with a nice recording, nice presentation. Thank you once again. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. So, uh, next, uh, uh, I will again uh, start another video, which is on ECG. start the screen sharing. Good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Dr. Orpita Choudhury from Ajikor Medical College and Hospital, and I will be discussing about the interpretation of ECG. So, interpreting a rhythm strip is a skill developed through practice, and it requires a sequential and systematic approach. So, you have to proceed through this 10-step method, 10-step method to interpret an ECG. So, you have to first look for whether the ECG is normally standardized and calibrated or not, then you have to determine the heart rate, rhythm, the axis, evaluate the P wave, measure the PR interval, determine the QRS duration, whether it is a narrow complex or wide complex rhythm, examine the T wave and the ST segment, measure the QT interval and check for presence of any ectopic beats and other abnormalities. Then tell your final diagnosis. So, in exam, if you are asked to describe or interpret an ECG, don't jump to the final diagnosis. You should describe a process in, in such manner that this is a 12 showing normal standardization and calibration. Then mention the heart rate, rhythm, axis, the characteristic of P wave, PR interval, QRS duration, whether it's narrow complex or wide complex, 
the characteristic of T wave, ST segment, and QT interval, and presence of ectopic beats and other abnormalities. Then you tell your final diagnosis. So first of all, how to determine whether the ECG is properly calibrated or not? So one small square is equivalent to one millimeter, both horizontally and vertically. A properly standardized uh, ECG strip, ECG paper. In a properly standardized ECG strip, ECG paper moves at the speed of 25 millimeter per second. So horizontally, one small square is equal to 0 0.04 second. And a standard signal of one millivolt will move the cursor one centimeter, that is two large squares vertically. So vertically, one small square is equal to 0 0.1 millivolt. So by looking at this uh, calibration signal, we can determine whether it is properly calibrated or not. Next is how to calculate the heart rate. So if the rhythm is regular, the heart rate can be calculated by dividing 1500 with RR interval in small square and 300 divided by RR interval in large square. But if the rhythm is irregular, then you have to count the number of QRS complexes in 30 large square, that is in a six second ECG strip and then multiply it by 10. Next is determination of rhythm. You have to describe the rhythm in terms of regular versus irregular, bradycardia versus trachycardia, narrow complex or wide complex and supraventricular or ventricular. Next is axis determination. So the normal axis is in between minus 30 degree to plus 90 degree. In right axis deviation, the axis will be in between 90 degree to 180 degree. And in left axis deviation, the axis will be in between minus 30 degree to minus 90 degree. And this is extreme axis deviation where the axis is in between 180 degree to 270 degree. Another, uh, axis is indeterminate axis when all six limb leads show biphasic patterns in which indicates that the axis is perpendicular to the frontal plane. So how to screen for the axis deviation? So we have to simply look at the lead one and lead AVF and look at the QRS complex. If the dominant deflection of QRS complex is positive in both lead one and lead AVF, then it is normal axis. If the QRS axis is positive in lead one and negative in lead AVF, then it is left axis deviation. If it is negative in lead one and positive in lead AVF, then it is right axis deviation. And if both are negative, that is uh, the deflection, the QRS complex in lead one and lead AVF, both are negative, then it is extreme axis deviation. Now, these are a few examples of ECG strips which are commonly asked in MD examination. So, as the time is short, I shall describe only the relevant points important, important to diagnose these abnormalities. So, this is an ECG strip showing normal sinus rhythm. So here every P wave is followed by a QRS complex. The RR intervals are regular. So we can say this is a normal sinus rhythm and here the rate will be 60 to 100 beats per minute. So here the rhythm is regular and sinus rate is 60 to 100 beats per minute. The P wave, PR interval, QRS complex, T wave, QT interval, all are within normal limits and there is no ectopic or aberrant beats. Next is uh, this ECG strip showing sinus arrhythmia. So why it is called sinus arrhythmia? Here you can see that every P wave is followed by a QRS complex. Although the RR intervals are not equal. So the rhythm is irregular but Every P wave is followed by a QRS complex. So this is a sinus arrhythmia. Here the rhythm is irregular and in normal variant, it corresponds to the respiratory cycle. 
here the pp and the rr interval is shorter during inspiration and wider during expiration rate is usually within normal limit which is more during inspiration and less during expiration pof pr interval qr is complex tof and qt intervals are normal here now this is a ecg strip showing sinus bradycardia so as we all know by definition bradycardia is when the heart rate heart rate is 60 beats per minute and in a patient receiving beta blocker when the heart rate is 50 beats per minute it is defined as sinus bradycardia so here between two rof there are almost eight and half large squares so the heart rate is almost 37.5 beats per minute so this is a which is less than 60 beats per minute so this is a sinus bradycardia as the pofs are always followed by a qrs complex so the rhythm is regular sinus narrow complex the rate is less than 60 beats per minute and p wave pr interval qrs complex q waves are normal qt interval may be prolonged here this is the strip is showing sinus tachycardia so by definition when the heart rate is more than 100 beats per minute then it is called tachycardia now why it is sinus tachycardia here every p wave is followed by a qrs complex so it is a sinus rhythm so it is a sinus tachycardia and there are uh, two and half or two almost two large squares in between two r waves so the heart rate is around 150 beats per minute which is more than 100 beats per minute so it's a sinus tachycardia here the pq rst complexes are within normal limits and rhythm is also regular next is premature atrial contraction here the atrial rhythm is irregular p wave is premature and different from the sinus p wave and it is named as p dash it may be hidden in the preceding t wave also so uh, this this premature atrial contraction sometimes is not followed by a qrs complex and there may be a drop bit next is atrial flutter here the atrial rhythm is regular and ventricular rhythm is typically regular but may be irregular depending upon the av conduction pattern in atrial flutter the atrial rate, rate is around 250 to 400 per minute and the ventricular rate is around 60 to 150 beats per minute as all atrial contractions are not conducted through the av node to the ventricle here the p wave is abnormal as we can see here it is saw tooth in appearance and it is known as flutter wave or af wave it is expressed in capital f next uh, this is the strip is showing atrial fibrillation here is uncoordinated atrial activity here the atrial rate is around 600 to 800 beats per minute with irregularly irregular ventricular rate which is uh, around 120 to 180 beats per minute as all atrial activities are not conducted through av node to the ventricles so in contrast to atrial flutter where the uh, atrial rhythm and the ventricular rhythm may be regular in atrial fibrillation the rhythm is irregularly irregular and it is narrow complex and as it is narrow complex so it is a supraventricular tachycardia it is not a sinus rhythm as no p waves can be seen here there is presence of fibrillatory waves or af waves this is expressed as small f so in atrial flutter the p waves are named uh, represented as capital f waves and in atrial fibrillation p waves are not present and these fibrillatory waves are expressed as small f wave now this is a is this strip showing junctional rhythm the rhythm is regular rate is around 40 to 60 beats per minute and the p wave is inverted in lead 2 3 and f here you can see the p wave is inverted 
so the source of this p wave is not from the s a node it is probably due to retrograde activation of the s a node from the junctional level here the pr interval is shortened if it crosses qrs and the qrs complexes are normal uh, while using volatile anesthetic agents we com the common commonly encountered uh, arrhythmia is the junctional rhythm next is junctional tachycardia here the atrial rhythm is regular the rate will be around 100 to 200 beats per minute p wave will be inverted pr is shortened but the qrs qrs complex will be narrow now these is the strips sh uh, showing ventricular premature contractions so here the underlying rhythm is normal but the rhythm becomes irregular during the premature ventricular contractions the p wave is normal in the underlying rhythm but when the ectopic beat is present there is no uh, p wave is seen but it also it may appear after the qrs if there is retrograde conduction of this uh, wave to the atrium here the qrs duration is exceeds 0.1 to second so it is a wide complex qrs and the configuration is wide and bizarre and the t wave is in opposite direction of the qrs complex as we can see here it will be followed by a full or incomplete compensatory pulse these are some examples of potentially dangerous pvcs here two pvcs in a row is called a ventricular couplet which can produce vt a, a burst of three pvcs in a row are called a run of vt and this is ventricular bisemini where pvcs occur every other bit and it can precipitate vt or vf here you can see uh, every other bit is a ventricular premature contraction now this is a rhythm strip showing monomorphic wide complex tachycardia so this is a ventricular monomorphic ventricular tachycardia so ventricular tachycardia is a run of three or more consecutive vpcs it may be non sustained or sustained it is called sustained if the duration of ventricular tachycardia is more than 30 second it can be monomorphic or polymorphic as you can see this is a monomorphic vt but in case of torsed is dipointy this is a polymorphic vt here the rhythm is regular and atrial atrial rhythm cannot be determined here the ventricular rate is 100 to 250 beats per minute the qrs will be wide the duration will be more than 0.1 to second bizarre with increased amplitude it will be uh, the characteristic of the qrs complex will be monomorphic uh, will be uniform in monomorphic vt but there will be constant changes in shape in case of polymorphic vt as in case of torsed is dipointis so as i have discussed previously this is a ecg strip showing torsed is dipointis or twisting of points this is a polymorphic vt that occurs when the qt interval is prolonged here the rhythm can be regular or irregular and the ventricular rate will be between 150 to 300 beats per minute here the qrs is wide and there is a phasic variation in the electrical polarity of the qrs complex leading to swing in axis of the qrs in to and fro manner around a point that is why it is called twisting of points now this is a rhythm strip where no p wave no rate or rhythm or any wave can be determined so this is a rhythm strip showing ventricular fibrillation uh, which shows smaller and random deflections on baseline so in contrast to atrial fibrillation where any p wave cannot be seen but qrs complexes are present and the rhythm is irregularly irregular but in case of ventricular fibrillation no p wave or qrs complex or any wave can can be seen this is ecg strip showing asystole which looks nearly like a flat line now coming to the heart blocks heart blocks can be classified into first degree second degree and third degree so in first degree heart block 
the PR interval is prolonged and fixed with normal P wave morphology and each P wave is followed by a QRS complex and the QRS complex is within normal limits. So there is no drop of any bit. Only the PR interval is prolonged and fixed. Next is second degree FE block. In second degree FE block, there is intermittent failure or interaction of AV conduction. Here the rhythm is sinus. The atria are depolarized normally, but the conduction to the bundle branches are interrupted. So in type one uh, second degree AV block, there is issue in the AV node itself, which is subject to sympathetic and parasympathetic tone. And type two second degree AV block indicates a significant conduction disease in his part in the system and it is irreversible. So second degree heart block type two is more dangerous than the type one second degree heart block. So first coming to the movies type one or Wenkeback phenomenon. Here the PR interval is increased progressively until a drop bit is present. That is P is not followed by a QRS complex, followed by a conducted bit with low PR interval and then the cycle is repeated. Here the defect usually lies in the AV node as I have discussed previously. Here the atrial rhythm is regular but the ventricular rhythm is irregular and the atrial rate exceeds the ventricular rate. Here you can see the PR interval is progressively increased until there is a dropped QRS complex. Next is, next is movies type 2. Here most beats are conducted with constant PR interval with occasional atrial conduction without a subsequent ventricular conduction that is P without QRS. Here the atrial rhythm is regular but ventricular rhythm is irregular and the atrial rate exceeds the ventricular rate same as type 1. But the difference is that in type 1, the PR interval is progressively, pro, interval progressively increases until there is a drop bit. But here, the PR interval is constant, but there is occasional drop bit is present. Here, the P wave is normal in configuration and some are not followed by QRS. PR, PR interval is constant, QRS complex is narrow and normal. The blocks in Mobius type 2 are described as 2 is to 1 block, 3 is to 1 block, etc. In 2 is to 1 block, every second impulse is non conducted. In 3 is to 1 block, every third impulse is not conducted, and so on. Here we can see here every fourth impulse has not been conducted. Three impulse has been conducted, but this fourth impulse has not been conducted. So this is a four is to one block. Next is, next is third degree AV block or complete AV dissociation. Here the atria and the ventricles are depolarized from different pacemaker sites and they beat independent of each other. Here the atrial contraction is normal, but no beats are conducted. It is characterized by normal and regular uh, P wave. There is no relationship between the P wave and the QRS complexes. There will be relatively constant PP intervals and RR intervals. And there will be greater number of P waves than the QRS complexes. As no atrial conduction uh, impulse is conducted to the ventricles, there will be escape foci in the bundle of his or in the ventricular muscle. So if the escape focus is at the bundle of his, the rate will be 35 to 40 per minute and the QRS complex will be narrow. And if the escape foci is in the ventricular muscle, the rate will be much less than 30 to 35 and QRS will be broad, notched, slurred and bizarre. Here we can see these are the P waves and these are the QRS complexes. Here there is no relation between the P waves and the QRS complexes and they are independent of each other. Next is left ventricular hypertrophy. In left ventricular hypertrophy, the R waves will be taller than normal in the leads facing the left ventricle. That is lead 1, AVL, V5 and V6. 
and the in the opposite leads that is v1 and v2 the s waves will be deeper than the normal the other changes also may include widening and notching of the qrs complex there may be presence of variety of st and t changes and strain pattern may be seen so which is a strain pattern there will be a depressed and convexity upward st segment with inverted t wave in lateral leads that is lead 1 avl v5 and v6 that is the lateral leads so how to diagnose uh, AL, lvh we usually add the amplitude of r wave in v5 or v6 and s wave in s wave in v1 if the uh, if it is more than 35 mm then we diagnose it as left ventricular hypertrophy this is the easiest method to diagnose a left ventricular hypertrophy So, so this is a 12 lead ECG showing left ventricular hypertrophy. Here the R waves are uh, taller than normal in lateral leads, that is V V4, 5, 6, and in one and AVL, and in the opposite leads, that is in V1 and in V2, the S waves are deeper than normal. Now, how to diagnose left bundle branch block? In left bundle branch block, all leads will have prolonged qrs complex the r waves in lateral leads that is lead 1 avl v4 5 and 6 there will be broad nosed and slurred slurred r waves and in leads v1 and v2 there will be small or absent r wave followed by a dominant s wave and sometimes in v1 to v3 there may be presence of st segment elevation as we can see here and the po and positive t waves next is right bundle branch block in right bundle branch block there will be, there will be r s r dash pattern in lead v1 and v2 here you can see this is a r s r dash pattern r s r dash pattern and there will be slurred s waves in lead 1 avl and v5 and v6 so a right bundle right bundle branch block is called called incomplete when the qrs duration is less than 120 millisecond and it is called complete when the qrs duration is more than 120 millisecond now how to diagnose a bifascicular block when there is presence of rbbb with left axis deviation it is a bifascicular block and when there is presence of prolonged pr interval along with rbbb and left axis deviation then it is called trifascicular block now this is the sequence of changes seen during evolution of uh, myocardial infarction at first there will be peak t waves after that there will be appearance and progression of the st segment elevation then q wave formation and loss of r wave then there will be t wave inversion so to diagnose anterior wall mi we have to look for st segment elevation in v1 to v5 lead chest lead to diagnose inferior wall mi we have to look for st elevation in lead 2 3 and avf this is lead 2 3 and avf which shows st segment elevation and there will be reciprocal changes in lead 1 avl and v1 and v2 to diagnose anterior anterolateral wall infarction we have to check lead 1 lead avl and v3 v3 to v6 and to diagnose anteroseptal wall mi we have to look at v2 to v4 to diagnose posterior wall in mind we have to place v7 v8 v9 lead uh, and uh, in, or simply we just can look at the v1 and v2 we can and we will see reciprocal changes at v1 and v2 if v7 v8 v9 leads are not present usually these leads are uh, not present in in a normal pure lead ecg and the last one is wpw syndrome here the pr interval is shortened because of this slurred qrs complex in its initial slope 
and there is presence of delta wave. This uh, red indicator indicates the delta wave at the beginning of the QRS complex. Because of this delta wave, the PR interval is shorter. So, this is a brief account of common and some patterns that we come across in our daily work schedule in wards and operating room. A thorough examination is always important to look for any hemodynamic disturbances and presence of any coexisting disorders. We should take history examination and do some investigations to reach for a final diagnosis. So that's all for today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arpita. Uh, that was a very nice and exhaustive and at the same point, very compact uh, uh, review of most of the ECG learning that a postgraduate student needs to have. Uh, they are certain to get one ECG in the Viva table. And uh, if you have been attentive and listened to everything that she has said, and uh, there is no reason why you shouldn't be able to answer it. Now, I'm yet to receive any questions on the uh, WhatsApp group. So uh, thank you, Orpita. You have prepared brilliantly. I've spoken pretty very well, and I'm sure it's going to be of immense help for the postgraduate students. Thank you so much, sir. It's an honor for me. Thank you. So uh, today we move on to the last session of today. Uh, is there anybody else who would like to participate in the OSCE? I'm, I'm going to promise you it's going to be a very fun session. And uh, to conduct it, we have uh, our presidents, our president and the vice president of Indian Society of Anesthesiology, uh, Dr. Jantha Bhattacharya, who is uh, a very busy practicing anesthesiologist and also a professor of anesthesia and runs the DNB curriculum at uh, Vims Vivekananda Institute of Medical Sciences, and Dr. Shoykot Gupta, who is the uh, prime mover behind the DNB uh, teaching program in Apollo Glenagles. These two institutes, uh, I think uh, Vims uh, started a bit earlier, but um, uh, Apollo started maybe a couple of years late, but both these institutes have, uh, uh, have a very high success rate, and uh, we do have those, both these institutes have a large number of students who are coming to these two places uh, from outside West Bengal also. And that speaks volumes for their, their name and fame spreading far across the boundaries, beyond the boundaries of the city and state. Uh, so I would uh, leave you with them. And still, if anybody who attends to participate, uh, you can still uh, get a you know, chance to be a, you know, you have to be in the, in the thick of things to extract the maximum out of it. So uh, please join and be a part of it. I think uh, whom we have, Dr. Nitesh and uh, uh, Rahul and Arnab Samant. We have, we have three three participants uh, and uh, Obhijit. I'm Obhijit. not sure. Uh, I'm not sure Dr. Nitesh is there. I don't know. I have requested him to switch on the video. Let's see who is. Okay. Uh, Ra Rahul is there. Rahul, switch on your video. Yes, Rahul is there, and Arnav. Okay, Nitesh, are you there? Okay. Anyway, let us start. And if anybody uh, you decide to join in, you can uh, join. We can allow you. Let. So over to Dr. Shen Gupta and Dr. Bhattacharya. Hello. Good afternoon. Good evening to all of you. You must be very tired after having attended the whole day on this boot camp. Now, OSCE 
or ospi somebody says is basically a format of examination for the medical fraternity anything to do with biology oski is the of <coughs> objective structured clinical examination and ospi is objective structured practical examination here the students the dnb students are mostly interested in this because they have to go through this in their final examination uh, there will be about 10 to 15 when 20 stations each station will have different set of questions or different procedure to be performed within a certain time limit and the students are allowed only that amount of time in each station before they are signal to the next station and that way a huge number of students can complete their examination and all of them are getting the same question so there is a parity in evaluation but it is done in a physical form but in virtual form you have only can get the slides and dr sendukto has prepared certain slides and will take you through this motion of uh, oski or ospi and we will have fun let's proceed dr sendukta yeah pola sharma i audible i think i am visible yeah you are audible okay excellent uh thank you uh, pola thank you isa west bengal and uh, thank you john toda for setting this boot camp up in the virtual way and uh, i think yeah uh, as as uh, yeah, uh, dr janto bhatta uh, kind of put it forward that uh, i think oski should be there to stay it is not yet kind of uh, in its full application as yet but uh, i am a great great fan of oski for the sheer reason that you remove the examiner out of the question so the i uh, more than the bias of the questions to a uh, student it just removes the whims and fancies of an examiner and which i think make the oski system very very fair this is with complete regards to examiners past and present but all obviously if i am taking an exam i would possibly want to hear a particular type of an answer or if polash is taking an exam he would have his uh, kind of a variation and uh, even jointoda is taking an exam that he would possibly ask uh, 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 wait for a particular kind of answer from actually the, this is not something new uh, so you got yeah this is absolutely this hmm. is not very new because in 9 uh, 1989 90 i sat for dtmnh final examination of calcutta university and we went through in our pathology examination through this ospi professor it's over what happened no uh, this was amita goda barging into the room <laughs> lal to that so carry on so got carry on we, we are having a thoracotomy just on the anyway uh so what uh, what i think is uh, uh polash other than uh, uh, the people who are here i can see rahul i can see orno uh whatever uh, uh, there are other people who are also uh, viewing it outside this uh, chat room right yes yes there's a live stream which is going on okay okay all right excellent uh so the other thing is uh, as jointo the kind of mentioned it is uh, what the dnb has done possibly now is that there since uh, it's very difficult to have this face to face kind of a thing so what they actually do is the, you have uh, 25 question oski written kind of a, a, a format uh, each question has around 5 stems or 6 stems at times and uh, uh, you write down in the prescribed uh, point of time which is around 5 minutes and uh, uh, you just 
deposit the uh, piece of paper on which you write the answer. And these are all collected by that particular center, scanned and sent to the uh, um, uh, the national board in Delhi. The, all the questions also come from the national board, which is why you find the exams happening on the same date across uh, whatever the number of centers that you have. Uh, similarly, for the case scenarios, it is also a structured case. Uh, the local organizers possibly have not much of a play on that, and. The examiners are supposed to ask uh, the set kind of question, and the answer should be provided. And if the students answer uh, in those set patterns, you the examiner has no other option but to uh, kind of grant those numbers to them. So it becomes, to me, a very very fair uh, system of assessment, right? So what? we have tried to do is uh, uh, recreate the, the, the uh, recreate the uh, essentially the the yeah uh, polash is the screen visible now yeah, it's visible. Yeah. Okay. So what we have tried to do is, uh, I will take you through a, just a kind of a kind of a thing that is what is happening with this twenty-five written OSCE uh, kind of a setup. So what we will do is uh, the plan that I have is that yes, there are I think three people who are in the chat room who uh, possibly will give us the answer. But to all of you who are attending this, and uh, how many of them are attending, Polash? Altogether, 103. All right, excellent. Uh, so uh, we, I, I have prepared around five, so that this is just a flavor of what uh, things are going to be. So each question I have got is have five stems. So the postgraduate students, what I would all only request you to do is write down your answers in a piece of paper, okay? So that it's just a recreation of what is going to happen actually in the uh, examination hall that you have, right? And uh, what ideally should happen is that uh, if you have written down, so since this is, nobody is trying to be one up on an other. Nobody is trying to prove anybody who is good or bad. So it doesn't matter uh, what answer you are giving. What you can do is uh, put down your uh, answers, take a picture of that and send it to that WhatsApp group or send it to Polash or you can post it here. And then we can, that is for us to kind of have an assessment as to how people are thinking, are they thinking on the same lines that we are thinking. So what I will first do is, I will run through the questions, and I have just prepared one set of five questions. And uh, after I run through the five questions with their five stems, we will then take a break, uh, break in the sense, uh, go to the answer. And uh, before we uh, uh, go to the answer, what I will do is at least the people who are in the chat room, we possibly ask them to answer what they think. And then we can do it. So to be fair, uh, Polash or Sujata, if you could just keep a time to the questions and give, uh, tell, uh, remind me after five minutes, uh, or I, I will try and set it up as well over here. But just at the end of five minutes for each five questions, it can become a little boring for those who are not participating. So the only way to keep your interest on this is to take a piece of paper and pen and start writing. Okay. So we start. Have a look at this uh, cartoon or picture or the diagram. Mm. And there is something that uh, has been marked in red. Hope that a picture is clear on your screen. So the questions to this picture are, and I will keep it on the screen. 
identify this space what are the boundaries of this space what are the contents of this space what are the indications of a block in this space what are the advantages of this block over an epidural and finally what are the complications of this block so your time starts now start please start writing your answers So you'll get five minutes to answer. We can make it slightly different because instead of waiting for five minutes, maybe we can sequentially ask them to maybe wait for a minute or so to think about their answers. So then, and then, then what happens is the, uh, uh, the only reason I don't want to do it that way, Polash, is then the people who are not in the chat room, uh, they they kind get, kind of get short cuts for this. So if even they are trying to answer, let them mm -hmm. get this pressure of five okay. minutes on them. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know it is boring and it is difficult to run an OSCE, no, this no, kind no, of no. a thing. But let us let us go, get to this. Yeah. Indications which are in. Well, if you were discussing, keep your microphone switched off. Yeah. So another practice is all the answers, five stems, ideally you should fit it in one page. One minute more to go.
I think uh, the time is up. So uh, what you do is now please submit the paper. So it is here, either you submit the paper, somebody comes around and takes the paper away from you. Okay. So take a fresh page and uh, write the next set of answers. So we'll go to the next set. Straightforward. Fresh page, number, and write it down. Define pulmonary hypertension. Straightforward. What are the X ray findings, chest X ray findings of pulmonary hypertension? What are the ECG findings of pulmonary hypertension? What is the effect of neuraxial block on pulmonary vascular resistance? And the fifth question is, how will you treat raised pulmonary vascular resistance in the perioperative period? So we start your time now.
We have one more minute to go. Okay, I think uh, we will have to shift to the next question and uh, have a look at this. So if you see that uh, the stems will have something like that. You had one from anatomy, the next one from physiology. So you will have something like a chest X-ray, which looks like this. And the questions with the chest X-ray, have a look at the chest X-ray, the magnified version. And... Uh, the first question is, what would be your diagnosis? You can possibly even think of maybe giving if a differential exists. I don't think hardly any differential in this. So what would be your diagnosis? Then how many ribs can you see normally, anteriorly, and posteriorly in a chest X-ray? In this particular person's chest, the whose chest X-ray is this, if the condition deteriorates, what would be the initial management? Fourth question, how is the cardiothoracic ratio measured from a chest X-ray? And uh, how will you rule out something like a tension pneumothorax from a chest X-ray? Simple, straightforward, but you'll have to know. So your time starts now.
In your one more minute to go on this question. Okay, go, going to the next one. Just go through this. 57-year-old man admitted for laparoscopic cholecystectomy, history of obstructive airway disease, chronic, shortness of breath on minimal exertion. Hemoglobin is 16.9, total count is 11.8, 11,800. Platelet count is 4,79,000, sodium 136, potassium 3.1, urea 25, creatinine 1.1, ABG in room air, pH of 7.33 with a PO2 of 57, room air, PCO2 of 55, and a bicarbonate of 34. Uh, lung function test revealed an FEV1 of 1.3, one liter and an FBC of 2.9 liters. Okay. The questions are you've seen this. I'm put this up on the right hand side. Enumerate the abnormalities that you can detect from the tests that have been done. Enumerate around five. What physical signs would you expect on clinical examination of this gentleman? Five. Two findings that you expect to find in a chest X-ray of this person. Two ECG changes you expect to find in the person who has these numbers. And finally, define type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure. So your time starts now.
So you have one more minute to go. So I think the time is up for this one, and we'll go to the last one. So you see that uh, it will take in, each set will have various kinds. You had anatomy, physiology, uh, x-ray. This is a classic, complete clinical scenario. And let's look at this next one. So on the right-hand side of your screen, I think you can see an image and a graph. Okay, and obviously they are related. So the graph has two, line right uh, 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 a pattern a and a pattern b see what is written in it so what does a the line a denote and what does the line b denote and what do you call the point where the line a and line b are intersecting okay so it's all related to the images that you have on the right hand side what are Beard's law and Lambert's law? So the machine will have a probe. What are present on what are present on the two sides of the probe? What is a co-oximeter? And finally, what are the four situations? Give us four situations in which the readings may not be accurate. Okay, so your time starts now. And this is the final one, the power set.
Okay, you have one more minute to go on this question. So that was the alarm, which says that it is over. Okay. Okay. Good. Olash, what do they do? They submit the answers, right? Uh, yeah, I can. Maybe we can ask uh, any one of them to volunteer and read his answer for one sec, and we. Correct. Yeah. We, yeah. We. I think now let us. So from, hopefully now you have written the answers. Let us right. now go and see how what is expected of you. And uh, people who are not in the chat uh, in this uh, chat room, if you have also written it down, you can check it by yourself as we go, mm. or uh, you can uh, if you want to make it make yourself look more like a exam. I would advise that you just even if you want to not disclose your name, just send it over to Polash or on that WhatsApp group that. Uh, has been created so that we also understand that what you are writing so that it becomes easier for you to kind of then guide us, guide you guys as to what is the way to uh, kind of take it. Shantada, that's, that's okay with you? Absolutely. Carry on. Okay. okay. Uh, I think just, I think the most important point about OSCE is that the answers are predetermined. It's not the same as an MCQ. You still need to write an okay. answer. And it combines yes. the best of both worlds. And uh, right as you said, that it takes the bias out of that exam. Like I give more importance to this, and I give more importance to that. So all the questions have a fixed predetermined answer. You may be pretty close, but you may not be exact. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, you can see then it also does not make it very polarized. Like the exam is going only one way. You'll find that uh, okay. all, all bases are covered, so which is, I think, a great thing to do. So, uh, who who volunteers? Rahul volunteers with the first set. Uh, okay. In the WhatsApp group, our answer has come. Well, oh, any, anyway, I, I I would I would I would I would initially I, there is no reason for us to doubt their honesty. So let's begin with yeah. Rahul. Turn on your microphone. Yeah, just un uh, uh, unmute yourself, Rahul. We can't hear you, Rahul. Unmute yourself. Ah, uh, unmuted. Have you got your earphone attached, or what is it like? Yeah. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, 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 we can hear you. Go ahead. Yes, sir. This doesn't matter if it is right, wrong. Just let, let us hear. It's good to hear your voice from Bombay. I hope uh, you're in uh, Bombay. Uh, yes, sir. I'm in Bombay only, sir. Right. Uh, this is the paravertebral space. Very good. So, uh, next question what are the contents the of this space? So that's the paravertebral uh, space, correct? Of the intercostal, uh, intercostal nerves, intercostal muscles and vessels. Okay. 
then uh, indications of a block would be post operative analgesia for thoracotomy uh, vat procedure minimally invasive cardiac surgery or an uh, open cholecystectomy or a rooftop incision okay. and uh, the advantages Carry over on. this advantages over this block or an epidural is are that there are no there's no central sympathetic blockade there is less incidence there is no hypotension of bradycardia which is associated with probably thoracic epidural avoidance of the epi, complications of the epidural uh, of placing an epidural uh, catheter uh, failed placements etc and it's just for uh, post op analgesia Uh, complications could be nerve injuries, bleeding, intra-arterial or intravascular injections, and a pneumothorax. Very good. I think that's uh, pretty well done. Paulash, do you have any uh, answers that you want to uh, read out from the uh, group that you have got? I've got a few answers, but I think it's a little fuzzy. Uh, The Sanjeev has consistently sent me answers. Uh, Paracortical space, I cannot read the boundaries very clearly. Contents is intercostal nerves. Indications is thoracic surgery, breast surgery, anterior abdominal wall surgery. Advantages is less drug, less time consuming. Complications of the block is uh, I cannot read the first one. I think pleural puncture and intra arterial injection. Okay, excellent. I think uh, let's see what is expected, and uh, these are the ideal kind of answers. So this is obviously the first answer is it's the paravertebral space, and the block we would give is a paravertebral block, and this is uh, you can figure out is the uh, boundaries. So this is what is an ideal answer, right? So laterally or the apex is posterior intercostal membrane and intercostal space. Medially or the base is the vertebral body, intervertebral disc. Vertebral foramina with its corresponding spinal nerve. Anteriorly is the are the parietal and visceral pleura and the lung parenchyma. Posteriorly the transverse process of the vertebra, head, of ribs, and the costal transverse ligament. Okay, and just in this is an addendum. So all this is uh, kind of that the first four bullets is all that is expected out of you, and. Uh, now the marking system we don't know what uh, the way the national board is marking or whatever your universities are marking but if you have a re reasonably nearly everything there is no reason that you're not going to get like 5 out of 5 if you have got uh, most of the bases covered okay so the paravertebral space communicates to the epidural space medially to the intervertebral foramen and intercostal space laterally that is not needed in your answer Okay. Uh, contents: neural tissue surrounded loosely by areolar and adipose tissue. So it has what is important contents are the spinal nerve with the white and grey rami communicants, with the medial aspect of the paravertebral space, and the sympathetic spine lies at the neck of the rib anterior to the intercostal. Costal neurovascular bundle. Now this can be contentious. This I the, the model answer from where I got it. This puts it as the sympathetic chain comes in, but there's obviously the sympathetic chains will be uh, restricted to certain areas or levels of the paravertebral space. Okay, for the contents, I think this is the first two bullets is I think what is the most important part of the content. Indications. Again, look at this. I think this is something that uh, I think from both Polash uh, that the answer that you read out and what uh, Rahul you said. Uh, this is a great way of answering, and uh, this is uh, if you can figure it out this way, it is unlikely that you're going to miss points. And this is important when you get get to areas like this. So it could be acute or chronic, and it calls also it could be therapeutic, right? Other than Uh, analgesia that you're thinking about. So acute pain, it could be again. See, this is I think great way of thinking. Surgical pain for unilateral thoracic surgery, unilateral abdominal surgery. You guys, most of you said this. Non-surgical pain, I think I, we did not get this from anyone. What was that? Was refractive, 
and look at these things is again you have to think about chronic pain things like post herpetic neuralgia post surgical chronic pain relief of cancer pain like mesotheliomas or deposit and i think this is again something that even i would have not thought of even if i would have gone through this after only i could think about is after i have gone through this model so is therapeutic that is control of hyperhidrosis so i i think just see how a model answer should be i think this is worth spending some time to reflect on this right so you divide it acute pain and if you are talking about acute pain surgical and non surgical chronic and therapy right okay let's go to the next answer advantages again uh, i think again if you are looking at the advantages you see this is again uh, look at the way they have uh, uh, categorized it is related to the procedure and then the effects of the procedure right uh, procedure is easy to teach learn and perform less skills needed than an epidural obviously can be done in anesthetized patients you can do uh, thoracic paravertebral lumbar anything so which you possibly own do in an epidural uh, okay decrease then look the, uh, at the uh, neurological complications like post dural puncture headache headache radicular pain paraplegia peripheral neoplasm decrease incidence it's not that it is absent decrease decrease side effects like less sedation nausea and vomiting as uh, paravertebral block you are not going to use an opiate so the opiate related side effects are going to be less decrease cardiovascular side effects i think this uh, rahul uh, did mention uh, no sympathetic block so the uh, hypotension in incidence is low and anyway it is unilateral uh decrease or no incidence of uh, urinary retention uh, lack of uh, motor block of lower extremities and better preservation of pulmonary function okay and i think this was the last one that is complication of the paravertebral block again look at it the adequacy of both is a failure rate of 5% uh the damage i think this was again brought up you can damage the parietal pleura visceral pleura create pneumothorax vascular puncture you see neural tissue adipose tissue as well as the vascular it can migrate into the epidural space and there is also because if you go too medially it can create a dural puncture along with it uh, uh complications you have a 10% incidence of getting a, bil a bilateral block and if it is you're going looking at the thoracic high thoracic and even cervical you can create a unknowingly skeletal cardiac block as well okay so that was about the first step okay who comes in to take the next one or no this one says yes a good evening sir the so pulmonary hypertension can be defined as mean pulmonary arterial pressure uh, greater than 25 mm of mercury uh, the relevant x ray findings will be right ventricular hypertrophy with right atrial enlargement may be present uh, uh, the ecg findings mostly uh, include right axis deviation with right ventricular strain pattern and occasionally we can see a uh, uh, r and s wave ratio greater than 1 in v1 so uh sir i didn't attempt uh, number 4 and number 5 treatment is mostly uh, oxygen uh, oxygen therapy uh vasodilators uh, including nitrates uh, other uh, drugs include calcium channel blockers like uh, vedapamil diltiazem may be used phosphodiesterase inhibitors like sildenafil tadalafil or endothelin analogs like uh, bosentan and uh, uh guanalyl cyclase analogs might be used sir <clears throat> excellent excellent uh pola should you want to read out anything that you have received from your group uh one is answer from sanjeev kumar from uh, sansol uh pulmonary hypertension is defined as mean pulmonary artery pressure of more than 25 mm of mercury at rest Number two, chest X-ray finding is back pain appearance and increased pulmonary vasculature. Question number three, 
is ECG findings is right ventricular hypertrophy and right axis deviation. Number four, uh, effective neuroaxial block is fall in pulmonary vascular resistance. And the drugs is uh, vasodilators, uh, calcium channel blockers, sildenafil, diuretics, stop the surgery, and bosentron. You want to uh, add any anything else? Uh, any 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 other responses, or we go ahead with the answers now? I go ahead with the answers. Okay. So uh, yeah, I think that is right. Twenty-five greater than twenty-five millimeters of mercury at rest. This I think is a clincher with a pulmonary or with a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure less than 15 millimeter of mercury, okay? Uh, and then you, this was not needed, but uh, if the question also has, uh, how will you grade it? So moderately severe when it is greater than 35 and uh, uh, severe associated with right ventricular failure when the pressure is greater than 50 mm. two findings or whatever. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes sir, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, okay. Uh, right heart, right atrial enlargement may be present if significant tricuspid regurgitation is present which is shown with a widened right heart border. This is really a model answer, right? So all you have to get is... There is some disturbance of sound on your end. Is that better now? Uh, it's audible, it's crackling a bit. Is it better? Uh, my... Uh, if it's not, I'll just uh, remove the headphone. Pulmonary vasculature increased central pulmonary arteries that deeper distally with that vaccine that we're talking about. Increase in transverse diameter of the right interlumbar artery, this is, if you can get it. Peripheral vessel opacity, oligemic lung field. Curly B lines may be present, which indicate the presence of pulmonary venous hypertension. ECG, uh, I think both the candidates, uh, both the people got it nearly the same thing. Right atrial enlargement, right axis deviation. Interesting ST depression and T wave inversion in the anterior. Neuraxial block and pulmonary vascular resistance. No direct effect, but can cause decreased SDR and coronary perfusion pressure. It can also re, uh, lead to bradycardia due to the inhibition of the cardioaccelerator fiber. Decreased preload and bradycardia can be detrimental in this scenario. So this is uh, a bad question in my opinion uh, for an OSCE kind of uh, written file. Anyway, just I thought I'll put it up because uh, I, I, I should not be putting up only the good things that I like from that set, but uh, anyway. so. Be aware that you can have it. Take it in your stride and go ahead. Okay. Treatment of perioperative raised PVR. And I think this is, uh, again, you don't, uh, initially, please don't just think about drugs. You can think about maneuvers you can do, which is uh, essential to uh, decrease the PVR intraoperatively, perioperative. Hyperventilate is, is the first thing that you do. Uh, among uh, of the pharmacological agents, Inhaled nitric oxide, if available, is possibly a very great, a good option. Then you have things like all the basal diets. Morphine, glycerol trinitrate, sodium nitroprusside, calazoline, prostacycline, isoprenaline, aminophylline. The thing to remember is when you're talking about the bosentans and uh, uh, drugs like that, remember the question is perioperative raised PVR. And it is not just uh, a patient with pulmonary hypertension. Okay, so if you think that the PVR is raised in the perioperative period, so what will you do? So do not give. 
So there are ways that people are marked in OSCEs. Remember, so if you get, there, there would be the examiners might be provided with the ideal model answer and possibly maybe three things that are should not be there in the answer. So if you get all maybe of these, you are supposed to write five. You write five, or uh, you write three, which is absolutely correct, but you write two, which is completely incorrect. Then you get possibly three minus two one. If you are drug tested in both three, uh, you get three. So think about that. Be careful in reading what is the question and answer. Okay. Uh, so we go to the next one. And what uh, again? Rahul takes a dig at it, right? Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, go ahead. This is a left-sided left-sided pneumothorax. The diagnosis is a left-sided pneumothorax with uh, possibly a left lung collapse. Uh, anteriorly, sir, we can see about nine ribs. Posteriorly, seven. Initial management would be a needle in the left uh, uh, left second intercostal space with the valve to release the uh, pressure. Cardiothoracic ratio is uh, is uh, calculated using the the distance between the widest points of the transverse diameter of the chest X-ray divided by the widest transverse diameter of the heart, and it's approximately fifty percent. It should be around fifty percent as normal. If it is greater than, if the ratio is more than fifty percent, then it, it denotes cardiomegaly. Uh, tension pneumothorax on uh, chest X-ray generally shows a very uh, if there is no hyperlucency or if the trachea is not deviated to the opposite side, you can kind of rule it out. Very good. Okay. Polish, any answer from your end, from the group? Polish, uh, uh, please unmute yourself. Yes, we have an. I have an answer from Jeet Ovijit. Uh, answer to the first one is left pneumothorax. How many ribs can you normally see anteriorly and posteriorly? There is one digit nine. So uh, whether it is when you see an anteriorly or posteriorly, that is not mentioned. Uh, initial management is emergency needle pneumocentesis. And uh, B, cardiothoracic ratio, ratio of the total cardiac silhouette and the midline maximal to the mediastinal width, I think. I think with the uh, ratio of the total cardiac uh, shadow with the maximal mediastinal width, probably this. Nine is, uh, how do you rule out tension pneumothorax? Displacement of mediastinal contents will be present in a tension pneumothorax. Excellent, okay. Uh, let's see what the answers expected okay. are. Let me read out okay. one. No, this is not very clear. There is one answer, okay. but I cannot read it. It's a little fuzzy. Okay. So it is, uh, I think it was simple left sided pneumothorax. Okay. Uh, how many ribs do you see anteriorly and posteriorly? Six ribs and 10 ribs, uh, anteriorly, 10 ribs, posteriorly. I think, again, if you have a question like this, and even if you have write, written six, and if you have not written anteriorly, posteriorly, you, you may not be masked at all. Okay. And I think this is, I think, very important. Uh, yes, you know, can write needle decompression or uh, needle uh, pneumocentesis or whatever, but please do mention it is, it will, you'll get possibly one third the uh, value to that answer unless you give this two very important uh, markers to that. Second intercostal space mid clavicular line. That has to be there in the answer. <clears throat> the cardiothoracic ratio, I think uh, uh, both had a kind of a clue, but again, uh, they won't set you full point. Okay? So it's uh, the maximum transverse is diameter of the right of the heart, line drawn from the midline of the spine to the most distant point of the right cardiac margin and maximum transverse base diameter of the left side of the heart, midline of the spine to the most distal point of the left cardiac margin. 
So that becomes your numerator. And in, uh, ID, which is the greatest internal diameter of the thorax, is the denominator. The normal value, rightly, as you've mentioned, is 0.5. But please, uh, it's not just the, uh, the, uh, the size of the heart. There is a way to do it, which is the right side, the maximum diameter, and the left side, middle of the spine to the most left part, middle of the spine to the next side part. So this will only, that gets you full point. Uh, oh, yes, and I think that thing is right. It's just not the medial signal shift. You have to put in that tracheal deviation to the opposite side, which fetches you the full point. This is the reason is that if there is a value attack, you write just medial signal shift, you get half the point or half the mark. Okay. Uh, Ornob, please take this. Yes, sir. Yeah. Number four. Uh, yeah. So, sir, uh, uh, the abnormalities are uh, mostly the hemoglobin is uh, increased, polycythemia uh, and uh, hypokalemia, and uh, mild acidosis with uh, hypoxemia, hypercapnia, and bicarbonate is also raised. And uh, okay. among the physical findings, uh, we can find, sir, uh, nicotine staining of the nails in the patient. If the patient is a smoker or uh, clubbing may be present, uh, there may be wheeze, expiratory wheeze on auscultation. Uh, in the chest X-ray, sir, we might find uh, areas of patchy infiltrates uh, with a uh, uh, large area of the lung and uh, emphysematous bulla may be present. And uh, in the ECG, sir, uh, P pulmonary and uh, low voltage QRS complexes may be uh, found in uh, the ECGs. And uh, uh, in uh, type one respiratory failure is mostly uh, increased level of uh, increased level of partial pressure of carbon dioxide, but mostly normal or slightly decreased levels of uh, uh, of partial pressure of oxygen. Type two respiratory failure is uh, increased carbon dioxide as well as reduced. Car uh, reduced oxygen levels. Okay, okay. Uh, Polash? Yes, sir. Uh, from your group. Uh, again, an answer sent by Sanjeev from Asansol. The abnormal findings is hypokalemia. In ABG, there is uh, uh, respiratory acidosis. Question number two, physical science is dyspnea, labored breathing, acidotic breathing, intracostal muscle retraction. Question number three, uh, emphysematous lung bulla, hyperinflated lung. ECG findings, right axis deviation, right ventricular hypertrophy and P wave changes. Uh, he has written three and whereas two has been asked for. Type uh, number five, type one is hypoxemic respiratory failure, PBAO2 is low. Type 2 is hypercapnic respiratory failure, PO2 is low. At the same time, PSCO2 is high. Okay. So let's see what the model answers are. So abnormalities, 5. Okay. You had, I think, uh, got it polycythemia, hypokalemia, hypoxia, hypercarbia. And yes, yes, there is respiratory acidosis compensated. To a certain extent, and obstructive lung disease or airflow limitation. I think uh, they did not take into account both the candidates. I think did not take into account the uh, pulmonary function tests that were available to you. Okay, but again, this is not my answer. This is a model answer that you should get. I, I know this was going to be, but be prepared for this kind of a thing. Okay. Uh, like since the, uh, you may not, especially people who are appearing for national board exam, uh, since uh, you are not going to have a thing like a long case or a short case or stuff like that, be prepared to get into this writing. Central cyanosis, something that you might expect. Slubbing, you've got it. Tremor, bounding pulse, tachypnea, raised JVP, hyper-resonant percussion note, displaced apex, difficult to palpate apex, uh, peripheral edema, hepatomegaly, widespread wheeze, fine or coarse uh, crackle. 
and uh, there are something else that some of you mentioned i think uh, that also can be this is again a kind of a vague thing but uh, uh, the only thing that i will if tell I... you people is uh, don't stop at those two or three things that you are saying please if you are asking for five at least put in five right don't stop at two or three yeah follow us please yeah i think one way to approach this is one of the previous answers in which you saw that this is probably a system wide thing like you do a general examination you do a respiratory examination you auscultate and uh, you, you look for the other general things and and then you would find many of these points i mean it would be easier to remember all these points none of these things are very esoteric these are regular things that we we are expected to find yes absolutely it's again you have that uh, as polar rightly said uh, the way you would approach it general examination then systemic examination you will get at least you will get five points for that right two findings on a chest x ray hyperinflation of the lungs flat diaphragm enlarged hilar vessels loss of peripheral vascular markings you can get empyematous bulla and large heart because of a core pulmonary so you see uh, they have given 1 2 3 4 5 6 you are expected to write two now don't ask me what happens if you write more than two now if there is a system by which you get plus for positive and if there is a complete uh, minus for a complete answer that you are not supposed to give then you might be in a Uh, detrimental uh, situation so if you are asked to if you are no too definite please put in two don't try to put in don't try to over smart and put in one you see the changes i think you got uh, most of you got it uh, peak p waves right axis deviation right ventricular hypertrophy right bundle branch block and if there is something like or pulmonary happening uh, uh, right atrial enlargement can lead to an also an atrial fibrillation again they have given you One, two, three, four, five. So two. If you get, you get full marks on that. Okay. Uh, uh, I think this uh, get it. These are something that will be asked. Okay, in many many scenarios. So get this complete. Then you are you are expected that you get full on this. The type one is an hypoxemic respiratory failure. PO two of less than sixty millimeter of mercury. Room air. and type 2 is a hypercapnic respiratory failure which has a pco2 of greater than 50 okay so uh, you you're just writing hypoxic uh, hypoxic failure or hypoxemic failure or, hypo, or just an hypercapnic failure may not get you marks you will have to define them okay so that is about the fourth question and the last ten okay uh, rahul Go ahead. Uh, A is uh, oxyhemoglobin. B is deoxyhemoglobin. Uh, Bear lamb. Uh, the la point where the two lines meet is the isobestic wavelength. Bear Lambert's law is a linear. It shows, states that there's a linear relationship between concentration and absorbance of a solution. So, which enables this concentration of a solution to be calculated using its absorbance. Uh, on the two sides of the probes, who uh, are we talking? So the S S P O two probe that is like uh, there is a there is a infrared light on the top of the probe which goes on to the finger, pulp of the uh, just below the nail, and the coximeter is a an instrument which can measure which uh, measures various wavelengths of uh, Different ligands of hemoglobin, like oxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin, carboxyhemoglobin, for example. And uh, four situations where readings are not accurate is methemoglobinemia, carbon monoxide poisoning, hypothermia, hypotension, movement, nail or uh, usage of nail paint. Okay. Okay. Polar. Yeah. Uh, an answer from uh, Sanjeev again. uh he has answered only two of them question number 2 what is beer lambert's law i think a and b would have been quite fair. easy one uh question to answer to the question number 2 is it states that the intensity of transmitted light reduces exponentially as the concentration of substance 
increases, I think. Okay, let's write it. And uh, number four, what is a coaximeter? Coaximeter is a device to measure SpO2, HbO2, and carbon monoxide, carbon, COHB. Carboxy hemoglobin can be measured mm -hmm. separate, separately, probably. Okay. All right. Uh, so we uh, take you through the answers. Yeah. So what does uh, A and B denote? A represents the oxyhemoglobin absorbance spectrum. I think it was clearly written even in the uh, uh, figure below from where I had taken is the absorbance spectrum. And B represents the reduced hemoglobin absorbance spectrum. And you were right. This uh, point uh, that is where it cuts is the isobestic point. Uh, spectrophotometry is nothing but uh, oxygenated hemoglobin absorbs more infrared light and allows more red light to pass through, and just uh, deoxygenated absorbs more red light and allows more infrared light to pass through, which is why you see that uh, curve uh, kind of going divergent ways and then meeting at a point. Okay, so that's the principle. So, Beers and Lambert's law. I don't know whether you like it or not. Till you pass your exams, you need to know this. Beer's law says that absorption of radiation by a solution is proportional to the concentration of the substance, whereas Lambert's law says that the absorption of radiation by a solution is proportional to the thickness of the absorbing layer. So in just one line, this is a, 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 a absorption of radiation is the point that has to be there. And one is dependent on the concentration of the solution in the uh, of the substance in the solution, whereas the other is the thickness of the absorbing layer. Okay. So pulse oximeter probe. There are two things. There are things which are on the uh, uh, two sides of the probe. One side of the probe has a two light emitting diodes. One for red, which is 660. The other is for infrared, 940 nanometers. The diodes switch on, on and off several hundred times in a second in a sequence with a pause. The pause period is to detect ambient light. So this, uh, the two next two sentences are not that important, but it has to, what is critical in having in the answer is two light emitting diodes, one for infrared and one for the normal red spectrum. The other side of the probe has the photo detector. So the light absorbed by the pulsatile arterial flow, as well as by the non-pulsatile venous blood, as well as the other tissues that is filtered, that comes through this, the microprocessor differentiates between the light absorbed from these two components. And this is where uh, the Beer's law and the Lambert's law come into uh, application. Okay, so what are the two things that are present? One side are the light emerging diodes, the other side is the photo detector. Co-oximeter is a spectrophotometer that uses four different wavelengths, measures total hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin, carboxyhemoglobin, and methemoglobin. So again, critical is those four uh, uh, wavelengths, and you, it has to be named. Hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin, carboxyhemoglobin, bethemoglobin. Inaccurate pulse oximeter reading. Yes, I think you, most of you got this. Peripheral vascular constriction would be due to hypotension, shock, peripheral vascular disease, abnormal hemoglobin, uh, carboxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin. Uh, this is again, we are talking not about, about co oximeter, but as you nor inaccurate remember pulse oximeter. Venous pulsation, which venous system is also pulsatile, as in tricuspid regurgitation and venous congestion. And remember also, I think you put it into perspective, is an AV fistula maybe. External disturbances such as bright lights, diathermy, and shivering, all yes, and they are, I think, uh, the uh, enamel coating, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is also taken into account. I think that's it. Uh, yes, I stopped my share. Yes, thank you. And, uh, I think this has been an excellent session. I, I mean, uh, uh, people who are appearing for a DNB exam, this is going to be a very essential part of your exams. And uh, both Rahul and Arnab, I am, uh, I'm sure you've done quite well. You've done 
actually quite well. So you. Uh, you are reasonably well prepared for your exams, and with the next whatever time is left, I'm sure both of you are going to do very well. And uh, the people who are in the audience, uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, you have been very attentive to it and. in these situations if you actually have followed the advice about writing down the answers and not merely thinking about it and uh, you know storing it in your mind but rather actually executing it writing it then you, you would benefit more than you know unless you, you think that i will answer it like that because what uh, strikes me is that well i have never uh, sat for an oski uh, is that the systematic approach the you know people who have thought about these answers they have spent a lot of time thinking about in you know, every possible way how people are going to answer and which answers are going to be very very important and which answers has to be absolutely given and which are possibly yeah. and somebody can given because exam detects not only who knows something but also detects who knows something very very well anyway uh, thank you dr shengupta and dr bhattacharya uh, i have taken a lot of time out of the schedule as sure Well, uh, yeah before we wind up uh, i think this is i think this is a just a feeder about the oski that is a written oski that is now part of that uh, exam going process but uh, to the best of my knowledge i think maybe from the next one uh, uh, you will have other tables like uh, the cpr table the anesthesia machine table then you have the communication skills uh, table Uh, the oski might be implemented in those scenarios it's nothing that but that uh, like if uh, jantoda and i uh, both are examiners we would be sent uh, say 10 questions that need to be asked about the anesthesia machine and for each of the 10 questions these are the 10 responses so, so those tasks will be in both of our, both our hands and when say rahul comes in and i tell you that uh, do the pre of uh, pre procedure checklist of this anesthesia machine so and uh, is the question that is asked and then i i will be having the card and if you can give me those 10 things that are there in my card i am bound to give you 10 marks in that okay so it, you can be uh, uh, the oski can be set for that as well and for example if you are uh, again uh, or no you come to the communication skills table and uh, i tell you that uh, say this is uh, that like let's first that question c that 57 year old laparoscopic cholecystectomy and he is coming in for uh, lap- laparoscopic cholecystectomy and i tell you that uh, say i am the uh, person who is undergoing this and uh, this is my elder brother joint soda so how will you take the consent from us before you plan an anesthetic again i would have in my card five things that you are expected to answer and now one of the first thing that you are expected to do is introduce yourself for example right so you start i am arnob shamant so i am an anesthetist and blah blah blah, blah. and i i have gone through your uh, cvu i have gone through your medical records and this is what i see okay so that is what again part and parcel of the os don't you you have anything to say before we no, wind no, up no. i think we have done it in good time we have done it in good time polas i think uh, that for mm. a half hour yeah it's really good time well uh just before we end uh hope you had a good time and yes. uh, and uh, fruitful time uh, the attendance was uh, actually quite good and uh, tomorrow we are going to start early tomorrow we are going to start at 9 so today there are a few glitches initially while logging in so i request all of you to start logging in from 8:30 am onward so you can maybe log in and then make sure that you have successfully logged in then go and fetch a cup of tea and you know make yourself comfortable so log in will begin from 8:30 and will be starting at 9 well uh, thank you then thank you sir thank you sir good night sir thank you good night sir তো বুঝছো তো হয়ে আছে হ্যাঁ ক্যাথেটার লাগানো আছে ওই চ্যানেল পাওয়ার পড়ছে লাগো তো